Jones, and I'm here to tell you folks, the world has fallen. The fascist globalist overlords, oh, they're implementing the Great Reset. You don't believe me? I've, I've seen the tapes. Watch it, folks. Watch as these pot belly Zoomer goblins work with the Illuminati to pit us against each other. I had promised I'd be a good boy. Ugh, I'm a good boy. There's only one cure, folks, and that's liberty. And there's no better day at channel to find freedom than Fabian Liberty. Anarchy is order. Government is civil war. You're, you're offensive. Police lives matter? We're just trying to do school. What? But this is our space. You're making this space you're uncomfortable. uncomfortable. But you're white. You're fucking a white male. What is one way you combat racism? I don't believe the white people on the sidewalk. They want your wallets, they want your guns, they want the wieners off your sons. Democrats. Oh, oh, we should vote. So let's say, let's say, for the sake of argument, that all of the water levels around the world rise by, by, let's say, five feet. You think that people aren't going to just sell their homes and move? Just one small problem. Sell their houses to who, Ben? Fucking Aquaman! Children, they're spreading COVID throughout the population at higher numbers. And people are not entitled to turn themselves into deadly biological weapons by spraying disease-laden aerosols wherever they choose, randomly killing innocent people. This is not freedom, this is homicide, and willful ignorance is no excuse. What the fuck? Hey, hey, testing, testing. All right. All right, all right. So it's not wrong is fine. We saw, no, I literally said it's a, it's a bit of TOS. Like, justifying violence, um, even if you do so like in a, like a philosophically sound way, like the, almost every social media company has a policy against the justification of violence, like especially political violence. That like, even if you like, even if like you show through how like, through whatever philosophy you follow that this is like, okay. That's not what we saw in 2020. What do you, John Jacob, I, what do you want me to, you want me to go call fucking, um, um, what's that Indian dude's, um, oh my God. I don't, you want me to go call the the new CEO of YouTube and be like, "Hey, man, did you know that TOS has been uh, has been a little lopsided?" 
like, like, yeah, dog, they know. <laughs> like, it's not fair. I'm talking about what is and isn't TOS. Like, enforcement is not relevant here. What's up, Crod? I'm just excited to do some debating. I don't really like. So we're gonna we're gonna debate a free topic, and then later on tonight we're gonna debate Israel, um, Iran. Um, I don't really like debating Israel that much. I'm not a big fan of it. Like, I'll do it if people really want to do it. Um, I'm not a huge fan of debating Israel. I haven't been since the very beginning um, of, like, the conflict after October 7th, right? Um, Now, a couple months before that, I realized that this was, like, an issue that I was, like, really dumb on. So I did a deep, deep dive actually before October 7th happened, like, just a couple months before. Started talking to people, started watching videos, started, you know, reading up on it, um, you know, doing current events. And it's a really, really complicated issue. It always is. My biggest problem with Israel is like nobody knows what the fuck they're talking about, but because it's the current thing, everyone pretends like they know what they're talking about. And it's really, really, really difficult to have conversations with people that have dug their heels in on being knowledgeable about something. And then you bring up something that they have never heard of. And then they get in this position where they have to start attacking you to try and cover for the fact that they've never heard of this, right? Like we saw it a lot in the very beginning. A lot of streamers have have done their due diligence, I'll give up to be fair, and learned at least a surface level about the history of the conflict, right? But like none of them understand any of the original protest groups. They don't actually understand how the settlements began. Like there's just so much that they still don't know about, about anything. Do I find the same thing about debating Marxism? Um, I do, but I would say that more people have an understanding of at least the history of what Marxism has done in the world, even if they don't understand Marxism itself. Um, and also, I'm really comfortable debating Marxism um, because I used to be a Marxist. I used to be a Marxist Leninist. Um, and so, like, I've read enough of the literature when they try and pretend like, oh, you've never done that. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, yeah. And so I'm, I'm a little bit better about that. Um, but yeah, like this current situation with Israel, it's like, we're going to talk about the Israel-Iran thing, but it's like, people are like, oh, it's World War III. And it, it, it's like, I realized that like October 7th is like 9-11 for a lot of people. Like before 9-11, nobody knew that we were just bombing the Middle East. I mean, like people that were really interested in geopolitics knew. Hardcore anti-war advocates knew. But like your normal person was like, we're bombing people over there. Like why? And be like, dude, have you never read Charlie Wilson's war? Have you never like, do you not understand that we've been involved in the Middle East to like maintain the petro dollar and like make sure that like oil is traded that, you know, the US dollar is the reserve currency. And that like we have this whole thing where we like set up fake governments and topple them and steal from them and then set up a new one. And the, like we've been doing this for decades. You, you didn't know about that. Right. And it's like, People learned about that, and now that the Israeli-Palestine thing has popped off, and like everyone, on, everyone has to tie their political opinion to being pro-Palestine or being "I stand with Israel because Israel is our greatest ally" or whatever, right? Like now they're starting to learn basic shit, and it's like they're getting they're getting scared because they're like, "Oh my God, is World War Three about to pop off?" And I'm like, "Dude, this has literally been going on over there for like seventy years. Like, what are you like? This is not new, dude. Like." I mean, like, sure, Iran, you know, claiming direct, you know, um, you know, direct action for the attack, you know, in, in terms of, you know, retaliating for the April attack. I mean, sure. But like, for the most part, it's like, dude, this isn't new. I don't know. That That's how I feel. I feel like people have no idea what's going on with Israel. Um, they all are super invested in having an opinion because that's the hot thing to have an opinion on in, you know, the current news cycle, the current politics discussion. And so they're all scrambling to learn, but like they're doing the same due diligence that they do on anything, which is like read Wikipedia articles, watch YouTube videos of people that they already politically agree with and like watch documentaries. And then they're like, Hmm, I know what I'm talking about now. And it's like, dude, there's so much stuff that isn't said. And that's like kind of the more important thing about history and especially political conflicts. It's about what's not said. It's like they they forgot that they learned at one point that like history is written by the victors. You know? I don't know. 
India and Pakistan have, have filed it out before. Yeah. Yeah, with enemies, with allies like these, who needs enemies? Yo, Scott, why are you an objectivist? Seems like those crazy motherfuckers got stuff figured out, minus not understanding anarchy. I'm mostly objectivist, Shadowmaker. Um, my grounding is objectivist, right? So, so starting from existence exists into the grounding of, of Aristotelian logic, I am an objectivist. So at, 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 the, at the very core of my philosophy is going to be objectivism. How I approach and view the world is a mixture of objectivism and virtue ethics. Because if I don't know how to approach something and I feel like I'm missing a bunch of data, I don't try to look at something purely as an objectivist because I don't have, I'm missing a bunch of data, right? And so like, I, I'm like, look, I don't know enough about what I should or shouldn't do in this moral situation um, to be able to, to be able to make an informed decision to say, this is what is in my rational self-interest. And this is what is the pro-life position. This is the pro-greed position. Those are all things I believe in, in my core. I believe in pro-greed. I'm against anti-greed. Um, I'm against anti-life positions. I am an objectivist from that position, but like I, I basically approach things like if I don't know what's going on, I kind of approach it like a virtue ethicist. I'm like, what, what feels right? Right? Like what feels like, and I don't, approach it like you know stoically like self-sacrifice as as an ethic but i look at ethics that are the things that i hold high and then i kind of approach that situation in that situation because when i have to do a when i have to do a split decision then and and i, and I don't have enough information to know what's going on i think to myself what would my heroes do you know like i, I might think what would henry reardon do right I might think what Dagny Taggart would do. I might think what would Ayn Rand do. But I also, you know, might think like, you know, what would Hoppe say in this situation? Or what would, you know, what would what would my idealized self do? Really? Right? Like, who is it that I want to be? And who do I want to be? I want to be brave, right? I want to be intelligent. I want to be rational, but also I don't mean rational just in the objective sense, but I want to be rational in the in the cool, calm, level-headed sense. Because I know that some of my biggest faults, especially as someone with ADHD, is to tend towards an intense reaction. And what would Noam Chomsky say? Fuck Noam Chomsky. I mean, I like On Anarchy, 1972. It's a good book, you should read it. Um, I do think he is a brilliant linguist, but no. Um, but yeah, like, like what, would, what would my idealized self do? My idealized self wouldn't freak out. My idealized self would approach this calmly and quickly. What would Tyler Durden do? He'd blow, blow up something, right? I don't want to do that, right? So, so yeah. So I would say that I lean pretty heavily objectivist. Some of the problems that I have with objectivism is the grounding. I just think they're wrong. The grounding of intellectual property, I think, is really, really bad. I think it is it is where objectivists stop being objectivists and they go into the realm of mysticism because there's like this magical property of the man's mind. And they do not approach intellectual property from a rational perspective. Um, and so I, I vehemently disagree with, so I'm very much with Zulu, Liquid Zulu on this, right? In that um, IP is, is a myth and they don't have any good, it's not like, you know, I'm not open to the idea. Like I listened to their arguments and their arguments were mystical. Like they, they, they went from being objectivists into mysticism. And the same thing they accuse the Christians and the altruists and the, and the communists and all the other people of doing. They, they delved into the realm, realm of mysticism because like the mind is this magical property that like, you know, that man is connected to the mind. And it's like, how do you own my printing press? How am I not allowed to? Yeah, I'm sure it has strong pragmatic arguments, but pragmatism is not... Um, is not something that ought be in the realm of libertarianism or objectivism, unless we are talking about, you know, political strategy to achieve an end goal, you know, that either doesn't violate the NAP or we're in a position where we're forced to violate the NAP. We were forced to choose between two anti-life positions, right? Like, you know, the, the classic two anti-life positions objectivist argument is like your daughter is drowning and you can't swim. You can attempt to save her but you'll both probably drown, but you might be able to save her. Or you can just stand and watch your daughter drown. Well, I wouldn't want to live in a world where I saw my daughter drown and I didn't do anything to stop it. And yet to try and save her if I can't swim is likely to just get us both killed anyways. 
Um, and so these are two anti-life positions. And so you kind of have to go into the, you're, you're cho- forced to choose between suicide and suicide. Um, and so you kind of just do what you do there, right? Like it, it becomes a, it, I don't want to say it's a paradox because, you know, objectivism is pretty clear. You know, contradictions don't exist. If you think they do, you know, um, you're, um, you know, you need to check your premises. But, um, but yeah, I mean, like there, there are some situations like that. And that's when pragmatism comes into a play. That's when strategy comes into play. It's like option A and option B are both um, suicide and option B is the action of inaction. So it's not like there's a third hidden action here that is inaction. If you can find the inaction, you can find the third action and prove me wrong, sure. But if I'm forced to choose between non-action and action and both are suicidal, then, you know, violating the nap kind of becomes a little bit different, right? Now, from the libertarian stance, Violating the nap is always wrong in this situation unless someone else is the aggressor, right? There's like a gun to my head um, and, you know, and it says, you know, hit, hit the button and kill a million people or do nothing and I kill 10 million people, right? Like you're, it's the trolley car problem, but a gun to my head. Well, with a gun to my head, yeah, fine, fuck it. I can, I can make a choice in that situation, whichever choice seems most likely to be a means of killing the person with a gun to my head. From the objectivist position, they don't necessarily need the gun to the head. Right. Like they just need both positions to be anti-life. So like there's some overlap between objectivism and libertarianism. I mean, Rothbard and Ayn Rand were friends originally, you know, and, and, and the non-aggression principle comes from her. Like, um, but some of what they have is wrong, in my opinion. Some of what they have doesn't go enough far enough, such as their argument that argumentation ethics is invalid. Their argument that a state ought exist so long as it's minarchist and intellectual property. But in most circumstances, I would consider myself philosophically objective. IP should be treated like plagiarism. You can do it, but people might not like that you are, and some schools or institutions reject you. Yeah, I agree with that. Oh, don't, don't get too dark with it, old Joe. I have a daughter. I don't want to think about all that. Oh, medal for Jesus. You don't think objectives follow the nap to the logical conclusion? Yeah, I don't, obviously don't either. Um, but I mean, again, objectivism is is weird because if you ask most objectivists to define objectivism, they'll say the philosophy of Ayn Rand, right? And like, it's, um, you know, it's, it's um, a little weird. There's a weird message that is popping up. Coffee Campbell. It it's not in the YouTube chat. Like YouTube deleted it maybe without ever even telling me. But it showed up on the screen. Objectivism is Zionism for libertarians. I can see it on the screen, right? Objectivism is Zionism for libertarianism is on the screen, but it's not in the chat. Almost like YouTube is just quietly deleting um anything with the word Zionism in it, maybe. You think it's just a spam account that just says that over and over again? Maybe. Yeah, I have it set to top chat. My bad. There you go. Yep. There you go. Yeah, you have to set it to to live chat. You can't set it to top chat. I didn't notice that. I don't normally worry about it because I don't usually... I, I just started streaming again on YouTube, so I don't usually have that many viewers. Well, now, guys, I fucking have it on live chat, so I see it now. But if you put it on top chat, you won't see it. Hey, Randy. I'm doing all right. You know, coming back to streaming. Coming back to streaming always on Wednesdays, sometimes on Mondays, sometimes other days. I got a bunch of stuff coming this week, so probably doing a crucible debate on libertarianism Saturday night. Um, and then Wednesday I'll be talking to honey badger radio at seven and then moving on from there, a debate on whether or not, um, a debate panel on whether or not socialism, uh, Nazism is socialist or was socialist, if you will. Um, so yeah, it should be a fun lineup this week. 
It's amazing how many keywords get nuked. Well, I mean, it's not that crazy once you think that they add them and they very rarely take them away. Who's hosting that debate? Oh, man, some crazy left winger. I forgot his name. Um, it's like, uh, bah, 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 bah. oh, my God. Why can I not see? His? It's like something with Kai. I just can't remember. It's like, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I, I can't, it's something with Kai. I don't remember. It's, he's a socialist. No, not prime Kai's. K-I, K-A-I. No, it's, I, it's blank, blank Kai. Yeah, let the water Kai. Thank you. It's one of his panels. I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. I'll do it. Just because I really like the topic. I'm still of that crazy mysticism Christian high. I don't know. Maybe one day I'll take the full plunge into objectivism and get owned. Yeah, I mean, like, I... I am against Christianity, right? I'll be open and upfront and honest about that. But like, I forget that you read The Vampire Economy. You're goddamn right I did. It's great. Um, but um, but like of all of my quote unquote enemies, Christianity is like way down at the bottom, right? Like I think ultimately man needs to move beyond mysticism and get rid of philosophies that demand altruism. And Christianity often does demand altruism, right? Like loving, loving thy neighbor, being thy, you know, brother's keeper, you know. The, the, and I think ultimately Christianity leads to socialism, even if it isn't directly socialist. It preaches, it preaches ideas of socialism. Um, that being said, I think we threw a lot out of uh, the baby out with the bathwater with Christianity. Yeah, so I'm an atheist, old Joe. Um, I'm an atheist that went to Liberty University for grad school, right? Like, like, like I, I studied religion pretty heavily. Um, and I am pretty pro Christianity in, in the sense and, and against Christianity. Right. Um, you know, I think ultimately like Christianity ought be taught as a, as what it actually is, which is, you know, a series of, 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 of collected works of wisdom of, of humans throughout thousands of years of human history and an evolution of, of our spiritual beliefs and ideas and what we learned about society, about culture, about man, about the nature of reality um, from a moral perspective, from a functionalist perspective through, you know, tens of thousands of years. That's what Christianity really is, as far as I'm concerned, as an atheist. Um, and most atheists are like, oh, Christianity is dumb and it makes people retarded. Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, um, yeah, it's just it's just not those things. Um and so, I don't know. It's 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 um it's um. Like I said, you know, I am against Christianity as as a full belief system because I think it's false, and I would like to strike down all false gods. But like, what is replacing Christianity in our current culture is way way worse, and from a functional perspective. And so it's like if I have to order value my enemies. Christianity is just so fucking far down. I mean, Christianity probably didn't come from Plato duality, right? Like, if you understand the history of Mediterranean religions, um, so I got to go, and I got to go hop in the chat here in a second. But, but for a very, 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 very quick summary, if you understand the history of Mediterranean religions, you'll and you understand the Hittites, the Akkadians, and you know the, the, where they derived their religion from in you know all of the Semitic religions, then you understand that the Semitic religions were much more ahead of their time from Greece in terms of evolutionary monotheism, um, and that they were already heading from a pantheon into evolutionary monotheism, which is what you saw in Egypt with like you know all there was all these Egyptian gods, and then there was Amun Ra, right, which is like a couple of gods put together that's the head of the pantheon, and then there was this concept that like well all gods are really just Ra, and that these are just representations or ways in which Ra presents himself, right? That's evolutionary monotheism, and when you have evolutionary monotheism, a, a region is ripe to what we call relevatory. Um, monotheism, which is a revolution occurs. God comes down and tells you to like give up your bad ways and gives you revelation of scripture, right? And that's what Judaism really is. You can see this in, in you know, Elohim and Eloyaha um, and all of, with the exception of the Tetragrammaton and Adonai in the Hebrew language, you can see that Elohim, like where is that coming from? And you see that El 
or you know E L and and L, like Elizer Berherzer, I forget like the long ass Hittite name, um, is a storm god, a, a god of the seas, a god of storms, um, that is elevated to the god, um, and it slowly becomes the god, um, and that's really what Judaism is. It evolved through evolutionary monotheism into that, um, and I think with that came the spirit and the soul, came duality, etc. I think that they came to duality probably on their own as opposed to being directly influenced by like platonic philosophy. But once, you know, Hellenism and platonic stuff comes about, you know, it, it has a heavier influence in Christian faith as opposed to Judaism. Nevertheless, um, why is Rothbardy not showing up in chat now? <laughs> He's trying to spam shit and he can't get in chat and it's not on my live chat either. If I go to top chat, it's not there and I go to live chat, it's not there, but it's on the screen. That's so weird. Maybe it's just maybe it's just emojis. Oh, my I might my thing might be blocking emojis that are like not YouTube's emojis right now or something. I have to do that once I get in here. So let me let me first do this. Change this to that. All right. Oh, he's uh he's not ready, but let me go to the Discord at least. No. Dang it. Discord. I'm in so many Discords. Alright, it looks like um it looks like he might be running behind just a little bit. Rothbardy, can you try and say something that isn't a bunch of emojis? I'm going to try and see if I can fix it, but can you type something that isn't emojis so I can see if, like, you're blocked or if it's just the emojis you're spamming? Um, and I'm not, like, doing it because I'm like, how dare you, right? Like, I'm, I'm actually just trying to figure out, like, what's going on. Old Joe is undefeated, I think. What? Testing, testing. Dude, Rothbardy, stop messing with me. Oh, man. Dude, my cloud bot wasn't even How's on. Doing today? Good evening. I'm doing well. How are you? Live in the trees. Live in the tree. Yeah. Uh, aren't, aren't you not supposed to be doing any dreaming? Aren't you like doing like a, you know, a thousand hour marathon stream? That was, uh, <clears throat> that was really good. It was very successful. I I'm did, glad to hear it. I, uh, I was not expecting half as much support as I got. Yo, like literally, um, Rothbardy, can you, come on, help me out here. Rothbardy is not showing up in my um, in my YouTube chat. I don't know why. I don't know if you've been like banned by YouTube or something. Like you're showing up in this chat. You're not showing up in my top chat. When I go to live chat, you're not showing up, and that's in my OBS. And then the same thing when I go to um, my YouTube. Like I can only see you on the screen. Oh, you're in, you're on Twitch? But I'm not even live on Twitch. So you're just in Twitch chat trolling me, you little fucker. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. a lot of vitamins. <laughs> I hope not the vitamins you showed last week or something. <laughs> the bite eyes, bro, for the blue light. <laughs> bro. So I forgot that like, if you integrate your OBS chat with like Twitch and YouTube, that it'll show both. I mean, I mm. didn't forget it. I just didn't think about it. And somebody's been trolling me by just chatting in Twitch, even though I'm not live on Twitch. I'm not doing anything. 
but they're like they're, they're on my Twitch chatting, showing up on my screen, but not in the YouTube chat. And I was like, is YouTube censoring this? Like, I don't understand what's happening. Like, is my chat bot messed up? I was like trying to figure out everything, and they're just spamming shit in fucking Twitch chat, is, so it only shows up on the screen. That is next level trolling. Uh, uh, yeah, it's wild. It's pretty fucking funny, honestly. I mean, yeah, I was I like, dude, for a minute, it's fresh. like, it was like, you know, like when someone's like, hey, your sounds mess up and you sit there like trying to fuck with your sound. They're just like, they're just fucking with you. It was like, it's like the, 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 hun, the, you know, 150, 200 IQ version of that. I was like, yo, what is happening yeah. with my bots? Like, I don't understand. Even just to think of that, or maybe just, I don't know, they default to your, to your Twitch just when they see that you're streaming. But like, yeah, to like, it's, if they made the conscious decision of like, I'm, yeah, I'm I mean, I, the I only one to I haven't streamed on Twitch in like uh, over a year. Yeah, so that seems like a conscious decision. And uh, just mess around. You you got an audience. Doing the mess around. No? Nobody wants to do the mess around? Sorry, I got distracted by boobas. Reference. Hello, all. <laughs> Good yeah, evening. what's up? What's good? Up, up, up. So, uh, topic number one, uh, your your creative writings, Prime. <laughs> um, yeah. Those are the articles uh, he writes for Pornhub. <laughs> hey, I was I, I was trying to keep it PG, creative writings. Uh, I. Uh, you know, I've thought about it because I've, I've told you guys before that, like, um, I've been very honest that, like, I really like uh, erotic fiction um, and oh, boy, I've written other that? stuff. Um, and so, like, I want to um, uh, I have, I've considered, you know, putting a few things out there. And um, it actually it actually makes based off of our conversation we had a few weeks ago it totally makes sense now why people would appreciate you know erotic writings where it's like a foreign concept for me i'm uh, just seeing w words yeah. on a page yeah how do you and i mean i'm not sure how much of you have even read but like um uh, even I, I guess you've countered some of that like yeah, totally. how does it make you feel i mean you understand that it's like risk risque or whatever what you're reading and yeah, but I'm like, if I'm, <laughs> if of the few times that I've pried open like a Harlequin romance novel, it's like, yeah, I don't get any sort of vivid imagery or anything like that. It's just like, whatever. Obviously, I can picture individual things, uh, you know, that they're describing, but to piece it together in some sort of fantasy, like that, that just doesn't happen for me. Interesting. All right. Fair. Fair. Um, Weird deficiencies in my brain. And does anyone like else like it? Uh, this is a great topic to start off with now. <laughs> um, uh, does anyone else uh, like, you know, like written erotic porn? I mean, I'll, I'll dabble in a little erotic fiction every night once in a while. Like, if I'm on a plane, like at the bookstore, I'm like, oh, I can't find nothing. Let me go buy a one hour, one hour thirst read. What up, fellas? Oh, uh, hey. hey. Um, yeah, I don't know. Oh, let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, Echo. He's got like a lot of, uh, <laughs> it's all yeah, erotic fiction in his background. Thing. Yeah, that's all, all it is. Yeah. Uh, Echo, uh, do you like erotic fiction? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's, uh, he's waking on his own. Are you talking uh, about lady audience. porn? No, not just lady porn. No, just yeah, like for, for men. No, the porn not, that ladies... It's the, not the lady porn, porn. The porn that ladies lady read porn. on the train. Oh, my God. No, it doesn't have to be lady porn. I'm just saying, like... Oh, yo, well, I have a running theory oh that the majority of um, of um, just readers like that read for fun, it's uh, going to be women and gay guys, and then like the minority of straight men read for enjoyability <laughs> and fun. Um, and studies okay. seem to studies seem. Whoa, to whoa, whoa, whoa! No, no, no! Whoa, okay, I uh, post those studies, uh, but like yeah. just, just just on average, like women tend to at least of the limited data that are available, just on average, women read more than men. Yep. Uh, at least recreationally. Yeah, and then I'm, I'm then my argument is of the percentage of men that read, I'd assume it's more gay than straight. I don't think straight guys are uh, reading. They're not too. They're not twitching. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, they're not reading, that's period. Like, like, <laughs> no, that's like. That's they're reading like, tweets and shit. I mean, like, reading for fun, like, going and getting books and reading books. Yeah, yeah but that's yeah, like. We, a, that's we, like a, we hate reading, on. you know? Yeah, hey, I didn't I say all. I didn't, I I didn't think, say all. I don't think men are a monolith. I think, Ali, I think Ali's probably right based off of just my intuition. But I think it's, again, like, one of those, like, 
causation versus correlation examples, right? Like, like palm trees don't make people in a county uh, age, but like there's a strong correlation between how many palm trees are in a county and like the average age of people living in a county. And it's like, why? Well, because elderly people like to live near beaches and they like to live in warmer places. Oh, and it just so happens that the older you get, the more money you have. So the more likely you're able to afford to live in those nicer places, right? So it's like, I, I think Ali, you might you might be right, but that might just be because men tend to prefer different forms of media, and like and there's like a, a narrative, right. right? It's like well, like there's a narrative told by most statistics, right? Like my, I you know I do this all the time where I talk about like crime statistics and blacks, right? It's like there's a narrative told by like the classic 1350 meme, but like there's also a narrative told by the fact that like blacks make up 27 percent of police interactions, so it's like oh is that over policing within the community because it's twice the amount of police interactions and then like they make up 26 percent of like um uh fatal shootings uh, while unarmed right which makes them s ever like not statistically significant in any way shape or form uh than whites in terms of whether or not they're shot by police when they're unarmed um for that but then like you look at like incarceration rates and it's like oh they're like fucking 60 percent of incarceration and even when you control for other variables there's still like this unknown reason that blacks end up serving jail time even when you account for like socioeconomic status etc but like none of those things are actually like none of those things are anything other than just a correlation right they don't it doesn't mean anything it's just it has a story in and of itself because you react to that data because whatever heuristic you have for viewing the world that data like tells you something about the world even if it isn't necessarily a true I don't, thing that it's I don't know about. that I agree I don't know if I agree with that like maybe like if you're specifically talking erotic fiction maybe maybe nope. if we're like reading in general yeah I, I gotta disagree i think that reading definitely skews more towards the men like um who do you think is reading do you think it's all these girls i don't know i can't tell you a single girl that i know that's we said reading for pleasure that. yeah reading yeah, for gets, joy not, not like he wasn't talking about or like yeah, or any of that shit. yeah but i'm saying like if like what girl do you know is going to be sitting here reading i don't know the like War, Warhammer 40k Chronicles or something like or some men Man. read. I just yeah, happen lot, to think that a, a majority lot. of them are I gay think, or they're women. Yeah, so I'm just sitting here. Like, <laughs> I don't know about I'm, a majority that are gay. That's silly. And then like when yeah. you say read for pleasure, okay. I think about I think about all these old guys that read like World War II history novels, like or like Civil that's War novels. That's definitely a fucking. But that's the but, women for that. But that's where I want to to go with this, right? And I don't. I, I don't mean to make this like the whole topic. This doesn't need to be the thing, okay? All right. <laughs> but since Corey brought it up, these are things that are fucking gay that give um, women the ick. <laughs> Dudes reading, check. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, I, I think there are different um, forms of. I, I can agree there are different forms of reading um, or genres at, at the very least um, that are populated by different. You know, yeah. erotica is probably now, when we're talking feminine. about high fantasy is probably mostly men nerds yeah 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 right but like so when ali i'm guessing right now you could correct me if i'm wrong but i'm guessing when i talked to you about when i mentioned erotic fiction to you you were thinking of like the supermarket book right that like someone picks up and looks and you see like women reading out in the train mm -hmm. in that case you're probably absolutely correct however what i was talking about is on the internet so on the internet, um, there's these sites, right, that you can go to uh, that have a whole bunch of uh, uh, different types, right? Um, and there, I, and again, this is my intuition, right? So I'll, I'll say that, state that. Um, but it seems to me, from like the looking at the comment sections, looking at like what seems to be like the um, the gender of the people who who read these things, and then the uh, who seems to be the target audience of the stories. It seems like there's a lot of men. And it seems to me always Hypothesis. that there was more men than not um, on those types of sites. Uh, but like, that's like, it, that doesn't have the it's publishing history and cultural, um, uh, a cultural, uh, it's not the same cultural artifact as holding a book on a train, reading something. Uh, dirty, I, would say, right? I would say this. So yeah. I would say that if, if if I were to if I were to wager a guess, right, I would say that reading for some form of erotica or sexual pleasure, right, um, is likely tied 
it's, it's likely a protective factor in the way that you engage in, and this is purely hypothetical, right? I, or I'm not hypothetical, but like this is a hypothesis. I'm not saying this is true. I'm just saying my intuition here um, is, is, is that there may be a protective factor in reading and that you're separated from the sex act itself and that you're separated from the danger of engaging in the, in the act. And so in general, I would say that women probably read more erotica because the idea of being with an aggressive, violent, um, you know, maybe a potential BDSM relationship or like a bad boy, whatever it may be, may be something that like they would might want to be protected from but still engage yeah. with to a certain like degree. A Don Draper and then when you, yeah. and then when yeah. you talk right and then when <laughs> you the talk 80s. about and when you talk about going onto like an internet website where they're incredibly kink heavy and the kinks are going to be more extreme, then you probably start to tip the scales towards men because men are the ones that have sexual imprinting and to, and, and we know from a scientific perspective are far more likely to develop kinks. Whereas women when when they have things in their past or you know, personality changes, trauma, etc. They don't tend to develop kinks so much as they tend to develop um, hypo and hypersexualism, right? They tend to be more sexually aggressive or less sexually aggressive, whereas men like randomly get a foot fetish, right? Um, it's just it's just the way our sexuality differs. And so that would be probably my best guess as to why erotica lean and romance leans towards women, but then like the really creepy, kinky, crazy shit on the internet might start to lean towards men because they're engaging in a kink that they might not want to tell other people about. Okay. Also, also oh, right. Prime, like just bouncing off of what, uh, what Scott said, I think women are probably more conscientious of the way that women are treated in porn in actual videotaped pornography. And I think that that's a concern that women have like far more, probably more so in comparison to men. I think like I I know like I've spoken to other women like there's more of a care as to what's going on and so if you read something you are able to indulge in something sexual without worrying about like the participants on the screen which is another reason like why erotica might appeal to more to women as opposed to men. Yeah. Wait, are you I saying that's that that's more minor factor clarify, than you're we saying, think. Yeah, what you yeah, I just want to clarify what you're saying. You're I saying agree, that people are concerned about the the porn actors and actresses like they're worried Women like, do, yeah. Mid, yeah. mid, like I'm cranking one out. They're like, I hope that there's nothing <laughs> bad happening here. Like, well, no, they don't seek that, that up. I, I don't. They, they just wouldn't on. crank one out. Is the is the. I don't. Uh, yeah, it's, I, it's I, not I, that yeah. crazy. Dude. I don't watch porn for the very same reason. Like when I, I have a pivotal moment where I stopped watching porn. I was watching pornography and I saw a girl and she had on one of her knuckles, she had the word fuck tattooed on her knuckles. And I was all into it. It yes, was very so. aggressive. It was my type of thing. And then the other knuckles later on the porn pornography. Gives, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I said, gotta say. You, so hold on. I'm almost done. Kids? Shut, dude, don't interrupt kids? me. No, no gives. it says, <laughs> no, it says fuck on one knuckles. And then later in the oh. porn, I saw her other hand and it said, you dad. And I realized that her knuckles said, fuck you, dad. Ow. On the and, knuckles? and I was just sitting there and I was like, oh, okay, yeah. I'm like, I was like, I like, as females yeah. on the internet describe the ick, I had the ultimate ick, right? I was just like, I'm out. This is fucking horrible. And then I watched Dr. Drew Celebrity Rehab when I was younger. And I remembered oh, no. all of that with like Penny something. I can't remember her last name or whatever but one of her names is penny and she talked about like just the industry and like the trauma and the drug abuse and like everything and i was just like i can't do it like i can't get off to it so like, it's just not sure possible. i, I don't want to yeah, i had a very Sorry. similar thing happen to me scott yeah I, yeah db yeah db feels the same way uh if you want to say say your piece there but I, I, this is not the focus i wanted to have on but go ahead db you didn't pick a topic. Um, well, there's, <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I can tell you, it's just I, very similar. Uh, I think I've told this to you before. I had a very similar situation after it. I was watching porn. I wasn't even really watching. I was just looking for something to watch, right? In my bed, middle of, middle of the fucking night. Figured I'd, I'd get one off really quick. And I'm just scrolling through random ass videos, not even just like skipping to the middle of the video to see what's going on and then going to the next one, trying to find something cool, right? And then I get to this video where uh, I remember this this woman with her legs in the air, right? And these two guys standing over her in the fucking grodiest looking hotel ever. <laughs> and and I remember very clearly, like, the guy that looks down at her and it's like, oh, yeah, bitch, a dick in the ass, balls in the pussy or some shit like that. <laughs> right? he, had, he had this, like, dick in her ass and his balls in her pussy or the other way around. One of these, right? And I remember just, like, up. hearing that, hearing that and then looking at her face and then looking at his face and the other guy that was there looking at his face. And I could tell none of them wanted her to be there. 
right? They all looked extremely uncomfortable, but they were like yeah. forcing themselves through it. Yeah. And it's I just had like this feeling of, like, oh shit, I'm yeah. I'm getting off on these people who are just trying to pay their fucking rent, who are probably desperate as fuck, and it's disgusting. Yeah, I just I, can't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, the stats don't match up what y'all are saying, though. Like, here, I'm going to post some stats right here. But, like, if you go look up the four women category on any of these websites, it's, like, mainly, like, the most hardcore shit you've ever seen. Like, they're tied up. It's public disgrace. There's, like, nine dudes running a train on them. And that's Wait. the four women category, right? And then when I look at the stats, it matches this up. Four women is, like, plus 202%. So, apparently, like... I don't know, but the stats uh, are saying that the women are watching. Those are two war. different claims. Uh, l- 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 that's, l- those are different claims. Oh, go ahead. If that's not attacking to give the actual try. claim, yeah, it's fine. I am attacking the actual claim. I don't, I don't know how you're missing. No, you're not. FQ. No, you're not. FQ. FQ, give it a try. You want to say something? Okay, I, I don't want to interrupt the back and forth, but just a couple of things. So I could be wrong, and I'm going off of memory here, but if memory serves, I looked at like the statistics of like what was the most popular porn categories for women like a few years ago, and if I'm not mistaken, I think the number one was lesbian porn. I, I'm pretty sure that's still, I'm not sure if that's still true, but I think it's true, and the specific act that was described was oral sex being performed on women which is one of the things that like i think it's the number one category that women seek out and Mm. i agree with you if you scroll down like the list like i think gangbang is there like in the list of things that women like but it's way down the list and i don't think like like solo porn i'm pretty sure is like one of the things that was listed solo male porn um most i don't understand what this has to do with anything oh oh, let it finish let it finish well what it has to do with is that like the the porn that like women are selecting for it might be weird but it's often pornography that like either the where the camera is either focused from the woman's perspective where she it's from what she is able to see or it's focusing specifically on acts that are more likely to result in a female orgasm so that's why the lesbian porn category it's not because most women like her think well, I mean, yeah, yeah i mean that's fair but my, my my contention isn't that my contention is the claim is that more the claim that you made right or the i don't know that you necessarily like stood by it as like a hardcore claim just like a like kind of how i was like a hypothesis right is the is the concept that females might tend to be more conscientious and check out of porn entirely so that wouldn't be measuring well, those females it would only be measuring the females that hadn't checked out of porn in in where's video, the category rejected sense. porn hub so and they're not visiting they, they, <laughs> right so so if they're so so they're they're two different claims it's 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 like yeah if if women that do watch porn, even if they wanted to watch like the most violent stuff and it was all like habristophilia, like, you know, inmate rapes girl, like whatever, like over and over again, it wouldn't matter because the claim would still be fairly true that more women had switched over to erotica because of their concerns with the porn industry. Like it wouldn't matter what type of porn that those that weren't those women were consuming. I think that it's Hold on, probably... can you tell me what habristophilia is? It's I'm looking up right now. It's an attraction, it's a, attraction to criminality. Okay. Uh, so like yeah. like 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 I like girl liking like thug dudes or like look liking like guys oh, we had in a prison conversation about that a few or like weeks ago. Well, you could you could even say liking the bad boy is like a soft variant of habristophilia. Yeah, right? Also, like, conversation liking about someone. That. Yeah. yeah, I mean like, but, but but I was just taking the most extreme stance there, right? Like it wouldn't matter. Yeah. So, uh, so I can, I can, here's a couple of things. So I think that like the reason we're going to the gas station Harlequin romance novel is because like, that's what most people's experience of like what erotic is. But as like Prime said, the way that like people experience like written erotica today in the 21st century is very different than like you know, how most of us probably remember encountering it at the library or in the gas station right. or, you know, at the like, local. They're at home center, on right? their phone. Like they're not trying to be seen buying that. Yeah. So, but I, but on top of that, with the advent of the internet, um, because like in the past, if you wanted to buy porn, you had to go into the store to buy the DVD or to buy the magazine, you right. have to be seen, right? That's a reason I think, I don't know, it's a, I'm not gonna stand really strongly, I'm guessing that's a reason like why women, like why there's this idea that like erotica is for women and porn is for men. I would guess that probably like, it would probably pe- feel pr- would have felt pretty intimidating for a woman in 1990 to walk into like a weird like porno like flick store to like buy a DVD and to leave, right? It's probably a lot less something crazy. To to VHS. Yeah, VHS Positing mean, something yeah. crazy. What if what if also dudes are just more likely to make it known that they're there or to comment simply because dudes have post nut clarity? 
right? Like, I don't know if anybody here has been, I don't, I don't know if, Fairy Queen, I don't know if you have previously were a man. I don't think you were, right? But so, so, so from the, from the male experience, no, no, right? Today. <laughs> right? Like girls, I have been told by girls that like, you know, like, oh, you just wanted someone for sex, right? Oh, you just wanted them for sex and then you threw them away when you were done with them. And it's like, no, 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 no. I thought I liked you and then I came and then I realized I don't like you at all. Right? That like dudes, thing, though. right? Like dudes post nut clarity yeah. can be like shocking. And so like, I wonder if dudes and are just like nut and then they're just like, I have to comment about how fucked up this scene was. Like, like they just get nerdy about something or like whatever. And girls are just like not involved in that. And so there's like a, a kind of like a, a, um, availability bias where like you see dudes and, and ty- types of dudes commenting and saying things. And so the assumption is that there are more men here, but like the women are like the, the silent majority as Trump or Hitler would say, the, right? The like women they're aren't just gonna w- reading, but not saying anything. Gonna, the women aren't going to comment because the second there's a woman in the comment board, all the men are going to go and add and DM that woman. It's, it's more of a, I would say it's more of a private. I mean, that thing. too. It's yeah. More, yeah. That's, that's yeah. realistically what it is, right? Like women don't want to reveal. If you have an like, account on a porn know. site, I feel like you're like, I, I, these seem like the kind of people that are seeking that kind of shit out. Right. Like what kind of person makes yeah. like an account on a porn site? It's fucking weird. Yeah. I also want to say Fabian touched on something very important. Some people want to save categories. They want to save favorite videos. Listen, man, I, I understand it's a social fucking media weird, at the end right? of the day. Right. I, people that I, I've scrolled the comment weird. section once and there are like, there are little communities of people hanging out in there. There you know? are communities there. No, he's 100%. It's like, like these the sociopaths streams. who save yeah, like, like a terabyte of porn to their fucking computer. Fabian touched on something very important, though, fucking which is crazy. the uh, the post not clarity. This is why you shouldn't wait till you get married. Have sex. No, that's just a mostly unintelligent married, person. What, no, what if you get know. married and all of a sudden your dick rejects them? You know, like, mm, you uh, wasted all those dime, you know, dating wow. them. That's wonderful. Okay, so I wanted to like uh, like rewind back a little bit in this conversation. I, don't, I, don't. Uh, I, I just want to rewind back a little this conversation because I, 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 like I said, I wanted this to be very limited in scope, but you know, well, this is what happens when I don't pick a topic, like Scott said, right? Um, so, um, like I, the only thing I wanted to like address really also, is like I might lose whether, power. I don't know. It's like storming like crazy out here. Oh, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, hope that doesn't happen. Um. Uh, is like like the ratio between women and men on these sites. Now I've gone to a few sites, not just like one site that I've like I've gone to. Like I said, I've been doing this for a long time, and I like it a lot. So, yeah. Um, but uh, like looking at the types of stories, right, and like the, the the ones the stories that get like the most sorry the the categories uh, that get the most attention, these feel like they're um uh targeted towards men now i know that women to be clear i know that women uh take part in this um and i know that women can have extreme imaginations so like i i have like like a few stories in my head that like are there like they're like nightmare fuel right like like the worst shit and all of those stories written by women every single one of them written by a woman like uh, women can can take it there if they want to, like, I guarantee you, um, in terms of like weird fetish and shit, right? Like, yeah. Um, but it's just about ratios but, is all I was saying. Yeah. 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 This, yeah. I know. Ratio, I, I hear you. I hear you. Right. Um, and then the, and I've already, I've bought this up many times before, right? Like anytime the subject comes up, I've, I've said it, look, the, in the any site that I've gone to, right. The biggest category and take what you will out of this, the biggest category always seems to be mother and son stories. I don't have to do with that. Leave that, leave that there for you to contemplate. But like that is like that category gets a ton of fucking attention. Um it could be women. Could be a lot of women there, maybe. I don't think so. Anyway. Um I'll so, wait, just, say so. real real quick, just let me clarify because I, I kind of jumped in. You so there's just a bunch of websites where there's books being written, fiction and men seem to be the ones that are. I'm, I'm like trying to catch up with the. the, the they're, yeah, they're not. Nece- they're not necessarily book length or anything like that. They just could be short stories or like longer than short stories, like right? Reddit they have multi chapters. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they could be like yeah, a Reddit post length. But they could be much longer, longer than that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, like the the like because it's not in the form of a book, it can be whatever length, right? So some of them can be very, very long. Some of them extremely short, like a page, one pager, you know? It just okay. depends. Um, and yeah, like for- so is it like a forum, more like a forum? 
It's not. Uh, I mean, some of them are forms. Others are okay. like the ones I've out. gone to are just like straight up sites where like there here, here's a category. Click on the category, um, and then here's a bunch of stories uh, in that category. Okay. Yeah. Again, All right, what's cool. the question? I got bored. What's the question? No, it's not important. The audio answer. FQ, go ahead. Uh, I think Boxwood was going to say something. I'll go after him. You after him? Okay. Yeah, I'm having a little bit of network issues, so I apologize if this has already been gone through. But um, just so we're all clear, women are much, much more likely uh, than men are to view hardcore sex, pornography, rough sex, gangbang, bo uh, bondage, double penetration, threesome, fisting, orgy, squirt, um, by significant margins, more so than men. I think women are really just like corrupting influences, right? They're just sex hungry uh, harpies and they're coming after us and trying to corrupt us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Suck us dry. It might be another way of- It's already been said, Lactoid. <laughs> just making sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, FQB, I, <laughs> you asked to follow that one. And I, I didn't-, I didn't uh, I, I'm gonna ignore the last comment. Um, <laughs> I. You know, I know we're talking, this is an aspect of erotic fiction that's different. Well, it's not always different about some, there are some pieces of pornography that would be similar to this, but there's a lot of fiction that is erotic fiction that is also, that is literary, that is beautiful. It feel, even if it is, has smut written all throughout the pages, the fact that it is like, it, it's written, it gives it a sort of aura of artistry, like when you pick it up, that isn't, that isn't necessarily there. Like if you're just on Pornhub and you're just clicking on, you know, gang bang fisting, you know, person, you know, is being tortured or whatever, right? So that's an added, that's an ass, that's a flavor that's on top, that makes erotic fiction also appealing, right? Uh, and I, I've spoken to a couple, I, I know a few sex workers and like one of the things that is actually, it, it's it's pretty sad, like the, something that they told me, which was that they viewed their work, like of photographing their bodies, like as, as a basically a form of art um they viewed it as a way of, of self-expression a way of celebrating like the human body what it looks like the female <laughs> nude yeah but that's yeah. exactly the problem right like the the problem is is that like then you know you the effects the of sex positive really feminism on society <laughs> write a dissertation well i i I think that like that's an aspect. Uh, there's a there's a piece I haven't read it, but it's a good. I want to read it. It's by Susan Sontag, and she talks about like how we think we put like some categories that are definitely pornographic in the in the category of literature, and we put pornography and erotica over here. When in reality, there's uh, the walls between these two different like categories are actually a lot thinner, and there are and it's it's mostly like it, it chalks it up to like how great good you are as a writer as to whether or not it's considered mm. erotica as opposed to it being considered to be a form of art right so mm. like i mean like if i i mean we you you can probably like think of like some sex workers some only fans people who sell you know picture naked pictures of their frontal body right and we would call that you know we would call that pornography and it is pornography right but we don't think that like when you go to the art museum and you see you know a, a, a naked sculpture of a woman right and you don't think that like when you go and you see a painting or when you see so and that's i, I, wait, I do i don't get how we how we don't yeah how we don't pornographic statue of david yeah, it's, it's not yeah it's sexual yeah it's sexual it's erotic it's in it's uh, yeah 100 percent. i don't get how it's not i mean just because just because okay i get that it's art i get that it's, like, want, everyone wants to interpret like you know statues as art or like you're trying to say like words are art in a book it can be artistic blah blah, blah. at the end of the day it was just an example of like what was sexy at the time and well, so it like is books, that, but it's and not then with the books, that. With the books, with the thing, I, like, I think we all understand women are more verbal, men are more visual. So I think just because women are getting off by reading I mean, books, why? It's this, you're reading the book, they're getting off. Just because they have the ability to do it in book form doesn't change the difference that when men wa when are when men are watching regular sure. porn, they're getting off and sure, that's the sure the uh, sure but like but that's but you're making like Susan Sontag's point, which is that like a lot of things that we consider to be art, like would could actually be considered to be pornographic but the reverse of that is also true where you have things that are considered to be pornography or considered to be erotica but are also pieces of literature they are also pieces of art so like an example of this would be lady chatterley's lover right that was an extremely scandalous book you know it was the watershed moment it was banned for obscenity 
and it had tons of sex scenes that were written all throughout the book. The whole the whole story, it's about a woman who has an affair with the gamekeeper. It's in the early 20th century England, you know, and she gets pregnant and she has this affair and it's this scandalous thing, right? But and it is that, and it is about sex, and that's an aspect of the book. Like it's an it's erotic fiction, but it's not merely erotic fiction, and so, it's not only about sex. Well, yeah, you know, just like sex scenes in movies don't I, make the whole movie about sex scenes. But when a movie has a forty five second sex scene that you're staring at, it's kind of hard to take away take that away so, from the movie. Or if it's I, I would like, I would say check. that my big my big issue here, right? So I'm going to quote from the Romantic Manifesto by Ayn Rand, um, oh, real quick because I think I think it shows the actual problem here which is that our society is completely devoid of a of a grounded philosophy of art because art is objective art is showcasing what one's values are and projecting them to the world and those things can be seen and measured and what we have done instead is we have let we have let 17th century philosophers try and claim that like the world is subjective that art is this completely subjective unknowable thing that has this different opinion and is put into this mystical category of like this unknown thing and you can really only understand it kind of if you're super educated but if you're not educated in these things you don't understand the context and so what ends up happening is our society takes things that represent intuitively we take the things that represent the values and the history that we enjoy and we call that art and then any of the things that don't represent or don't kind of mesh with us, we we say is not art. Um, but but in reality is, is that art is something of a projection of that message. And when those messages are bad, they're not aesthetically pleasing and there is evil present in them. We, we, we reject that as art instead of appropriately understanding what it is, which is bad art. It's evil art. So to quote from Ayn Rand, art is a selective recreation of reality according to an artist's metaphysical value judgments. Man's profound need of art lies in the fact that his cognitive faculty is conceptual, i.e. that he requires knowledge by means of abstractions, and he needs the power to bring his widest metaphysical abstractions into his immediate perceptual awareness. Art fulfills this need by means of selective recreation. It concretizes man's fundamental view of himself and of existence. It tells man, in effect, which aspects of his experience are to be regarded as essential, significant, and important. That is my argument, is that art is actually objective. And that's our problem with these blurred lines, is that um, we're calling evil art art, and then being like, oh, you just don't get it, or dismissing it as not art at all, when it's bad art. It's telling us bad things. Um, okay, What's an well, example of evil art? Well, go ahead. Right. Yeah, no, you, know, you go first, Corey. Yeah, I no, I give you an example first. of evil art. Yeah. So that that recent statue, that bronze statue that was supposed to be, um, you know, celebrating the embrace, the between embrace, Coretta yeah. Scott King. Yeah, right. And oh and and God. you can see in it, you know, collectivist nature, the fact that it dehumanizes the individual man, the fact that it brings these two together as opposed to uh, celebrating the heroic individual. There's a reason as why I asked uh, what's evil it's, art. It's a disembodied figure as opposed to, you know, the the the, I, the icon of the heroic man that achieves great things for prosperity. I it's, about this, this. it's this broken apart, <laughs> mangled mess. And you know all of that is present if you research the artist that does it, that is an extreme collectivist, extreme communist, extreme leftist that is against, is, is all for critical race theory and those elements. And he is projecting with that art his disdain for liberalism, his disdain disdain for the heroic individual his disdain for liberty and freedom and instead is trying to recreate a collective there is absolutely projection going on here it is no, evil art. it's so 100%. obvious you, you just yeah. look at the hands and the arms and you get, yeah. you get the collectivists and the crt like it looks and all like a stuff. dick yeah. like, <laughs> it's, it's ugly and it's bad projection. it's bad uh, in every way what am i projecting his uh, political philosophy onto the art. Let's rewind the tape for about to be two a minutes. message yeah, of right? what he believes to the world. <laughs> you know, you're just using the term projecting. So no, I that. no. What Corey, Corey said. What Corey said. Like I just copy and paste what he just said, <laughs> and that's what I mean. Well, you, if you copy that. and paste it, that means you believe it. So back it up too, both of you. I'm, what am I projecting? Yeah, I'm projecting well, one, his own that his, stated his, political his, values his, that are obvious yeah, he, and all he doesn't of his like liberty. onto the At piece. the end so, of that, you say so, he doesn't like liberty. Yes. 
Everyone yeah, that is, right, is a supportive you. critical uh-huh. race theory is against Got liberty. It. Thank you. Obviously. Uh, uh, and projection happening. Moving on. You don't on. know what projection Prime, Prime, you got to be nice for tax day. It's a national day of mourning for us, okay? Prime, <laughs> Prime Cuts is true, right? I'm fucking mad. Not for you, like for your Canadian. Prime Cuts, what's projection? My flag's at half staff. <laughs> Without Googling it, what's projection? Freud's so defense what? mechanism of projection, what is it? Without Googling it, tell me oh, now. Are we really doing a definition debate on projection? I can see you Googling shit. Go ahead and tell me. I'm not what's well, projection? I'm right in my hands here. here. My hands are here. here. I wouldn't do that. GPT. What is it? I, was, I, I thought we were talking about porn, not projection. What is projection? <laughs> I thought we were talking about... Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. Porn onto a Why does it matter? Why does it matter what projection is? We don't care about semantics here, Scott. In your because world, he, he semantics won't, don't matter. He won't He won't back it up. He says he's copying and pasting it. I don't think he knows what it means. We don't need a definition. I don't think he knows what it means. I think that's... Wait, wait, wait. Is, is, gang, is gang bang is gang bang evil art? Shut the fuck up. Okay. Shut the fuck up and back up your claim. I think it's beautiful. Or if you're gonna you. claim if you're gonna claim that I'm projecting and that I'm engaging in a Freudian self defense mechanism, right? Explain it to me. You've had so plenty of time to stall. Projection. What is projection? I'm not stalling. Everyone's talking. What the fuck? You think I'm stalling? Mm-hmm. I'm literally here. I know I'm not stalling now. It. I don't need Hurry to up, Prime. Fuck you. Hold on. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. Shut, shut. I will answer. No, I will absolutely answer. Hold on. I got to keep my hands up because he might think I'm doing something. Right? Anyway, I'll keep my hands up. And in sure. any case, like, don't tell me about, like, stalling and taking a long goddamn time to answer a fucking question. All right? You don't lecture me on that. All right. Well, but I'll do it right, right now. Um, <laughs> he also said, "Shut the fuck up." As he was saying, "Don't stall." Yeah, I was talking exactly. to Corey Gamble and Lactoid, not you. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I, 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 I kind of have a response to that, Scott. Um, so, and I've, I've had, I've had this argument with Lactoid a couple right, before, right. but it was about language. I'll just take that dub. Like the meaning. Well, I thought Prime was. Hold on, no, no, no. I'm Prime's still an answer. I'm not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> See, very Queen, he's the one to tell you to shut the fuck up. He doesn't want to say that. Yeah, oh, yeah, he didn't want oh, to say that. Okay. Yeah, okay, all right. She Anyways, can have a voice. Right? She just shouldn't be able to vote. That's all. <laughs> wow. An opinion, you not know, a vote. I shared la- with Lactoid my opinion on what the slavery thing meant, which I know you hate, and it basically means that women own everything. So, really, you all should be able to vote. I'm the only one mm. that should be allowed to vote on anything. So boo to you. <laughs> Projection is right. Um, we got the whole created kids thing. Is that your why? Politics would be so bad. Prime, are you ever going to tell us what projection is? <laughs> hey, I'm literally I'm saying it. The worst. Fuck you. Okay. <laughs> I think it'd be funny if Prime never answered. Honestly, that would be the best. <laughs> Prime, why are you projecting? Don't shoot the entire panel. <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's not. The projection, projection is, is insane. Pro- projection, <laughs> right here. Going on. <laughs> it's like I'm not. I'm not sure necessarily. It's, it's always a self-defense mechanism, right? It, it, it seems to um, sometimes be an attack, but I, I don't know, right? Um, but but it, we could say self-defense mechanism in which uh, you uh, read into others' actions, like uh, what you uh, are sensitive about, right? Um, so like you see into uh, them, like um, uh, like if you are sensitive about um, I don't know, being a greedy bastard or, or being a cheater, right? Being a cheater. Um, and then you start seeing into the other person's actions, your partner's actions, like uh, like possible signs of cheating, but you're actually projecting um, your own insecurities there onto them. It's a workable definition. That's, so how was amazing I what projected? you can do when you have time to Google? Ah, yeah. fuck you! <laughs> and, and we didn't see all of your appendages, Prime. To be fair, I mean, you know, I mean, I, true. I mean, you you so, so I don't know so, you can play with your right? <laughs> So. so Freudian defense mechanism or not, you believe that I'm projecting my opinions onto the art in question. So how is that, or onto the person in question? Because yeah. projection has to be onto the person, not necessarily. I mean, I, I, guess, I mean, I guess you could take the concept well, of projection and and apply it to objects, but that wouldn't mean what it usually means. But that's fine. Regardless, pr- either projecting onto him or projecting onto art. What did I say that I was projecting onto him? That isn't true that I'm specifically insecure about myself doing or myself feeling. In this case, it's not an action insecurity. So that's fair, right? That's not, you're not projecting like um, some sort of weakness or whatever uh, in your mind on that. Um, but like it's you, your view of, um, it's, you, you're showing that it is actually subjective, right? So like you look at um, this individual, you see that, 
uh, they have, in your mind, communist leanings. I have no idea if that's actually true. Um, uh, and you think we CRT did a whole panel about really, it? I don't remember if you remember. I, I remember. I know we did a, a long time ago, but I don't remember if this person is actually a communist. But like, I, they might maybe they stated that somewhere. But I don't know. In any case, right? Um, They're very race like, obsessed. Uh, critical race theorist argument, which you know obviously is is you know Marx is the founder of critical theory. Sure. Okay. Um, but in any case, um, I. From there, uh, in your mind, you consider um, uh, mm -hmm. communists to dislike liberty and freedom and puppy dogs, possibly as well. Um, and and then you see that Mao did kill a lot of dogs. On this abstract, that <laughs> <laughs> you see this on this abstract piece of art, right? And like you you come in here, you tell us that this is like objective, right? And that like mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't require your own. Um, uh, you don't have to like worry about your own necessarily uh, psychological lens to look at it, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. uh, your your own perspective is like separate from this, but it's actually not. I mean, like you see um, in this art, which is like a bunch of arms, right? Just like a fucking bunch of mm -hmm. arms. Um, you see like uh, uh, the loss of liberty um, and all the other things that you you listed there. When it's so, so do you do you disagree with the concept that art is communicating the values? of the individual that makes art. Do you disagree with that? No, no, I it depends don't. depends on I, the art piece. Well, yeah, it depends on the art piece. It depends on um, like what they're trying to accomplish. Like for instance, like you can, it's so much of our, our, our past art, right? The, at least the, like the Western art in a way, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Is um, commissioned, right? Uh, it's right. the, they are asking for a piece and you can start to read into that, like all kinds of things, but it's just like, I had a job to do. They wanted it like this, like they wanted their kids like done in this style. And I did okay, that. So, thing, right. So, yeah. so if, if someone, if someone is commissioned to do art and they create a piece of, of art that does not in any way, shape or form showcase how that person feels, what that person believes any message that that person is attempting to tell and doesn't showcase any of those things. And it's purely to the T what the other person asked for. Is that art or is that just a construction project where they followed schematics? Um, Cause if there, if no part of me whatsoever is in a commission, artwork, not, then how is that art? So, so, okay. I, I'm not saying that uh, there's necessarily no part within a commission. Again, depends on the art, right? Maybe it is mm -hmm. actually a construction piece, like you said, right? Like if the other person already has it like mapped out, they're asking you, make this. I don't have the skill to do this, but you do it, right? Um, right. Yeah, it might actually be a construction it's piece. It's construction. Um, but yeah. Well, but actually, in, it, would be, it would be art of, of the inventor of the art, right? It would be the art of the person that gave you the schematics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, in terms of uh, this particular uh, piece, again, I don't know what, I don't pretend that I know exactly what um, the artist wanted to uh, portray here. They might have, they probably actually said it somewhere. I don't remember um, because we did talk about this years ago, but. Um, yeah, they like, also have like a whole other series every, of exhibits. You every piece of at. art that an artist creates, let's say like they are putting themselves into it, that uh, uh, transmits their entire um, uh like view on the world right like this piece encapsulates me right this could just be one thing so like i could mm -hmm. like if i'm if i'm this artist i could like uh, like uh cooperation and love and um like uh, the uh the, the i want to capture the struggle of black americans um that credit scott king i think of embodied and so like and to do that i, I create a fucking a bunch of arms right and that's the, the what, struggle what of being cheated on it doesn't Fair. mean like that like, yeah, and it doesn't talk about like like I happen to be a pervert, you know. I don't put that into that art, but like I mean, well, the dick part, you know, that may, maybe did trans transmit. But anyway, <laughs> but the point is like it, it doesn't example. necessarily yeah. communicate <laughs> all of me. I know, right? It doesn't necessarily communicate all of me in every piece of art. So even so if they did hate well, that, liberty, so it doesn't mean argument, like it's in right, there. My argument, my argument is that when someone creates art. That what is what is what has occurred in the genuine process of creating art is their view of the world. All of who they are is encapsulated in that art. Now that doesn't mean that each individual breath brush stroke, right, can be broken down, um, you know, in, in a way for us to be able to to analyze or critique the art in such a way to prove that every belief that they have is 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 visualized there, right? What I'm saying is is that when you are a person you 
go through the act of making art, you are someone that has a concept in the mind. And when you have a concept in the mind and you make manifest that concept in the mind, it is a necessary element. One that cannot be celebrated, I'm mean, sorry, separated, is your view of the world and your view of who you are and your identity and how the world is. Because your mind is what houses those things. Your mind is what creates that image and your body and mind connecting is what is that process of art making manifest your imagination into reality and that art takes an element of who you are. Now, I'm not saying that you're necessarily capable of being able to, to connect the dots post fact. Right? I'm not saying that post hoc, we can look at the art and say, these are the elements that exist. That is not what I mean by objective. What I mean by objective is that the man, man has a mind that views the world and he, that is present in the creation of all art where he tries to make his perceptive perception held in the mind into reality. And that when you can then go and look at that and look at all the things they've said, look at their ideas and you can attempt to as an individual critique and understand it but th but that doesn't mean that you don't make that you don't make mistakes and that doesn't even mean that you might not be projecting as you put it so, but what i am saying I, is i, I was boat, asked I for a, a piece boat, of evil art if i draw a boat on a piece of paper right now let's say it's a good boat you know i draw it on the paper and it's a real good pretty boat nice boat and i go look at this wonderful piece of artwork that i made can you tell me exactly what in that boat uh represents me and all of me in that artwork I literally just said, no. You oh, want I want to be a sailor. sailor. So you, I want so to be made a, a boat. Admiral Gibbs. Admiral Gibbs. Admiral Gibbs. Admiral Gibbs. Gibbs. I mean, you, you see know, yourself, there's something there. You see yourself so sailing sure the Gulf of Texas. Yeah. You see yourself right, right? controlling protecting the fleet. Protecting Texas, protecting the coast, there you protecting go. the border. There we go. All right. <laughs> but that's not an argument against what I said, of course, right? So, uh, Scott, go ahead. You can answer that, but then I want FQ as well. Go ahead. No, you just proved yeah, well, it. You just very quickly, just very quickly. Like it's not, it's not necessarily whether or not you can look at a piece of artwork and immediately know the person. What I'm saying is, it's a necessary component to realize that art is serves a functional purpose, and that is man reinterpreting the way that he idealizes himself and the world into a piece that is made manifest in reality. And often art is used to tell stories that we can't necessarily put into words, that we use art all the time to try and, when, when something is at the edge of our understanding, we play with those the chaotic elements at the boundaries and attempt to make manifest things that we not aren't necessarily even able to articulate, much less the viewer is able to articulate by envisioning it, but we kind of feel it sometimes. And we feel it because their values and their ideas are present within the art itself. Oh, so let's go to uh, FQ um, and then Corey. And I have other thoughts on this, but FQ and Corey, please. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I agree with you, Scott, and I disagree with you. So I would agree with you that I think that art, especially good art, does follow. Maybe standard isn't the right word, but I do think there are some objective principles that are often used, like in paintings, that are used in photography, that are used in writing. Um, I find it very frustrating when people say that like art is entirely subjective and there's nothing to it. Um, and I can get into my rant about like how that impacts art programs and MFA programs and how it, it causes people to like expunge a ton of money on programs. That, that's a whole, but that's a whole other conversation for another time. But, um, mm -hmm. but I disagree with like a couple of things that you, so I agree with you that there are some okay. objective principles behind beauty. And I do think that you, like when yeah, you, you sit disagree? down to create something, you are, it, you, I, I, I agree with that. I disagree one with the idea that like. I know that you're not saying that you sit down and post hoc you can connect the dots, but I think sometimes the thing that you want to express is not always the message that was received. And I know that that's a read, and that I'm not going off of a reader's response, you know, like take. Yeah, I don't disagree very, with that. That's not a disagreement of anything that I would say. So that's not a disagreement with me. Like, I don't disagree that well, people do art poorly or that it's misinterpreted because someone is some form of of genius right like like i mean like l looking at literature right how often is literature misinterpreted literature has an objective well, goal in mind it has it is it is absolutely objective that someone has opinions that they put forward into a narrative form that are expressed but that doesn't mean that people always get it 
Yeah, but they don't always get it. But it's not just that like one person doesn't get it. It's not just that two people don't get it. It's if the majority of people that pick up the book that you read and flipped through this book and the vast, vast majority of your audience share does not get the message that you wanted to express, I don't know if that is the message that you expressed. If most people, like an average reasonable person of average intelligence, picks up this artwork and doesn't see that, I don't know that you express that, right? Even, and I don't even know, like, you, not just that you didn't express it poorly, but that you didn't express it at all. And sometimes, like, like I think you probably would, I think you might agree with me on this. Like, sometimes the thing that you express is not like is a value that you hold but it's not one that you feel comfortable with expressing and so like the the work of art sort of acts as a freudian slip where you think you're saying something and you think you're arguing for one thing but actually you're expressing something a hidden subconscious so, desire so that two you have that's sort of seeping up there's two arguments here right so argument a is that if you express um express value uh x um, but everyone believes that you expressed value Y, you, we can reshape reality and say that you did not no. express value X because reality is now designed to be interpreted by the masses and that the masses can rewrite reality itself and reinterpret reality because you expressed X, but they believed through some social contagion that you expressed Y and therefore X has magically converted into Y. That's argument A. No, I, I... Argument B... No, I'll, I'll just two arguments. Argument B is that if you believe you expressed X but you're unaware due to your own um, your own insecurities or your a, a lack of knowledge of the self that deep down you actually expressed Y because that is how you actually see the world right then you actually expressed why and everyone recognizes that you expressed why that's that's still supporting my argument that art is objective and that who the person is is represented in their artwork even if they themselves do not you know cheekily i say this know thyself right not knowing oneself doesn't necessitate that your art doesn't communicate your actual values because it is the process of recreation recreating uh the the conceptual being that makes material their conceptions of reality well but i i think that might be the word that i want to touch on which is the word value okay like Corey and i had this mm -hmm. disagreement a couple of weeks ago okay i don't know the if 1950s. the thing that Knock it off, Corey, okay? That's enough out of you, Dr. Campbell, okay? I actually think we would have a hilarious... We would be a hilarious pair in a buddy cop movie, Corey. <laughs> I, I feel like I would be the... I would I'll be the, the good cop. I will be the good cop. You can be the bad cop. I will be yeah. the terrible like cop, okay? I will bully them into submission. It'll be great, okay? But um, anyway, but Scott, like, I had this conversation with Corey. Like, sometimes the thing that you desire or that you like isn't the thing that you value. Like, it runs contradictory to your value, even if it is the thing that you express about yourself, right? Well, that's um, a that's proof often... that you do value it, right? No, but I disagree with that. I think that, like, I don't think that's a proof that you How? value it. I think it goes... Okay, the classic example would be the gay politician, like who this is, is going to be a repeat. Right, I'm sorry, one is a lie, like, and one, we one is the truth. Road again. Well, no, yeah, you're, you're denying reality. Is, I'm not denying reality. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm stating are. an example of reality. I'm saying that there are people who have values, and I'm using sex as an example. Okay, they have a sexual value. Okay, that goes contrary. Like, they don't have a sexual value. They have a sex, they have values around sexuality or around art or around fill in the blank that runs contrary to how they actually feel and how they actually go through life. Like, Negative. their intellectual self is not Contradictions like the... don't exist in reality. Contradictions cannot exist in reality. They do not exist in the real world. If you believe that you found a contradiction, then you need to go back to your premises. One of your premises is wrong. The premise in the example that you gave is an openly anti-gay politician has a secret gay lifestyle that they feel some shame and connection to. The truth is, is that the openly anti-gay stance is a cover and a lie for the shame that they feel for their sexuality because they yeah, feel that it shame? is... Right, but they feel they have a value 
right? But it doesn't run contradiction to another value. They value one thing more. They value the gay sex they're having in the in the hotel or in the bathroom with the little twink, Ted Haggard style and methamphetamine more than the presumed shame that they have. And they also value their popularity, so they hide it. Hold they on. value other no, things. No, These are not no, contradictions. All the, all the same so, arguments I made a couple can, weeks ago. Yeah, <laughs> These are not also, contradictions. You definitely have a thing for like a kink that you're definitely like, there's definitely a major aspect like people that are like powerful individuals wanting to say to have a dominatrix that is and be dominated like there is like i i get what you're trying to say where's the contradiction but- but I don't, yeah. I don't buy that there's a contradiction, like, or, or, like, no, you can definitely have something because it is contradictory. You want yeah. the opposite of what you are into. Like, you're, if you're a dominant personality, like, you're whatever. I get what you're trying to but say, that- and, oh, it's just, like, some kind of well-thought-out, like, deep down, they prefer this over that. But it's only, they wouldn't even prefer that if they didn't have this value they held I, that I made this thing shameful. No, I'll give you but an you example of oh, oh, contradiction, very quickly. Contradiction. Informative yeah. contradiction, right? So, like, Let's say I have a pack of cigarettes in my hand, right? And I tell you all, I hate cigarettes. I've never enjoyed the the feeling of, of, of smoking cigarettes, and I never will enjoy the feeling of smoking cigarettes. There's no part of me in my entire life that could ever desire to put a cigarette in my mouth, light it, and inhale it. And I, I tell you all of this, while I put a cigarette in my mouth, light it, inhale it, and go, oh, right? That's a performative contradiction. You can see that I am lying. My action is proving that my my stated value that I'm telling you is not true. There is no such thing as contradictions in reality. They cannot exist. If you believe they can't exist, then you you must throw out Aristotelian logic. Do you believe hypocrites exist? Hypocrisy is not hypocrisy is not contradictions in reality. Yeah, like I I, let's not get saying one thing and doing another. That is, is, I, 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 I think it's very clear what, what Scott's trying to um, say here, right? Um, and I don't, we don't need to get like caught up in like trying to find examples, whatever, right? Like, um, this is a limit. I have hijacked I think, the topic, and now having, art is objective. Let's go. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. But like, I, um, I think it's a limit of you know our vocabulary, the way we use language here, um, is like where we're running into issues. But like, uh. Like, okay, so we understand what you're trying to say. F, do you have anything else to say to to Corey and, and Lackey? Yeah, I think the word that you're more is doing a lot of heavy lifting there, Scott. Because I would agree with you, right? Like, clearly, like, they value, you know, like, having, like, having sex, having gay sex more so than this other value of shame and guilt around the fact that they are gay and they want to have gay sex. I agree with you that they value right. that more because okay. they're doing it. But the what point, is the opposite that of I want to have gay sex? Let me, uh, hold on, let me let it finish. Let it finish. Let it finish. Go ahead. Finish well, your I'm point. Trying to do basic logic, but it's okay. You're not. You're. You're. You're missing the point, but it's okay. God damn it! Come on, Scott. No, I'm not trying you to do that. You just don't understand. Queen. Queen. No, like you just don't understand the difference between contrary and a contradiction. It, it, you don't I, understand I, the difference I, between a contrary and a contradiction. Contraries D-L. aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Contradictions are. What is the opposite of I want to have gay sex? What is the opposite? What is the contradiction of I don't. Sociologic. There we go. We're there. I okay. don't want to have okay. gay sex. It is okay. not a okay. contradiction to say I want to have gay sex and I feel some sort of shame when I have gay sex. Right? In no, fact, it shame contra- can be a sexually pleasurable thing. Well, the two aren't like, contradictions. Okay. Yeah, but the reason, no, they, they can be contradictions. They, they can be, because if the reason why you have shame in the first place, like, why do you feel ashamed? You feel ashamed because you, you have a value that you are violating by choosing to indulge this other value of sexual pleasure more than this value, okay? You don't actually so value it. No, you do you value think it. You, do. you just value it less. That's, that's what I'm saying, No, right? you think you do. You don't, like, you don't, you're not a devout uh, Christian or a Muslim, for example, Right, a, a true, a true Christian or a true Muslim, a devout that genuinely believes in the faith and believes in God. If you're out fucking dudes, you just I you're, don't you're, you're putting true. up, you're putting, you're putting up pretenses. You're saying that you value. What about people who you have like premarital certain, sex? Then you like, you yeah, like certain would, things. Does it apply yes. to premarital, to premarital yeah, sex? Absolutely. You, I'm with you, you on that. You, as long as you like certain both. things, you're engaging in cafeteria religion. Right, as Christopher Hitchens put it, you right, like right, certain Catholic aspects Catholics, of it, yes. but the no, part that goes sinner. against what you right, the part that goes against what you actually believe, which is it's okay to have gay sex or it's okay to have premarital sex, you disregard that, and then you go, "Oh, I'm sorry," when you're not fucking sorry. 
I mean, you might learn to be well, sorry because your values might no, change I, I, later. I mean, or you're just a How sinner could you and people not? sin, well, and so that you can Corey be a Christian and, and sin. I'll wait till for other people to go. Okay, all right. Um, Corey, lactoid, uh, Ali, then uh, we'll go back to FQ. Uh, well, I'm glad this is basically a retread of everything that occurred a couple weeks ago, oh, where uh, to add, like, so, so, sorry, I wasn't so, no, no, but I understand. But so me and Scott, I think, understandably, you know, I think most people recognize that we are pretty much you on the Scott, opposite ends of, he's an applaud for yeah, on the, but, 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 but pretty much uh, I'm in alignment with him here. Okay. In terms of, uh, as an addendum to that, like you can have a value and not know it. Okay. As in, if you're not, you can behave in a way and not in accordance yeah, with your value sure. system, if you don't know your value system, where most people don't. Uh, most people think they do. I'm not saying that I do, but most people uh, aren't aware of their value system. And so you, your behavior can be a certain way and you think I have a value and you don't. Uh, but ultimately, as pretty much Scott is trying to highlight, uh, your behaviors will be a reflection of your values where you can say something, but ultimately what rings true if your value system is how you behave. But to ask the question, uh, what I want to originally ask to understand what Scott's saying about art, uh, where let's say, for example, uh, would you consider this art uh, like me graphing my data or me drawing like a Lewis structure in chemistry? Is that art to you? And if it is or isn't, why or why not? What's what's the disconnect? So if you're just graphing data, you're not taking a your your. I mean, I, in theory, you're taking your conception of reality and making it manifest materially present in the world, right? But I mean, that's really that's really kind of more of like a linguistic game we're playing here, right? As a, because what you're doing is you're taking things in reality and then they're, you're thinking about the things in reality and then you're reconceptualizing the thing in reality as exactly what it is because you're just record keeping, right? So you're not actually taking your view of the world with your values and ideas present because you wouldn't, you would call it incredibly bad science, right? If I let my values and ideas reshape the data into whatever numbers I think I ought put there, right? Like you would want it to actually just put what it is in reality. I don't know. If I value truth, I cannot value truth, right? Yeah, but now we're just playing word games with with the concept that I'm attempting to give you linguistic. No, no, we don't want to play that word. Like, yeah, yeah but, but, no. uh, well, right? Like, I'm not you're talking about, you're talking about, you're talking about record keeping reality as it is, right? To no, no, graph. Gra uh, I don't. If you want to go down the road of whether graph is reality or whether a Lewis struct, right? You're graphing yeah. data. You're trying but, to have a. a, a a that's a graphical representation. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's exactly. It's a visualization of we're trying. Right, but we're your trying. your interpretation your interpretation isn't isn't present in the graph, right? Like you, your interpretation, your values, your bias isn't. And if it is, it's a bad graph. It's bad science. No, you're no, in no. the realm of science, you're in the realm of doing everything you can to accurately portray reality as okay. it is with data that directly correlates to data that is to. to to real things. I, I just don't think you've done enough graphs in your life. You've done enough graphing your enough data in your lifetime. Uh, because absolutely, yeah. if you have a, like some graphs are incredibly difficult to graph accurately. Like, have, have you ever tried to graph something to like yeah, ten no, decimal no. places? I, I, <laughs> like, 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 I understand that there is a that there is a, a a visual representation in graphs where there is a bias where you choose what to put on a graph and what not to put on a graph. For example, I've seen messy graphs where there's like too many lines, and it's like, look, you should break these down into a couple of different categories and then graph them separately because this is like messy, right? Um, I understand that, so there is some subjective um you know interpretation there that you might that you might phrase it or i might phrase it objective in the sense that there is some element of art there in the sense that how you view reality is is present in what you consider to be messy or unmessy or what looks pleasing to the eye and what looks displeasing to the eye and that is going to be true and it is going to be somewhat artistic in the sense that you're you know if you value chaotic looking things more than orderly things, right? Um, then you might choose a, a, a slightly different way of representing the data that looks or more I chaotic value and dishonesty more and deception, right? Right, sure, sure, sure. So I mean like that is present there, right? And, and you could technically call it art, but like, I don't know that that gray area and the way that it's put is, is necessarily like helpful for for what i mean for fair, the conversation. Fair, fair. as long as you recognize I'll that go it's with you, gray. i'll go with you that there that there is a gray area to a certain degree when you're making fair, decisions about fair. how you ought graph things but again that would be the same thing right uh it just just it would you wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't feel it as art i don't think uh i just yeah, think I made my point 
let's go to uh, Lacto Ali and back to FQ. And then after that, we might try to shift the conversation. Um, but, to the yeah. topic or whatever? To, yeah, to anything, really. But uh, Lacto, go ahead. <laughs> I guess I'm just going to give some of my thoughts. Um, I don't know if this is going to be specifically competitive, but it might be. Um, I'm, I'm sort of over the position that artwork is subjective. I'm going to take that position here. Um, I think it can be, it's subjective and it's potentially, I would agree that the author's intention can be an objective question, but their intent could be that the creation should be viewed subjectively. Um, but even if that's not the case, even if the author creates a piece of art that they want to be viewed objectively, it doesn't actually mean that uh, that art has to be, be has to be viewed in that particular way, or that it's incorrect to view that art in that particular way, um, because ultimately this is simply a tool that I'm going to use to whatever my purposes are. Right. So, um, some of my favorite authors, like Franz Kafka, for example, writes works that are specifically ambiguous. Right. The point is that perhaps there's something in his mind that he's trying to get across. But he wants to hide the ball and he wants to give the reader an opportunity to either come to his position or perhaps find a position of their own and interpret uh, his work differently than perhaps he intended. Um, I think that's great. I think that's what makes his writing so good. Uh, some other examples I can think of, you know, the manufacturers of Plato, maybe they have some ideas of what can be made out of it. Um, but there's plenty of things that could be made out of it that they really don't uh, had, hadn't thought of, or maybe they didn't intend for it to be turned into. But of course, uh, you can do what you want with uh, Plato. Um, so I, I don't necessarily see why my interpretation of, uh, of anything uh, as, as long as I'm not trying to achieve a like your particular goal or a particular goal, I don't see why I'm locked into, uh, I guess, your perspective or your intention on what the art was supposed to mean. I can agree with you that the, like the artist could be in their mind, perhaps could have ideas of what they want the art to mean that you and I can agree are bad. You can you and I can agree are evil. For sure. But I don't think that necessarily means that. It's a objectively evil, or that you and I couldn't reinterpret it to mean something perhaps good. Um, this is, I think, part of the art of argument, right? So, like somebody will make a point, or perhaps even like draw a, a painting, or, or draw like a cartoon, a political cartoon, and then you and reinterpret it, and you say, "Well, actually, this proves my point." Because look, uh, like the example that came to my head was there's a there's a picture of like, um, like a road that curves, and then there's like a through the like a the, a grass path, uh, it's a short it's a shortcut, right? And the shortcut's like the free market, and the long path is like the government. And somebody saw that and was like, "All this shows is the free market's bad for the environment because they aren't using the road. They're just they're tr like treading on the grass and killing the grass." And then the counterpoint is, "Well, it better it be it's even better for the environment not to pour all that fucking concrete, right?" And so now we're going back and forth about what the actual intention. Uh, of this art supposed to mean and which side it backs up more. Um, I don't think so, that there's necessarily an objective answer there. So I would say first and foremost, you haven't done anything to discredit the argument that there is an objective um, process that occurs through the creation of art and the individual in question. One of the examples you gave was Franz Kafka. Um, and I think, I think he's his, his ambiguity is certainly there, but I think it's very obvious that you can see the objective values that he places in his art. For example, if you read um, Metamorphosis by, by Kafka, and then you read Franz Kafka's letter to his father, where he discusses the relationship that he has with his father and the relationship of the brutality that he had, um, that he suffered under, that wasn't necessarily a direct physical brutality, but was a constant entrapment. It was like a, a like a, like a, like a, like a, I, I'm, I'm not being violent with you physically, but I'm being oppressive in the ways in which I control you and box you in and make you live in this tiny little thing. And, 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 and you look at the way that his, his life revolved around his father trying to force upon him his Jewish culture and faith without actually being present or going to the synagogue. And you can see all of those elements in 
Metamorphosis by Kafka, where you can see that the way he views reality is shaped in his literature objectively by the experiences in the life that he had, which is my argument. Your argument is that we can have a subjective interpretation of someone else's of someone else's art, that we can choose to interpret something into the artwork that isn't there. And so I, what I would say is that we're playing a little bit with what's actually happening here, right? I would say that this is a recreation of Fairy Queen's argument, where there is an objective thing communicated by the art, and if you say that that's not there, and that that's not what's occurring, you're trying to undo reality. But if you want to say that this artwork pushes or conveys a message, right, unknowingly because its engagement with reality actually shows the values that you hold, right and you want to reinterpret the art as you will through that right you can you can understand that there's messy bits that occur when art comes into reality and what you're actually doing is you're arguing against the fundamental values of the artist itself to say here's where there's a disconnect between the values you put forward and reality itself and so ah when i look at this art i can see that this is incorrect and i'm fixing your contradictions i'm fixing your incorrect values and i'm saying that reality is actually this way you're not actually undoing the objective nature of art or the process of art itself of them projecting their values into their piece but rather you're looking at it and saying i view the world differently and i think that you are wrong and that there are wrong things here and so I choose to see these things and reconceptualized in the way that I view the art but it's not it's not you subjectively engaging the art to mean something else you could try to do that but but it wouldn't you couldn't do that you could only simply say I think this art is wrong and that there is a that that reality is actually this way and you can choose to say that it's displaying that in some fashion but you'd be but you'd be you'd be foolish to do so if the art isn't displaying that thing so you're i think i i feel as though you're loading the language a little bit when you say that i would Maybe. have to say the artwork is wrong because obviously i wouldn't say it's wrong because i'm saying it's subjective right it's not going to be wrong uh franz kafka and metamorphosis is his most famous story uh, i like it a lot actually it's what made him my favorite author because i interpreted it very differently on something that was actually happening in my life and so for Franz, uh, it could be that that story really uh, spoke or, or he was intended to speak to his struggle with uh, Judaism and, and the different kinds of and the different kind of when he was making it. This could be what his intention with the artwork is, right, to express himself and to express the struggles that he underwent with the kind of oppressive nature of his father. But when I read it, you know, for me, um, my so. I'm sure all of us have had a family member who's gone through like cognitive decline. And one of the things that I noticed uh, with uh, one of my family members that was going through cognitive decline, uh, Alzheimer's, who was being cared for by some of my other family members, was that uh, uh, she was slowly declining and uh, it was, it, you know, it feels awful to say, but sort of dragging down everybody else around her. And I began to notice that the family members who were taking care of her were no longer smiling. They were no longer feeling happy. And they were sort of, uh, you know, stuck because they felt obligated to. Um, and, and this person was a good person, so you know, it's hard to, to sh like pressure, like shame her about it. But they felt obligated uh, to to care for her. But there was also this sense of resentment. And eventually, when when she died, um, you know, they would never admit to being happy about it. But they were definitely relieved, and they were definitely better off. So and they were definitely where... like happier overall. In the metamorphosis specifically, I think this is on point when it comes to expressing the the nature of caring for a family member with disability. Not, I think it's not very, you're not, very good. You're not arguing against the objective reality of art there. Well, well hold, hold, what on, you're doing hold is, on, real quick. You, I, I'm, I'm no getting there, I'm getting there. there. Let, let, let it well, yeah, 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 so, so yeah. this really speaks to me, right? And this, I, I'm interpreting uh, the artwork that pre is presented to me in perhaps a way that Franz Kafka never thought of. Perhaps he never envisioned me looking at it and relating it so much to what I see within my own family. But I think right. that that story specifically uh, was gave me the ability to uh, to reflect and interpret and to come to terms with that human experience that I went through, and that's what I think the value of the art actually is. Like the value of helping that's, me get through that part of my life—that's value. 
that I subject like that. That's my subjective that's, that's value. Beautiful, there. I don't understand why again, I can't that's value not, that. You're not, but you're not arguing against the objective nature of art here. All you're saying is, is that when I read that, there was correlations to my life, right? And and it made me understand through the process. It made me, um, maybe it maybe told a story to me because of the experiences that I had in my life that correlated with this story, and 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 it made me accept certain realities in the world and in my story because of some uh, because of similarities between these two things that's not an argument against subjective value of art in fact what you're doing is you're supporting my argument you're supporting that there were values present within that artwork about feelings of helplessness about the fact that once this this burden right this bug creature was gone the family was kind of happy to be rid of it but no one would really admit it all of these things he's expressing you're identifying you're picking up on those values and you're putting it towards a different situation towards a different perspective when we're talking about the objective nature of art we're not saying this story is only about this specific thing he's thinking about what i'm saying is is that his values and how he perceives the world and the emotions that he has and how those things are changed are present within the artwork and that those things are communicated sometimes subtly sometimes not so subtly through the artwork what you're doing is picking up on some of those things and 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 it and it spoke to you and you felt it and perhaps even gave you a, a, a better understanding of your own reality through the values that were shared from a similar situation. That's not a subjective interpretation so much as that is these values were present in the art. You discovered them through the art and it was and it was something that you were able to connect with because those that, values were that, true values that you felt and they connected with you because the truth rang in you in that moment. So that, that could be true. Uh, that there mm -hmm. there could be some values underlying, and I'm sure there were, there, there were underlying Kafka's work that spoke to me and perhaps I empathize with because perhaps of, of things that I've been through or perhaps my, even my own values. But I don't know if they all were. I, I very well could have perhaps read in certain values that Franz Kafka didn't intend or didn't mean, or perhaps I missed some that he actually meant to include in his work uh, and substituted yeah, them yeah, I mean, with that, my own, right? That happens it, all the time, but again, that wouldn't... Right, but, but I think this is kind of the subject, this is kind of the, where the... Well, this is where I think the subjective nature comes in, right? So, you know, I could miss some values. Well, perhaps let's say I missed 10% of the values that he was trying to get across in the metamorphosis and I substitute that with 10% of my own. But as long as the artwork is being used for my purposes here, which is helping me self-reflect and get to this part of my life, then we're all good. Well, what if it's 50% of the values? What if I've reinterpreted 50%? What if it's 75 percent what if i get to the point where i read that story and i completely miss all of what franz kafka felt when he was writing that story but the story is still helpful to me it still helps is me this... reflect on some different thing happening in my life and still serves the purpose that that artwork is supposed okay. to serve so here we go here we go let's say let's change it from art and let's change it to a to a um ted talk right so you watch a ted talk and 90 percent of it you understand and you internalize, and 10% you misinterpret. But you are served a functional perspective by the 90% true things, and the 10% that you got kind of wrong or you misinterpreted, you did so in a way that helped you functionally better in life. It doesn't matter that your recollection of the TED Talk is only 90% accurate. Right, that's still an A if you were in school and you took a test on do you remember everything? It would still be an A, right? You got 90% right. Um, it, it does. You could do this with anything within reality where you misinterpret it, but you misinterpret it in a way that is helpful to you. That, that That's not what matters. The, what matters is, is there a specific thing that is taught in the TED Talk? And, and, and your interpretation of the TED Talk doesn't change reality. It doesn't change whether or not the TED Talk said specific things that you can record and you can say, this is what they said at this timestamp. These are This is what they meant. And this is the message they were trying to convey. Even if even if it's helpful to you, even if you kind of create your own little fantasy narrative a little bit about what was said, right? Because to fill in the 10% you kind of got wrong, none of that, none of that changes the fact that the TED Talk had an objective reality about what was said, what was stated, and what the purpose of the TED Talk was when the person gave the TED Talk. Art is the same way. It's just harder to interpret. It's not so as I, easy to, to just Let me talk on the, the TED Talk specifically. Everything. So on the TED Talk specifically, I think it depends if the TED Talk is going to be on uh, objective reality or values. And I think this is maybe one of the things that we have a disagreement on. 
I think values or moral statements are prescriptive and there is no re like there's no objective reality of what should be. There's only a objective reality of what is now. So yeah. uh, you, when I'm holding a rock, uh, this rock exists and I can prove this rock exists in this mathematical a equals a. the rock existing. A equals A, right? But uh, should right. I throw the rock at that guy? Well, it depends. It, it very much depends on a number of host of factors, on my values, how much I value this person. Maybe I very much dislike them and I really want to hit him with the, in the head with a rock. And that's going to be a whole line of, of questioning that, that really doesn't have an objective answer. So if we're at a TED Talk, and it's a TED Talk about mathematical formulas, about how you know the laws of physics or how the world is, um, I, I, th I would agree with you that there is a truth there that you, like if you were to reinterpret it, you would no longer... Uh, what you're reinterpreting it for would be inaccurate in that it, whatever you're trying to use physics for would probably fail, right? You, so, if you're trying to build a plane off reinterpreting a TED talk about building a plane, you're probably going to build no, a plane no. that crashes. But you're, if the TED talk, real quick, if the TED talk is putting forward values uh, or, or, you know, prescriptive statements and you reinterpret that, oh, actually, I think that's a good point. That makes me think of this. Maybe I should do that. Even though that is different than the TED talk, I don't have a problem with that. There's no issue. You know, with that. You're wrong. You're wrong, right? So, like, if I if I make a piece of art, right, very very simple piece of art, and it's got and it's like a, just like a poster board, and it says throw this rock, and it's got a rock tape to it, right? And my 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 desire was the hopes that someone at this art show would go fuck it and grab the rock off the wall and throw it at somebody, right? Whether or not, just because there's a prescriptive thing communicated there one ought throw this rock it doesn't change the objective reality that i made this art with the intention that someone would throw this rock even if 99 percent of the people that went into the art show was like oh this is actually a piece about the temptation and our in you know and our intrusive thoughts and how sometimes our intrusive thoughts you know can 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 lead to certain things and like th that guy that took the tape off the wall was crazy when he did that 99 percent of people can misinterpret it it doesn't matter what is objective is that i desired for you to throw the rock i made art that told you to throw the rock and it was there in with the de with with the desire to do that and what's even might what's even a layer beyond that is why what is it about the way that i view the world that made me do it why is it that i thought that simplistic commands were the way to do this why is it that i wanted someone to throw the rock is there some desire for chaos we don't you not I'll, I'll might necessarily be able to interpret those things Right, this what, this is actually. How do, how do I throw the rock to end this conversation? There is a what fact. Rock, wait, 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 hold on. This, this is, this, it doesn't this is change. Actually, it doesn't change. If, very quickly, I, I'll, I'll reinterpret it very quick. Very quickly, if someone you says you ought okay. do X, it doesn't matter whether or not you ought do X is something you agree with or disagree with for it to objectively be the thing they are attempting to communicate or that they are communicating through the creation. A equals A. They said you sure. ought do X and they meant but it. But then it was misinterpreted but, 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 but by the a people layer. so it was miscommunicated. I, I'm not even sure it's necessarily it mis It does not necessarily miscommunicated. I think this is where the disconnect is, right? Yeah, if you go and you see the rock with, a t with tape on it that says throw me, uh, that doesn't speak to the truth of rock thrown. Because no, all it speaks to is perhaps the artist was intending for you to pick up the rock and throw it. I, as a free man, can completely ignore anyone's intentions of what they want their product to be used for. If you make Viagra to make like dicks hard, but then I use it to like to reduce Alzheimer's because I want to, like that's my decision. I don't give a fuck if you intended or didn't intend for that to yeah. be used that way or be interpreted that way. I actually that's think that fine. looking at the rock and like and that, having it that doesn't make sense toward the the hold on looking at I think it does because you're looking at the rock that has the tape throw me does and I'm looking at that. Does a equal you yeah, agree? Yeah, of course. A equals yeah, a. that's a math. So, yeah, so if someone is attempting. Actually. If someone is com attempting to communicate A, and those are the values, and that's the way they see the world, and they put those things into that art, did they or did they not have those values? Present Why those should values I listen to them? It doesn't the matter. It's not about whether or not matter. you should listen to them. It's, it's just, about it does matter. A equal A? Yeah, A I equals A. You guys are, only if you know that A equals A, but if you don't know and it's interpreting yeah, 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 which most artists open questions. to, then, guys, then you don't know. Just like the guy, guys, guys. But it's two different questions. It's two different questions, right? Yeah. He's saying that, like, and, and if I'm misinterpreting you, possibly, yeah. um, but that, like, there is, he's saying there's an objective uh, goal there's with an this intention. art, yeah. right? Even if, like, maybe the artist doesn't fully understand it, that there is objective yes. goals of the art. But then yeah. later on, you guys, are, are, 
are arguing about like your subjective interpret interpret inter interpretation of this thing yes right but those are two different questions right like uh see like, here's the problem gonna... let me clarify i'll be very clear here's the problem we have this sickness of bad philosophy in western society where we have brought art into the realm of the spiritual we have brought art into the realm of the spirit into mystical thinking we have brought art into this magical thing because it conveys things that are difficult to convey because it's difficult to understand because art is used in a way that language isn't because language is as clear cut as possible to get your meaning and art takes liberties with language art takes liberties with 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 uh, these things to describe things at the at the bounds of our ability to do things when you when you talk about this from the ways that humans conceptualize the world we have scientific but you can't eat, you can't use science. You can't make someone understand science without reverting to linguistics. You have to go to the narrative. You have to tell a beginning and an end story in order for people to understand what data you found in the laboratory because random data makes no sense. It might as well be computer binary to someone that doesn't understand computers binary. And often there are things that are communicated with symbols because we have difficulty putting those things into words. And what has happened is that that difficulty of interpretation has, have, due to our poor philosophy and understanding of how art comes to be, has become a mystical, magical thing. And it's not. You can interpret it as you wish, but sometimes you're just wrong in your interpretation. That doesn't mean that you're wrong in the way that thing makes you feel or what that thing reminds you of or what you want it to mean. Scott, yeah, you're saying that you're saying that we're wrong in the sense that like we can be wrong about what perhaps we thought we think the author intended it to mean. But I, I still like I want the answer to the question. Why should I give a fuck what the author intended to mean if I look at it and I decide that it serves my purposes to view it entirely differently? Because because symbols have a are communicating language. You could you could maybe call them propagandistic, if you will. It doesn't matter. They're they're communicating something. They and can. I can also ignore them though. Right, right. Just because your interpretation is one thing. If we value, if everyone in the world valued, let's say, um, you know, communist like was like Jordan Peterson and really valued like USSR like you know, paintings and said, well, I, I see something different as Jordan Peterson does, right? He says, I see something different in this. And therefore he popularizes this art that is without a doubt, evil art. It is intended to communicate workers fighting against the bourgeoisie and it is intended to communicate the destruction of capitalism. And then he popularizes it because he's missed because he doesn't, he doesn't understand the importance of recognizing that this art has an objection that it has values present in it. And then we all become popular. You could very easily make something popular that is communicating through symbol an idea that we don't necessarily want to be popular. We don't want everyone to feel and interpret. We don't want a massive popularity boost of USSR propaganda posters everywhere in America, well, yeah, especially if most yeah, of those just people because are you and I just, just, just feel like you're, you're generalizing. You yeah, I mean, because because I mean, there are types of abstract art that are just like uh, two or three colors or gradient of colors on a, on a fucking canvas, right? And these are meant to uh, evoke something in people, ev evoke a feeling. I don't know how you can say that this is communicating any kind of ideology or anything about, about the person themselves, other than they're trying to make you think about what the, how these colors make you feel, or about how these uh, black lines on this on this uh, otherwise empty canvas make you feel. Like that, I, I don't. Most of that art don't is need fraudulent, to, to be fair. I don't think What's it's that, I don't what do you think, mean it's fraudulent? I mean that I mean that it I is have you have you have a tax, market uh, of, yeah. yeah, yeah, you have a you have a market of 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 artists that are all trying to be more avant-garde than the other person and what they're communicating in that art is that value. They're communicating this concept that like there hasn't been avant-garde in like western art in the popular circles that is highly valued since like fucking Oh God! What is that like? Campbell's soup can fucking. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Warhol. And, right, like, Andy Warhol. 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 And Warhol. No, like, I don't. Like, there, there's I don't this think that's idea true. that there's like this is like this is subversive art, and it's like you know, it's like yeah, some woman shoving spaghetti into her into her vagina. Okay, but now but now you're mis you're misinterpreting canvas. what I said. You're mischaracterizing what I said. I'm not talking about like a, a woman shoving spaghetti in her ass or something. I said mm -hmm. specifically, black lines on a canvas or just two or three uh, different uh, gradients of a color, right? Or yeah. 
uh, just something that looks like paint splotches. Something that something that looks like paint splotches or something, right? Uh, when yeah, artists am... put this out, it's typically, uh, and I, I understand like a lot of this. There's nothing. Um, it's very difficult to connect with this for some people, right? And it, a lot for a lot of it, it's very diff difficult for me to connect with it. But um, typically, when these these artists put this out, it's not because they're trying to impose an ideology on you or because they're trying to communicate their ideology. What they're attempting to have you do is look at what they've uh, created, and then. Think about how it makes you feel. Think about what you see there, et cetera. And everybody might come away with some different thing, right? So it actually might might be a way to, to it might be like a mirror of some sort, right? So it's a way to get people to think about themselves and to, to think about how how they are feeling about this thing and how it's different from so the way other people you know what you're doing right now? Feel. You're describing I, the I'm values talking. of the artists that they put into the art piece that they how? made that are present. Scott, you're literally the... reinterpreting what he just said. Like this oh is the God. value of uh, art right here. Subjective. No, but it's how? Like you're not you're not arguing against it because you how? What do you mean how? You just described He's it. Projecting you said, meaning on this these are the argument. values. <laughs> these are the values that projecting. a person has. They have a desire in making this. What is projection? To create this, projection. To create this, projection. To what is the value? Okay, wait, hold on. So, so is the value is a value uh, trying to get people to think about the art piece, about the thing so, they I mean, created? Is that the value? So, so, there's going to be other values present, obviously, right? Because the totality, the, the argument is this. I've made the argument several times. I don't know why people aren't just engaging with the argument itself. It's the same it's argument, that, argument. Uh, that Ayn Rand made. It's not dumb. It's It was, really, it was I mean, stupid when she said it. It's dumb now. Like, uh, I, I hate to break it to you. That's why we're not engaging. Ayn I'm Rand isn't a guy. I'm, I'm losing brain cells every time we no, see someone says female. art can't be subjective. Yeah. Like, bro, like I can sit here and post up an art. Like, it's losing. We're not going to go. This is, unironic I'm, I'm, male I'm chauvinist saying, female. Just, oh. I just, I feel like I'm losing brain cells the longer this goes on because it's just. Well, I, it's well, I, I, yeah, I understand that it's difficult yeah. for you to grasp well, the basic. No, it's philosophy. really okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's okay. Right. Okay. I get it. We're gonna cut I was wrong. My point. We're gonna cut the complete. No, don't worry. No, no, we're gonna we're gonna actually get through everyone. Don't worry. No, absolutely, it's gonna happen. Um, uh, did we, uh, uh, jump the line, but you can never Just really quickly. Right here. Well, uh, to say here. And then we're going to go to Ali. I'm going to go to uh fairy queen. And we're going to go to Aiko. All right. Yeah, well, I just have one more thing to add because I think the way that I look at a lot of this kind of abstract art, right? Like one of the ones, the, the one that I just put in the group chat, and I'm, I'm sure right. I can find others post for you, is it's sort of like a Rorschach test, right? They're like they're like colorful Rorschach tests that these are these artists are putting out, and that's kind of the intention, right? So everybody's going to see something a little bit different, and and that's the the goal is to get you to think about what, how it makes you feel and what you see and how it's different from what other people see and why you might feel that way, why why it might be different. Right, so I don't think they're imposing values upon people or expressing values other than if the value is to try to get you to, to, to be a little introspective, I guess that's a value. But I, I don't know about, why we, we... It's not about... It's not about the fact that art must impose a value on you. Right? It's... What I'm saying is very simple and, and, and everyone is, 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 is jumping to their ability to analyze and interpret. What I'm saying is, is that when a piece of art is created, it is human beings are conceptual beings. They use the mind to see reality. And those things aren't necessarily always one-to-one -one perfect. Human beings have thoughts and feelings and biases and opinions. And those things change the way that we view the world because we have different values, etc. When we make art, our values are present in the art because we're bringing concepts into the world. You might say, well, art A is intended to be whimsical or quizzical it's intended to be interpreted differently by different people therefore it's not objective it's subjective because the intent behind the art is for people to walk away with different feelings and what i'm saying is is the intent is there to create a process to create a conversation but also how they chose to represent that intent and how they how they felt in creating that is present there. Now, obviously, some things are really hard to interpret and understand and view how they do those things, and some things aren't so much. That doesn't okay. change whether or not the artist. This is, is the most like I got, I got, no, 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 no. like like a line of reason I've ever heard. Like I got I got to have a reason. I got to like, like, move on. I got to move on. I got to move on to Ali and to the FQ and then Aiko. All right. Oh yeah, uh, I agree with Scott. Well, holy shit, this game has. I agree with Scott, but uh, the, the artist can have whatever objective he wants, whatever intent he wants, whatever. I'm just saying, at the end of it, unless you know the artist, unless you read what the intent doesn't matter, and it's all up to interpretation. But like, main point was like the dude that invented the uh, the gifs. It's it's supposed to be called GIF. And I don't think a literal no, human on. Gif. 
Yeah, and yeah, everyone just calls it a GIF. So then is it a GIF or is it GIF? Does it matter what he wanted it to be called? Does it matter? He's the one who created it. He's the one who named it, yada, yada, yada. We can uh, call and just it whatever move, we want. Yeah, and just to, and just to move on, uh, you know, there is a movie about uh, Corey and Fairy Queen in a cop buddy drama. It is called Zootopia. She is the rabbit. <laughs> That's he is a great the movie. Fox. It's a fantastic yeah. movie. He is I'm not the fox. Fuck out of here, Sociologic Ali. Mm -hmm. The fox no. is the hero of Zootopia, all right? Yeah. And did you see how Fairy Queen wanted the bunny to is evil. All the bunny the... is evil. Yes, and Fairy Queen was clearly the evil one in that dynamic. <sighs> the box, all right, and it's called Gideon okay, Gray. All right? Gideon Gray is a fucking hero. I have toddlers for children, if, if you can't tell. Gideon Gray is a fucking hero, all right? And and the bunny is evil. Fuck out of here. Yes. Okay. Let's... Is that it? Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to move it on to Zootopia, you know? Fair, I'm not sure if enough. I'm a vixen or a rabbit. I wasn't able to figure out from the diatribe. You are the now. rabbit. I'm the uh, rabbit. The, ra okay. the rabbit was a cop, Bunny. and the cop want and the and the cop wanted to arrest uh, everybody. Well, I'm gonna you bound no. my way out <laughs> into the I, next I'm... part of this conversation. Um, so, Scott, like I I I, under, I I agree with you that I do think that there are some objective lines to art, but one of the things that I really disagree with you, like pretty fundamentally, is the idea that like the point of art is to and this is actually a reason why I don't like a lot of Ayn Rand's writings, is that the purpose of art is to show man at his best, right? It's to show, you know, the heroic ideal, right? Like there's a, like there's a portion of like the, the, there's the character Dominique, like in the Fountainhead, where she like is so upset, you know, at the idea that like, you know, that nothing, that the ideal can't really exist in the real world. And so she takes, you know, this beautiful marble statue and she hurls it down the chute and crashes it, right? And that's why she and Howard Bork have this back and forth, right? And I get that that's, that I understand why you're saying this, that that's a very Randian thing, but there are many examples of pieces of art that are classic works of art that have been historically revered that do not show mankind at its, its best, that do not try to show a heroic ideal, that do indulge in madness, in chaos, in fear, that try to show the best of people, not like at their intellectual heights or like because they created or had great achievements, but it's because they're because it shows an intimacy and a vulnerability and their humanity. Like the painting of the scream, for instance, like that's not a painting I would think of that shows the heroic ideal in art, but it's absolutely a piece you're, of art and it's a classic work of against, art. You, you're, you're arguing against the concept that all art is the heroic ideal of man. No, I'm the, arguing against the concept or the that idealized, art has to be the heroic ideal. That's what I'm arguing against. Well, I didn't. I didn't make that argument per se. I, I made the argument okay. that some art is evil by by expressing values that I believe to be evil, such as anti greed, pro altruism, pro um, you know anti liberty, anti individualism. Those are evil pieces of artwork that express evil ideas. Now. What I am saying, and you can disagree with that, but that's a philosophical disagreement about what you think is morally good or morally wrong in that perspective. But I'm not making an argument that like all art must be about, in order to be good art, must be about the heroic individual, that it must be, you know, the statue of Ted Haggard, right? Like it doesn't need to necessarily be that to be good art, um, you know, and, and what is good art is certainly going to be a difficult thing to, to perfectly analyze, right? I'm simply saying when art, I think I'm saying art is bad art when it communicates bad ideas. But the idea of like expressing human vulnerability as something that we ought understand, that's not, that's not bad. Like I, you know, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's, a, that's, a that's what I was reality. doing with the lights no. over here. I was expressing human vulnerability. Oh, okay. Well, but like, well, what I'm what I'm saying is like, I agree with you, right? It's not bad. I don't think it's bad to express human vulnerability or to explore messier, you know, complicated aspects of our nature. Or to, no, I think that's you know, part analyze. of art. Like I, I said, think, it's I think yeah, I think that it reality. is. But but it also, and I know you don't think it's a contradiction. I think that it is. It is in contradiction. That's one of the reasons I never really liked reading Ayn Rand was the idea that you know, there's this ego there's this ideal that we all have to reach towards and that's what we're and to a certain degree that's true but it it really it cuts out a lot of human emotion and a lot of what makes art meaningful and it's often not that you're looking at this perfect you know specimen you know on the page or like on the you're canvas. doing exactly what i accuse you of doing you're, you're bringing art into the realm of mysticism you're, you're making it no, magical I, I it's am. not 
I, but I think that what makes part of I don't what, engage what in mysticism. Feel, it's anti-reality. It's nonsense. Just like I don't no, engage with on, talking like, about the reality of God. Angel, well, I'm saying reality. Well, Ed Rod's an idiot. So uh, I well, mean, hang on, I, hang on. I well, I'm, well, hang on, hang on. Uh, if, if I if I may, just just one more before the other people go. I don't. I, I'm an atheist. You know, I am not. You know, religious. I don't believe that angels are real either. But. I will tell you that even though I you can I logically acknowledge this and I know this, there is a great deal of beauty in going and experiencing spirituality and having and feeling like you're having a spiritual experience when you go into the woods, when you go to a garden, when you go to the museum, when you pick up a book. It it there is and and the idea that I could understand it or that there's something about it that if I just was smart enough or just had the right tools available to me, it detracts away from my enjoyment of the art. The idea that the idea that it's something that's sort of beyond me that you can't quite You touch. pretend like reality doesn't exist so that you can enjoy an anti-reality stance, which is part of your destructive philosophy. Come back to reality. Know that evil, some things you queen, don't understand. It's You're okay that you don't understand. You're something. objectively evil. Not it's even okay that you can be evil. in awe. It's okay to be in awe of something so unknowable yeah. in its current situation towards your current capacity and intellect, and to be okay with awing that and realizing that there are values present that you can't necessarily make manifest with words. That's beautiful. That's amazing. But to say that we ought deny the concept that that is eventually knowable is to be anti-reality it is to I'm be not, a religious I'm not denying, thinker okay i'm not well i'm not denying that there are some aspects of reality that we don't know that could be knowable that's not what i'm saying okay what i'm saying is the fact that it isn't know knowable that there is some mystery to it adds a level all of things are knowable and grace to, all, all things are knowable. true i that's actually something I really don't agree with. It's actually a problem that I have, which is that the mind ultimately of another person is not knowable, right? Like that we all are housed in our, you know, our flesh yeah. casements no. of our mm. prisons of our brain. Right? Human instrumentality. Really if something is real, yeah. if something is real, right? If something exists in the world. Existence exists. Mm -hmm. It is knowable. No, there are some. That doesn't mean we have the technology. If I have a, that doesn't mean do we, you think we might I lack know, the technology or knowledge to do so. I'm going to quote Goodwill Hunting. Do you think I have an inkling of what your life has been, what it feels like to be you, to walk through your experiences? Is that something I can ever truly know? Even if you sit down and tell me everything that's happened to me, you have a video, you should have pictures. Can I science, really know that? Yeah, FQ, he's like science fiction, right? Like maybe there's another technology that no, actually I, lets you live his I, life, right? I, 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 I'll, 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 go, I'll go a step further. I'll go a step further. If God exists, one of two things happen. Either A, he doesn't exist, or B, in order for him to affect the world in any way, shape, or form, to, to make miracles, to do all of the things he supposedly did, he must come into contact with an existence that is measurable and knowable. And one day we will have the capacity to imprison God for his crimes. That's okay, how knowable the world a must of be. Weeks ago, you're not answering anything that I just asked, okay? And I'll, I, I just <laughs> asked you very bluntly, okay? You said that like everything is knowable. You can know just if you just had the right tools, yes. you had the right. Yes, like, you things. can know all of those things. And I'm yes. No, I don't. I don't have any idea what your life is like. You do not have any idea what my life is like. I didn't say you know I them. I said they yeah, are I'm knowable unknown. phenomena. No to you because you've experienced it. You I cannot, cannot name a phenomena that exists in reality that is also impossible to know of or to it's know how it works. It's not that it's not impossible to know. It's just that certain individuals and certain life experiences are unknowable to us because we are individuals with our own individual life experiences and identities, okay? But I, I can never I can Let me never just change the word. Let me change the word. I'm going to change the word from knowable to discoverable. Does that help you understand what I'm saying? It is something that you could discover if you had the technology and the means to do so. And if it's not possible to ever be discovered, then that means that it doesn't exist. I, no, so, I, 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 how do you know that? Am I, I going to have to bring in quantum mechanics? And because well, existence yeah. exists. Uh, Scott? Quantum mechanics is trash. Yeah. Quantum theory is so, fucking uh, trash. Yeah, we, <laughs> yeah. Oh, hold on. Is it, isn't it like we're faster than the speed of light or whatever? So we're we're we, not going to find We don't, don't understand stuff. certain premises. That's it. We don't understand uh, certain no. premises, so we just guess that it's that 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 two things can be true in reality at yeah, the same time. Interestingly, the word exists comes from the, 
two Greek words, ek plus histeme, which literally means to stand out or to stand outwards. So if something exists, it stands out to you. So if you're not aware of it, then it doesn't exist, like by by the root like uh, definitions of the that's word. Ri that's ridiculous though, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's how we come up with it mean. though. That's no, no, we might not know it. We might not know it and we might not ever. If it's outside of our ability to detect it, then it doesn't exist. I, I yeah. didn't say okay, that. Just, I mean, that's, okay. a, that's a bizarre, I can't reach, I can't a bizarre statement. That's the same thing. That's the same thing as saying, oh, you use the word fetus. Well, do you know that the etymology of the fetus oh, just no, means baby? No, no, Therefore, no, no. it's I'm a baby. Your usage like, of the word corresponds with that etymological root. I'm not saying that that's the only legitimate way to define the word. There, we all know there's many different ways to define words. I'm just saying that yours corresponds with that. You literally just said that if something is yeah. beyond our ability to detect it, then it does not exist. Facts. That's because existence itself is uh, is linked, at least in a lot of people's understanding of the word, to the ability to detect something. And if you can't detect it, then as you said, it must not exist. I, I must yeah, be missing so. something. If a, if a planet, if a planet with life on it is moving away from Earth faster than the speed of light, so we'll never be able to reach it, does that planet not exist? It, it, based what? on no. based on the definition that Scott was assuming when he made that statement, yeah, it does not exist. No, no, that's not no. So I Cal that's your reinterpretation of my Scott. thing. It exists in the material world. It exists. Existence exists. It doesn't right, not it exist exists, just because we'll there never, isn't an observer. We'll never know it. it. It's it's the observer doesn't create existence. It's not. Okay, it's that. It, but but it can be observed. Is is different than the observer creating yeah. it. Right? Yeah, like just because we aren't the observer doesn't mean It's not mean Schrodinger's that, like, fucking can't... cat that like okay, have good. to open right. the box yeah. to know whether or not the yeah. cat is alive or dead. Be cat is alive observers. or dead. Uh, Iko, so you wanted to say something previously, so go ahead, and then um, we'll go to back to it, and then we can uh, move on to the next topic. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I just wanted, maybe this whole, this would end it like on a sort of a note of uh, like some, a bridge between these two positions. Because like back when I was in college, uh, when I was taking English classes, like I was trained in uh, something called new criticism. And, but not new criticism as it exists today, which is now known as new, new criticism, but old new criticism, which was as it existed about a hundred years ago, Fairy Queen probably ta knows what I'm talking about. Uh, and in old new criticism, uh, it, the idea was that of the uh, uh, so of the trinity of ways of interpreting, right, which is the audience, the text, which is that's something we haven't been talking about. We've been talking about the audience and the author, but we haven't really talked about the text. That's the third one. Uh, uh, in uh, old new criticism, it was really the only method of criticism that said you have to pay attention to all three. And um, it's interesting that it came around about 100 years ago because also around that time, there was a, um, there was a very popular um, uh, series of books about somebody named Sherlock Holmes. And when the author killed him off, like, and he, they, he, he and his nemesis, like, jumped off the Reichenbach Falls, uh, 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 like, struggling with each other, um, the audience did not want to accept that Sherlock Holmes was dead. They wore black armbands. They they mourned the character. It was it was amazing. And he swore he swore no he's dead. That's it. He's not coming back. And for years he did right. But then the author in I guess he got hungry. <laughs> he decided yeah, he was going yeah. uh -huh. He wasn't able. People didn't buy any any of his books like outside of Holmes. So as a response to all of that fan pressure and all of that added interpretation that came from the audience, sure enough. He was wrong. His audience was right. Sherlock was alive. And in, in the future stories, like, you find out how he survived uh, that fall. So that's an example of, like, a death of the author, right? Like, of, of the audience sort of taking over. But what's interesting about old new criticism was that we, we still don't say that the author is irrelevant to this. Like, it's important to understand the author's state of mind to the extent that you can. It's important to understand, like, what the words in the text themselves mean. You have to pay attention to all three of these things. And so, you know, what, what, what uh, Scott is saying is valid. What, what Lactoid is saying is valid. I think that you have to uh, look at all of those, uh, that method of, of interpretation. Um, Choose your own adventure books are specifically stories in which the audience is supposed to be part of the canonical like decision maker that decides like what happened in that story. Um, there's, there, there are lots of these things. Um, if you look at Marvel comic books, for instance, there have been uh, multiple um, like story runners in there that say, 
Yeah, if you were to look at every single like thing that Spider-Man has gone through, it would be impossible for all of those things to exist canonically. They would contradict each other too much. What you're supposed to do is take all of the ones that you've read and in your head canon, that's the canon that's happened. You've probably read maybe like a tenth of what of what's available there. If you're like, everyone has yeah. their own, yeah. So there's like a parallel universe in every single comic book reader's head of all of the things that have happened. Or you might not be aware of 80% of what's happened, like in that character's sort of like backstory. And so all of those sort of like problems of contradiction or too much stuff. You know, Spider-Man has bet, met both President Nixon and President Obama, okay? And and, and he was, and a, still he was within yeah. a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there are some real big problems there if you try to like uh, stitch everything together. But everyone in their own head has sort of a way of like cobbling those things together. And that's how the author and the text and the audience all participate to this sort of ball of meaning that uh, uh, that is not the same. Like you, as Heraclitus says, you cannot step in the same river twice. It's nonsense. First yeah, of all, I, like I canon exists. Probably right. good. And, and and when yeah. <laughs> when canon when canon becomes contradictory, specifically in the Spider-Man universe, they just go, "Oh fuck!" Uh, there's a multiverse, and like different runs are are different portions and they're different that, and they have their no, own canon that's more that's, 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 that's one so of the, many so ways spider-man is one of the things they they right they resolve that's those because DC. contradictions cannot exist in reality and this that idea that like DC oh well, you that. just kind of have your own DC head canon well, so it's okay like no spider-man does have the whole spider-verse so like oh no no, 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 no. dc there's is different the one there's different comic runs and those different comic runs have their own canon and when you do that it's they're different they're different runs what about when the verse happens? So this happens at 40k yeah. a lot. And so this is a big thing that happens is they'll go and so they'll put out like uh, the novel series, right? Like the horse heresy just finished, right? And they brought back like multiple plot threads and there's they're called like plot hooks, right? And so what happens is they go and look and see which plot hooks are getting the most fan like excitement, like right? So right now the Star Child is coming back again. Now the Star Child's been old retcon lore for like 20, 30 years, right? But since they left the plot hook of the newest stuff, it's generated a lot of like interest and people are going more towards that than uh, another storyline that they have like left a plot hook in there right so they'll go and they see and then what will happen is they'll go and look at the fan theories and they will literally take those fan theories and make them canon so like you know the whole argument that like it can't be subjective is like it's just fake because they could go and literally go and look and see well we left multiple options and these people took one and this one took it and made it better than what we had we're definitely going to take that version and go so like at that point everything you said falls on its head i'm not sure if it does how do you how do you um, think it doesn't fall with that? It, it, it absolutely does. I and uh, I've I've wasted enough time trying to describe yeah, basic yeah. philosophy to you guys. Like this is, like, I, this I, is I, getting tiresome. Like, like Drew Corbishan was... writes a book. Okay, whether or not that's canon in the expanded universe of Star Wars or not doesn't matter. What, what right? Like it, it. Yes, you. The Disney as a corporation gets to choose what's yeah. canon and what's not canon. Dragon Ball. My GT, only argument. Canon. My only argument it is that be. when Drew Carpitian writes a book, that his values are present within the book. Sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly, and that the and that the way that he sees the world is yeah. is made manifest by the way that he writes literature, and that you yeah. don't get to change whether or not those values and those things are true or not true. If you want to feel different things or oh, interpret wow. different things of your own personal beliefs into bunnies, them, that's fine. Too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, Iko, if you have anything else you want to add and then we'll add to it your final word on this and then... I'm going to go, oh, yeah, I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna go pee. Yeah. No, that was FQ, it. I'm, I'm good. Uh, did you have okay. to, you're like very I'll, I'll timidly wait, raising wait. your hand. So, okay, Lecto, Lectoid, then FQ, and then we can move on to the next topic. <laughs> so I Arch, actually think Arch, that... Arch, Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe Scott might, might be more of a purist uh, on this than other people, but I, I actually sort of think that um, people are going to tend to take like th whatever theory happens to be most happens to be most beneficial to their position at the time uh, and then pretend it's like some kind of principle when it might not necessarily be one. And I, I just thought of this and I think this kind of explains what I'm what I'm referring to. Um, the Confederate flag has been repeatedly over the last couple of years been taken down from state houses, from public lands. Um, there's been several polls on this, uh, you know, even in 2015, where the, the majority of Americans, like a clear majority of Americans, believe that the Confederate flag just represents Southern pride, right? Not no, Nothing racist, not about owning slaves or anything like that. Uh, and a minority of Americans believe that it was racist. 
Um, but whenever you're talking with somebody who's opposed to the Confederate flag, even though the Confederate flag may have taken on a new meaning, right? You know, Dukes of Hazard, Southern Pride, et cetera. Um, they're going to, you know, even if they believe in death of the author, and even if they believe that the flag, even if they know perhaps the flag is not being used in this way, and they know that the person flying this flag is not meaning it in a racist way, they're still going to make statements like that flag is racist, right? That flag was founded by racist people and is the, the racism is embedded within it and cannot be, uh, it just can't be pulled out, right? We gotta, we gotta get rid of that flag because of what it represents, right? It represents slavery, despite the fact that more or less that meaning has uh, been lost uh, in America. Well, it's gone the other way now. The poll you're talking about was 2015? Was 2015. 20, 20, there was a 2020 poll that that showed that the majority yeah. found that it was racist. Well, and the, and, and the Which reason I just for the shift, in, right? Yeah. And the, what and what's the reason for the shift though? The reason for the shift is people pushing that the reinterpretation of this flag is incorrect, and that the actual mm -hmm. meaning of the flag, the original intended meaning of the flag here, was racism. Therefore, we should all believe they're it's diving racism. into the documents. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. The Confederate battle flag so, is evil art. If people choose to believe it means something, well, else, so Scott, so I, I, I Scott. You can, I think you can actually pretty consistently believe this because it was made from, you know, Confederates who were fighting the Union in order to preserve slavery. Yeah, the Confederate but somebody who does evil art that imposes right, you say it's evil art, right? But like what I would say, perhaps, well, is not that imposes, much but represents right. What I what I would say, much like a lot of different words or other flags or phrases or art or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we get to the point where it's simply not seen this way anymore, even if it was in the past. I don't think there's any problem with it. I think it's more or less lost that meaning, right? If if this was 2015, and I'm let's not say arguing it was for like, banning it, I'm saying I'm not, I'm not saying you are. I'm not saying reality. you are. Yeah. Right? And what I'm Scott, I'm telling you that you can be consistent on this by saying it's evil art because you believe very strongly in like the person who makes it like imbues this essence to the art that is like the intent, the expressed intent, and that's the way the art needs to be interpreted. But for me, well, or for well, some other people, I, I think that we're not necessarily of that. To interpret it that way. I'm just saying that that is reality. Like you can you can say that the southern You're saying if you don't flag, interpret it that way you're wrong. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I am absolutely yeah. You're, you're wrong. So yeah, yeah. Like so the, it has the to fact be interpreted. The matter is, is that it it has You're allowed well, no, to be wrong nothing, saying, but You're allowed to be wrong. I mean, I mean right? sure, you're, I guess. You're allowed to, you're allowed to say that like a symbol that like you as a culture or whatever have reclaimed a symbol and that like, you know, that there is all of because there's all of this other art that is going to be with the confederate flag right i mean there's like there's an insane amount of art that exists in the south of like you know redone versions of it or like it's in a picture it's, there's all kinds of other art and yeah there's a discussion around what it means there is a reality that means that when an artist created it that reality is what the reality is I, right I, but that I, doesn't I, mean that, that doesn't mean I, that like I, a whole bunch of people can adopt something and say that it means something else to them they, they, well, they, they, you would say they were wrong. I'm saying that they're not necessarily wrong. If, for example, we were in 2015 and somebody asked me, uh, hey, the Confederate battle flag, should we take it down? I would like I would look at the poll and say, I don't think so. I, I don't think this means racism. I don't think that's you, the intent. You can of this do flag. this with the swastika. Didn't, wasn't the swastika a good symbol of like peace or whatever it was? And then, you know, now oh, if you post yes. a swastika... Well, I mean, you can wait, 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 this is actually a great counterexample, right? Because the swastika was not intended to mean, you know, genocide, but it took on that meaning because of the way it was used after the fact. And yeah. so now if we see the swastika and somebody tries to say, well, I'm just going by the original meaning, we're all going to roll our eyes and be very skeptical because we, we, we really, you know, the contemporary history here informs how that's being used. You're we welcome. know how it's being used. Yeah. But again, Thank you. That's how people are interpreting yeah. the usage As, or why someone might have a swastika uh, that doesn't speak to the actual reality. I, I feel, and then um, Admiral Gibbs will give you the final word. Okay, all right. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sorry. I I I had one more thing I wanted point I wanted to drop in the bucket before we ended this, and that's this the at least a, a stake to consider, like when we're talking about objective standards and be of beauty and art, and uh, for me, like in literature and poems, etc. So just to give you an example of like I know we're currently in a philosophical space we're talking about what art is i'm now going to move away and talk about what the impact of this mentality has on people who want to create art and just to so when i um went to my program when i went to my program to for creative writing um one of the i was really excited and i was excited to go to this program because 
many of the professors who taught there went to the Iowa's Writers Workshop. That was a huge deal for me. For those of you who don't know, the Iowa's Writers Workshop, it is the number one MFA program for writers in the country. Um, uh, some of the most renowned artists, uh, literary artists in the, in, in the United States go to Iowa. They don't go to, go to Harvard, they don't go to Yale, they go to Iowa, that's where they go. Um, so I was very excited, I got in, you know, I was really ready to go and I would go to, and when I went to these workshops to go and to participate, a lot of the work that we read was really, really bad. A lot of the work was bad, it was difficult to evaluate it. And one of the most frustrating things that would happen, like when you pick up somebody, when somebody hands you their poem or their painting or their uh, their novel or their short story, is that when you have the mindset that, well, if art is subjective, right? And it's just my interpretation, your interpretation is yours and my interpretation is mine. And there's not really any objective standard by which to measure it. Well, that makes it pretty damn difficult to edit. <laughs> and it makes it pretty damn difficult for you to give actual constructive advice on how to improve it. Because after all, your interpretation is as good as mine, right? Um, um, and so it would it it practically made workshops very difficult and made improving art or learning how to improve yourself as an artist very difficult when you abandon and scatter any idea of objectivity to the wind. But the second problem was that it was a marketing strategy for these programs to rake in students who couldn't afford to pay for it. Um, like well, there, there's a wonderful article. There's it's an online magazine. It's called Electric Literature. For many of these creative writing MFA programs, the only thing that you need to get in is a bachelor's degree, and you need to have a long enough writing sample, <laughs> and you need to have enough money to pay. And what happens? And what happens is that so you have these programs, right? And there, tons of people want to be writers. They want to be novelists. They want to be short story writers. They want to be poets, right? So what happens is you have one teacher, right? who has like 30 students, right? They all submit a 15 page double spaced, you know, short story for the week, right? And so God, right? He has to go through all of these different stories of all of these different people who are in this program, right? Because after all, well, you might think that this person's art sucks, but hey, your interpretation is as good as mine, right? Who are you to say that it sucks? And that's essentially like that, I think that framework is used to take advantage of students and of people who believe that they have artistic who have artistic de desires who want to go to these programs but frankly they're just they are not decent enough at the craft in order to be there like and this is the terminal degree in the field so one example we had a student in our program um and this is no shade you know he came from saudi arabia he could read and he could write at about a seventh grade reading level like maybe like a sixth or seventh grade reading level and this was an mfa program you're supposed to you're not supposed to go on to get your phd it's supposed to be the terminal degree of the field and he was there he was and we have strong reason to suspect the reason why he was there was because he was very rich and he paid a lot of money right and i frankly i think it probably buoyed most of our scholarships for the program was his presence there and so every week we would get these, I'm sorry, like, and it's mean to put it this way, but it's not his fault, but badly written stories and badly written poems, poems that were not very good, right? So it was very frustrating for me and it was frustrating for a couple of the other writers who were there because we wanted to improve. We were there, we wanted meaningful, constructive criticism. We wanted to become better. And, you know, <laughs> It's very frustrating for you to pour so much effort into your story, into your work, and to see that basically what you've worked on for years is exactly the same as the person who, you know, just scribbled something and came to class like the like the previous evening. Especially like when you can read it. And it's not complaining it's about not this even... class? Yeah. What are we talking about? Yeah, like she's expressing, she's just venting. Why are we venting? I'm saying the subject, I'm saying the subject. Oh my God, I like, Scott. I feel like I'm going to, I feel like I'm about she, to like go red pill for a moment or something. She like, doesn't like your, Saudis. What? She doesn't. Right, you know what I mean? Like, what are you talking about? I'm I'm saying that when uh, that subject that the excuse of subjectivity of subjective interpretation of the quality of art is used as a marketing strategy within these programs to yeah, rake no, in tons that. of cash with little like liability. That's what I'm saying, and that's what uh, a stake in like this conversation about objectivity in art. Wait a minute, FQ, you don't have to explain yourself. Like like Scott just spent like like an, an hour plus, right? 
uh, on this diatribe. Educating about, like, you. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, ed- educating us, right? And then FQ decides, hey, like, I acknowledge all of that, but hey, I just want to express myself, right? Like, this is an experience I have. He's like, why Stop are we doing this? Time. Come on. All right, yeah, all right, sure. We're moving on. So, uh, all right, we're going to go to Admiral Gibbs. Oh, I, um, I, I'm ready to save my time to move to the uh, next topic. That, that okay, might. fair enough. Uh, Fair Queen, you. when you first said the word uh, your program, I thought it was anti-addiction. That's where I thought you were going with that one. But okay. No! <laughs> that's, that's fine. No, it's fine. fine. Like, I, I support you in all the steps. I have no addiction. Where you're Thank at. You. So, okay. okay. I have no addictions whatsoever. It is not a problem I experience. Ad- addiction to rage baiting people. I think uh, that might be something. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I got that, you there. That, that, that might be true. Okay. Okay. Guilty of rage baiting people. Addiction to 50s greasers, specifically. <laughs> <laughs> that's true that, that, that is on, I, on, I that on video I, want all I, think it, I think it's i think it's a terminal band. addiction too it's pretty striking bad. for the record <laughs> i want that redacted from all future panels. Yeah. I, i've Here downloaded the bot already yeah um uh scott i i, I would maybe like to engage with you on this topic at some other point in time i'll write it down um because I think my objection is different from what a lot of the people w- were having here with uh, uh, your thoughts there. Um, and, and maybe it's not too much of an objection, but it's something I'd like to work out with you. Uh, and I, I think I'm a, a much closer to the fairy queen's um, point of view on all this. Um, but I, I think um, the, our angle of attack is, is different. But yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll write it it's down. Fine. You're both and... wrong. I got you. Whenever you need help. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, friend. Um, <laughs> we've been going for our lives. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, so like uh, i'm yeah. not like i'm not here to be oh, the asshole God. like come on I, everybody not, knows you don't I'm, have that's why to I'm be. Here. nobody <laughs> has to be the asshole okay we could just be nice to each sometimes, other that is an option no, that sometimes exists, sometimes you, know? you people need a fucking asshole and it's obvious mm. that's like uh i mean that's an opinion that's I'm that not, evil i'm gonna leave that alone that's that's that evil evil lots of things to do with that but uh we're gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna move I on gotcha. uh uh, but yeah, uh, hello, all. This is our round table. We <laughs> do 8 p.m. Uh, on Mondays. Uh, we got a great group of guests here. Um, I want to state that, like, we ended with, like, uh, like the essential existence, like, the essential nature of art. But we began uh, with Corey's desire to talk about smut. Just want to put that out there. That was and the you just wanted there. to ask a simple question to ICAL that's never answered. <laughs> <laughs> what was I, the question? Yeah, exactly. I don't. I don't even remember. <laughs> uh, it's it's okay. We don't have to do this. Uh, <laughs> but the point is. <laughs> Uh, the point is, I like how I really actually enjoyed these conversations from like uh, these arcs that we have. Like they're a lot of fun, right? You you all like get passionate about it, um, and like everyone responded here, right? Like I didn't I didn't think Doobie would jump in on this one. I, I really wanted to like shift the subject to bring in my man Doobie, but he he jumped in and he was like, uh, "Hey, fuck you, Scott!" Right? And we love that. We all love that. Um, so uh, thanks to you all uh, for uh, that much, and. Uh, out there, if you enjoy all of this, well, consider supporting the channel, sub to the channel, uh, gift bits or gift subs, um, all very uh, important, keeps uh, this powered. Um, yeah, like, uh, so consider supporting us that way if you have a, if you want to, us to react to something that you have to say, right? Because uh, there's super chats like on YouTube. I guess you can also uh, attach uh, bits to uh, your comments in uh, Twitch and we'll, uh, We'll respond there. Uh, I mean, if it's like two dollars, right? don't give me like your pocket change, okay? All right. Um, but then we'll respond uh, to that. So consider supporting the channel and all the way. So if you you value this, right? Like you value art. This is its own kind of art, really. If you think about it, right? Evil art, maybe. That you, if you think about it, uh, if you support an artist, support the that, channel. Yeah. Um, let's go to our uh, next topic. All right, and the one you probably clicked on the stream for. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, over the weekend, Iran launched an aerial assault against Israel. This came in the form of hundreds of drones sent across vast dis- distances. 99% of the drones were shot down by both the IDF uh, and U.S. military and apparently U.K. and apparently Jordanian, I'm hearing as well. Um, 
The attack was in response to the Israelis bombing the Iranian diplomatic compound in Damascus. Iran has said that they consider this incident is at an end. However, they will respond forcefully if Israel strikes back again. Now the Biden administration is urging restraint from the Netanyahu administration. Was the Iranian attack justified? Should Israel strike back? What role should Americans play in all of this, if any? Uh, is this more evidence that the American alliance with Israel makes uh, us less safe? Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, this is big news. Uh, I don't have to explain much to uh, you all, but uh, this is a thing that happened. It was like a, an army of drones um, uh, uh, that like a condor, like like flying across uh, this, uh, these uh, miles. And uh, there was a plenty of forewarning from Iran uh, that this was coming. And then it gave plenty of time for Israel and their allies to shoot down all these drones. But again, this was in retaliation from a previous strike. Um, and now there's a lot of anxiety of this being like, well, the second step to get us to a wider regional war. Um, and uh, there is desire um, on both sides to avoid it and a desire on both sides to embrace it. Um, so I'm just curious, like, uh, where you all stand on, on that? And uh, we'll go from there. Lactoid. Uh, yeah, I, I think that now that, um, you know, the, the attacks come and it was widely ineffective, which is good. Uh, I don't think that any further action uh, in terms of a direct military intervention by Israel and Iran would be justified. And I mean, justified in the sense of like, it shouldn't be done for, for a, a wide variety of practical reasons. Um, I mean, that's that's pretty much, I think, the, the, the kind of the meat of the point. Uh, Israel should not do anything back to Iran at this stage. Uh, the Iranian attack being justified. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, whether or not uh, it's justified, no. You can say that Iran's a bad regime and therefore uh, aggressive acts to destabilize it are justified. And it retaliating are unjustified. It's pretty obvious why they felt it's justified, given the fact that they did one of their uh, military assets in Syria was attacked by Israel. Um, so I think they've satiated their sort of need to be seen as a power. Uh, like, hey, we we did what we had to do. You attacked a sovereign nation and we retaliated. But the retaliation was pretty uh, pathetic uh, in that it was completely nullified. And I think that's a win in of itself. And Israel should just take that win and uh, move on. I mean, Although, why, I think... why expand it? Although I think Iran denies being in Syria. So it's funny that this is a retaliation for uh, an attack on people who were not there. Interesting. Uh, well, the same thing happened uh, to the U.S. when we had that base. Was it in Syria mm -hmm. or something uh, that we all just found out? After yeah, it was in Syria. Attack. Yeah. We um, kicked their ass, though. We, the uh, Wagner group. Yeah, we just obliterated them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's uh, go America. Go team. Um, Scott, please. Yeah, um, I find the entire, every time I have to talk about Israel-Palestine, I always find it very interesting because to me it's kind of like um, what happened right after 9-11, which is like 9-11 occurred and then like a bunch of Americans were like, we're bombing people in the Middle East? We had no idea, right? And like, and so, you know, now that like October 7th has occurred, like um, all of these people now all of a sudden have opinions on like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And it's like, dog, this has been happening for like 70 fucking years. Um, now, so yes, there is an escalation here in the sense that Iran claimed, you know, they, they responded directly, which usually they go through their proxies, you know, you know, Hezbollah, uh, you know, or, you know, other groups, or they kind of do things covertly or the Houthis, right? Like where they're, where they're funding and they're providing weaponry um, to, to, to groups that, you know, but they're not usually taking credit for it. So yes, this is somewhat of an escalation. Um, the current news, right. You know, I'm just checking now, um, you know, we still haven't gotten the response from, um, war council, um, in Israel. Um, though there's some insider sources saying that Israel is going to retaliate, um, but they're going to kind of do the same thing that the Iranians did. Right. Which is, you know, the Iranians couldn't not retaliate. They had to retaliate. Um, but they did so in an intentionally like, Nothing happened, right? And then they put out a statement and they were like, America need not involve itself. And we had every right to do this based off Article 15, the UN Charter, right? So what it appears to be, and it's hard to know with any of these things, 
appears to be a kind of a an intentional escalation um where i i think what iran is trying to do is if if there is any over long term goal is they're trying to basically push public opinion enough to get the us to be like all right we're not getting ourselves involved and if the and if they can get the us to be like fuck this it's an election year we don't want to be a part of this kind of thing um then they can potentially like further escalate the war against Israel without having to worry about U.S. involvement, right? But there's so many there's so many things complicating this, right? Like Israel supplying Russia with weapons, right? And like U.S. and Israel, I'm sorry, uh, Iran is supplying Russia with weapons. You know, U.S. and Israel are allies. There's just a lot of complicated stuff here. Um, so, I mean, I guess we'll see what happens. Um, ultimately, yeah, obviously, they're two criminal organizations attacking each other. So, like, I mean yeah the u.s shouldn't be involved like we should we should back off this idea that like israel's our greatest ally is just fucking stupid by any by any metric and yeah it was an i think the april attack was there was a convenient attack i think i think they 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 got information they were like oh shit we can bomb damascus these people that we want are there and so they did it and it was probably stupid um but it kind of works in their favor because you know the 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 gaza you know rafa um, kind of offensive is stalled out for the last month. They need something, and uh, and Iran wanted something. So I don't think it behooves anyone to do anything. Though I think Israel might try to do like a little minor attack. We just hope that that a mistake. Doesn't okay. Work. All right. Thank you. You know, uh, Corey, please. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Um. So well, as I think Scott alluded to, uh, you know, I find geopolitics complicated. Uh, but that might, just might be my ignorance. But also, I have also no problem admitting that, you know, uh, I'm not the most well-read uh, in geopolitics. But from what I can gather uh, and the information that's been provided uh, and the article that you provided, Prime, uh, pretty much uh, everything that Lactoid sort of outlined, I largely, like, agree with in terms of, like, from what I can tell and as, as outlined the article, uh, the, the retaliation by Iran was largely just, like, posturing. Uh, just trying to send the message that they're not going to, whatever, be a doormat, essentially. Uh, and at the end of the day, I don't think, uh, essentially, two wrongs make a right, in that Israel was not justified, uh, I guess, in the initial attack, uh, and that like, Iran is not justified in the retaliation, but it's understandable why they would retaliate, uh, just to send the message overall, and just, like, political posturing. Uh, and I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Ali? So I'm not, like, the big geopolitic guy as well, Corey, you know, me, me, me and you. Uh, so I, I'm not big on like the laws and the contracts and the blah, blah, blah. I just kind of see what happens. I made my decision. I'm obviously of the land, so I have my own opinions. Um, were they justified? I mean, this is a war that's been going on forever. Justified isn't even like a question. These are two, I call them terrorist regimes, both Israel, Iran, all the people, you know, all, all people involved. So I think these are just people fighting. Does America need to get involved? I No. I don't see why we need to. I don't see why we keep looking at Israel like the, the, they're our greatest fucking ally when all they do... Like, it seems that we just keep getting into a lot of shit from that region due to that like specific country from ours. So I don't think we need to involve ourselves. But I kind of just want... I, I just want America to butt out and I want to see how it plays out at this point. Thank you. Uh, FQ. I'm going to keep it really short. So I think that Iran's response to um, Israel's decision to... Um, to attack the consulate, I think that it was justified. Um, I don't think that the United States should involve itself with um, by supporting um, by supporting Israel if it does choose to retaliate does choose to retaliate against Iran, and that seems to be like the way that the United States seems to be heading anyway, which is a good thing. Um, and that's the short of it. But I'm interested to hear what the rest of your thoughts are. Do be. Um. Yeah, everything Fairy fair Queen said, but I'm actually curious to see like what you guys think about the idea that um because this to me it seems really uh, irrational for Israel to do, right? Especially with what's going on in Gaza right now, it feels like they need all the PR they can get, right? All the positive PR they can get. So so this strike um in Syria, uh, which just seems like uh they're they're instigating some kind of like fight because it's that is an escal escalation, right? And them saying them vowing to uh, exact a price for the counterattack. Just seems like ridiculous, Mary. It seems like an irrational thing for them to do. So I'm curious to wonder if to, to see if any of you believe that this is Netanyahu trying to hold on to power by maybe escalating the conflict or getting Israel into such a tenuous position that people are going to be afraid to vote him out because he has the experience. 
right? Maybe 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 he'll use that to to build himself some kind of sting power um, to hold on to power. I go. Uh, yeah, well, just to piggyback on that because I was going to go exactly in that direction. I think it's very important to make distinctions when we're talking about this subject uh, between different entities. Like, for instance, you know, being able to distinguish between the Palestinian people and uh, and Palestinian Authority, and then um, Hamas, and making the distinction between Israel and Likud and um, the leader of Likud. Right? These are all people, which would be Netanyahu. Um, these are these are all entities that may have significant overlap at points, but have to be distinguished from each other if we're because we're going to have to like work with some of these uh, people on into the future, whereas some of them are going to presumably go away over time. And so we have to know like who it is we have to deal with permanently and who it is that like we have to sort of like focus on. And I think that uh, that. Yeah, Netanyahu does see conflict as an opportunity. You know, he's still uh, dealing with this this uh, corruption prosecution that's happening with the Supreme Court there, and he's incredibly unpopular. Um, uh, and, and this attack actually made him less popular, not more, because it came out that uh, he had been warned about uh, uh, October 7th and sort of ignored it. And then he placed his resources in the West Bank when the attack was on Gaza because he ignored the warning about what was going to happen in Gaza. And uh, so, and also, like, there was, there was good reason to believe that he, um, he started using, that some of his funding that he was able to control uh, benefited uh, Hamas in certain ways because it, really in that region it has been both extremes against the middle, uh, because the the people on the extremes like want constant war. They'll, they they want to any time they come on the verge of peace, it's the extremes that go and do something, even to the extent that like you know uh, 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 Rabin was assassinated, and right and and and, and prior to that, <laughs> Netanyahu was himself uh, dancing in in front of his effigy at a protest fantasizing about his death. Uh, so um, you, and, and he was killed by a conservative, and it worked. Uh, conservatives are now in charge of, of Israel. So like, um, I, I think that what we're finding is that these sort of, it sounds super cynical to think that uh, somebody like Netanyahu would benefit from conflict like this, but in, but in the history of that region, it's the extremists who do benefit from things like this, and they've shown themselves over and over again to be willing to do uh, things that, that from our eyes on this side of the planet, sound insane uh, to think that like established uh, governmental officials would support, but here they are. The best thing for Israel to do right now, uh, honestly, would be to uh, ignore everything because they have been very successful. They got uh, assistance from the United States and from other countries to help uh, shoot down that entire barrage of missiles and drones that were coming their way. And it was such a, so successful that uh, Biden felt uh, um, comfortable telling him, you will not retaliate. We're not going to support you if you retaliate, and you should not retaliate. This needs to be the end of it. And uh, that I'm not sure that's something he would have told Netanyahu six months ago. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess we're going to have a little bit of a, a different take than most people here, it looks like. Um, the whoopings. The whoopings. <laughs> Listen, the only moral choice by any metric. <laughs> is that Iran should unequivocally be taken out as a player in the region. Their regime should be changed and military capabilities taken away from The Telegraph had a very interesting article about adversarial powers forming an alliance together this week. In my opinion, the main players is anti-democracy alliances forming are Iran, North Korea, Russia, and China. There are other supporting players, but those are the main ones. As someone mentioned above, Iran is uh, sending loads of drones to Russia. If you are pro-Ukraine, then you have to be pro-intervention on Iran. My solution is real simple. Iran is talking a lot of smack for someone with so much oil. In previous eras, Iran would have already been invaded and their oil fields chopped up. In fact, I think that we should go in there and take them out and t 
take their oil fields as reparations for the amount of terrorism they funded worldwide. This would also help take out this adversary alliance. Move the oil fields over here. I mean, no, yeah, exactly. I mean, take do whatever it takes. On top of that, it's clear the Biden administration is inept in regards to Iran, right? This is they last they put sanctions on them, and then last year they had a record year with a lot of 88 billion sold in oil revenue. Clearly, at this point, active intervention is the only correct answer. Wow. Okay. Well. I think Gibbs Good convinced idea. me. I'm on board. The, the whoopings? You're, you're whooping in the drones. <laughs> Team whoopings. It's not their, their drones. You know what I'm saying? Okay, but, but it can't be one of these like tit for tat like gang killings. Like it has to be like an actual <laughs> like full on invasion. Regime like, change. Oil, yeah, regime change. Yeah. Is gone. Oil Bring back the shaw kind of thing going on. Yeah, yeah. the oil fields are now with the property Halliburton and Exxon. Uh, you know, wait, maybe, wait, like, it's Israel, one of them. You want to do a uh, nation building? Halliburton, yeah, just just have Halliburton own doing? the country directly. I mean, sure. You know, it, listen. The nation building too really much. worked out in the past. In yeah, that's all. That's I'm what not, I'm trying I'm to highlight. I'm not talking about nation building. I'm talking about coming in there and wholesale taking their shit because they've been fucking up for too long. Like they, that's that's. Uh, so, y'all talking about it just becomes building. the Iran of America. I'm just saying, like, making they can be a special economic zone. Like, like you can be like, uh, <laughs> I don't know, Little Texas or something, and like <laughs> not get like not <laughs> have like, Little Texas like, of America. You know what I'm saying? And look recently, I'm pretty sure Iran is much bigger uh, geographically. Either way, Slightly. either way. Slightly. Well, that's little, just it. Iran is makes Iraq and Afghanistan look like like bit players, like in the field. Iran is people don't realize how much stronger Iran is than any of the other surrounding countries. It's the only like major country uh, in in uh, in the Muslim well, world essentially that hasn't hasn't been colonized like historically. Well, that's one more reason to take them out right now because see here we're sitting here talking about diplomacy and peace, and those are well and good goals. But all we're really letting do to happen is something nasty fester under the skin. They're basically like a staph infection. The longer you let them sit there and not don't treat it, it's gonna get worse. It's like cancer. If you don't go and dig out this cancer, then guess what? It kills you. And that's what's I happening don't now. endorse any of these words uh, coming out of his mouth. But okay. Um, oh, oh, hold on. He's talking about the leadership, like the yeah, people the regime, of Iran. The, the, the people of Iran are actually like more pro-American than you think, right? Because, yeah, I said yeah, other people. Way. People generally don't like to live under like an authoritarian theocracy. Wait, so, wait, it, I, it, yeah. so gives right, us sort of then right, when like we if found like, out that we that we inst were the ones that uh, installed the Shah it. in Iran, yeah. then the people weren't didn't react so happily to it, right? Well, we should and have that's what the resulted Shah more in the like revolution to begin with. Like we caused that by by you know. People like Gibbs saying, "Hey, what's the worst that can happen? Let's put our guy in there." No, I mean, let's, let's 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 let us let us one foot in the water kind of situation, right? But like if the Shah had like superior U.S. support, I don't know if he actually would have fallen. Lactoid, lactoid. Do you? I want to, and I don't know. So like, please, please let me know. Um, More war. Do you really Jimmy truly Carter. believe that? That like, are, do you believe that we should be ha have been supporting the Shah and like on his totalitarian um, uh, tendencies, or are you just saying we should be supporting? Uh, a man, our man in uh, Iran, right? So, so, like, yeah. So, given the historical context, so the Shah, I view the Shah as like a historical figure, very much like I view people like uh, you know Pinochet in Chile um, or South Korea was it that was dictatorship prior to becoming a democracy, Taiwan, right. etc. Right, Chiang Kai Shek. All of these sort of like not really democratic countries, but they were within the Western sphere of influence, right? And they, they accepted capitalism, they and they were part of the, the system. Um, over time, and we also saw this with Spain, right? Uh, one of the first members of NATO. Over time, these countries are sort of uniquely, um, well, not uniquely, but because they're not within the uh, behind the the, um, the Iron Curtain, but they're not within the sphere of influence in the Soviet Union. Like over time, they democratized, right? You have South Korea over time outgrowing its fascist dictatorship and becoming like a very good country. Same thing with Taiwan. Same thing with Chile. Same thing like like you see time and time again this happening. I would predict that South Vietnam and uh, Iran would have followed similar tracks had they not fallen. And Wait. so, and same thing with the Bay of Pigs, that we would have uh, succeeded in. No, this doesn't make sense, right? You're saying that at, 
there's these other countries where there are dictators and dictatorships and those dictatorships fell right and then in no, no, they didn't. They, they didn't. That. They didn't fall. They're, no, they didn't fall. So under U.S. influence and U.S. pressure, there was a, an alleviation of uh, the authoritarian, uh, the authoritarian nature of those leaders. We kind of saw this happening in Iran prior to the fall of the Shah. Uh, I, there's like statements of the Shah bragging about how like the miniskirts in Tur in um, in Tehran are shorter yeah. than those in Miami, right? Because yeah. there was uh, it was really a golden age in Iran for uh, women's uh, liberation and, and freedom of expression. And yeah, yeah. yeah, there was there was this authoritarian government because it was not a democracy. But I do think under U.S. guidance and U.S. influence over time, that could have been alleviated. But we fucking we just get we didn't we didn't commit. We didn't commit to the to to that future like we did with Vietnam, which arguably perhaps there's a better argument there that we shouldn't have. Wait a minute. Hold on. But the Shah's put in place. And maybe I'm mixing up my uh, my history here, and that could be the case. And I do apologize for, if I do. Um, but like the people of Iran decide, hey, like uh, we got our we got this president here, and this and uh, democratically we decide that we're going to use our resources for ourselves. Um, then that's a problem. And so instead, we install the Shah here. And, and again, correct me if I'm wrong in any of this history, but I, I believe this is the case. Um, and so, like, it shows that the U.S. actually doesn't give a fuck about democracy, right? It, it cares about its interests. Um, and so, if as long as its interests are being served, that supersedes all, right? So you can do whatever. Now, the U.S. doesn't like it when we when these things are related to uh, itself, right? Like when it gets bad PR, like oh, okay, so we're we're uh, militarily helping this government that's brutally repressing its people. Um, uh, it doesn't like that. And so it'll make noises about like, you know, human rights, you know, like, oh, like the Saudi princes, right? Like, oh yeah, uh, please, like we care about human rights, but like, oh, you know, fuck, some oil flows. Um, so, uh, so like to say that, well, under American influence, things would have gotten better. Well, I think maybe, but that would be like, um, uh, besides the point, because U.S. doesn't care if things get better, it cares as long as its interests are served in the nation. So, so, so that if you do an internal critique, like I, I would do an internal critique of any form of utilitarian consequential analysis of geopolitical kind of pressure through history, um, you have to admit that if you want a country to, in the long term, right? And again, this is internal critique. Obviously, I think they're all terrorist organizations because they're all nation states with plenty of problems. But internal critique from a from a consequentialist perspective, right? You have to admit that e some things are easy to recover from. Some some government systems are incredibly difficult to recover from, and those that are easier to recover from, in the long term, lead towards m far more liberal tendencies and uh, liberal democracies. So if, for example, fascism is way, way, way better for a country to go through than communism or let's say an Islamic authoritarian state. Why? Well, you can just look at any fascist nation state that's ever existed. Germany, um, you can look at Spain, you can look at Portugal, you can look at every little area, Catalonia, wh whatever you want, however you want to focus on it. Italy. Any place that's been through... Fas well, any place that's been through fascism 20, 30 years later, they're a liberal democracy doing okay. And any place that's been through communism has this like state capitalism, if you're a Marxist, right? More you internal you can't, critique. You can't bring the form of the shit that's like, completely fucked up. Like you can't bring it, yeah. If you look at your, you can't include Islam with that though. Like in Islamist countries are wildly successful financially. I mean, like, I don't like Iran, but they're good. They're good but we're fixing them too. We're successful. fixing Saudi Arabia too, okay. right? Sure, Saudi Arabia, you're, Qatar, Qatar is another Islamic fundamentalist country. They have a lot. You just, they started to, letting women drive. Right? But you're, you're supporting. All, they all are really you're good supporting at, like, our argument. You're, you're supporting the argument that I'm making via internal critique when I say that, right? The concept is is if you can gain a country to have American influence and you can give them IMF loans or whatever. Middle East is a little bit different for places that have oil, obviously. Um, but if you can gain them into the capitalist system where they are. Um, where they are tied to us and you set up governments that are in favor of us, um, those places do a lot better. Now, obviously you have places like China, right? Where the state capitalism is kind of a little different where we're working together, but that hasn't influenced the situation because we have very little influence in their government. Right. And there's also a little bit of an exception when you look at um, the Middle East in terms of 
how their governments differ from, let's say, Europe or Asian countries, et cetera. But the general tend, the general trend is still true. That if you if you ally with the West, if you ally with capitalism, if you ally with with more, even if you're under fascistic dictatorships and you accept those values. 10, 20, 30 years later, you end up in a liberal democracy, just like many Western other countries. And if you don't, you end up in places like fucking China, where like you can't even eat food or buy products because you don't, you can't even buy a house because of tofu construction. Everything is a lie. Everything is horrible. Everything is suffering. The Foxconn factory just had a run just now where they make your iPhones, like just had a run on the fences where the barbed wire is faced on the inside to keep them inside and to make sure that they bleed and potentially die if they try to stop their 12 hour shifts making your iPhones like China's a fucking hellscape and it still is why because they didn't adopt fascism they adopted communism I would prefer that they adopt anarchism but that there's there's your internal wait so to be clear I feel, I feel like you're like rambling on a lot like can, can we just like be very clear because what is proposing well lactoid and uh and Gibbs I think are proposing is well I think Gibbs is being way more direct uh saying that we should do this today lactoid saying we should have done it back then Right. Scott, are you saying that if the United States were to attack Iran, start a war, uh, topple the, the regime, quote unquote, and then install their own per person there and, and fucking uh, colonize the area, right? And Americanize the area over the next couple of decades. Would you support something like that, Scott? No, of course not. That's why I said it's an internal. Okay, well, then what I said is, is what does the trend, if the trend holds true as it has for most situations, I would say, statistically speaking, Iran's likely to end up a liberal democracy more than it is some fucked up hellscape. If you invest enough time and resources and power, it will probably become a trading partner that is a liberal democracy, and Israel will no longer be our quote unquote greatest ally. You'd have to support I mean, a revolution. Should, you'd have to it, take it, it over. It's, it's, I don't say it's good. Friend. And then we I mean, can rebuild it to our liking. I'm being know, prescriptive and, here about like, like what seems to be I mean, true, but Gibbs, not about whether like haven't we right. seen. Gibbs, I feel like we've seen again and again that when when we do these kind of like regime change things, um, all we really do at the end of the day is give give other people who already hate us uh, more reasons to hate us. We radicalize people who didn't hate us that much, maybe kind of disliked us, and then it, and it just kind of continues on this never ending like uh, conflict, yeah. right? Yeah, the, so like, I, what, so Gibbs, why would you? I, I don't understand why you would propose that we do that again. So a couple of things. One, you know, they have oil, so we can take that. That's the big one. Second, okay, but be second, be realistic though. Oh, okay, I understand good. oil. Ha ha. I, mean, I get it. No, but no, like, I mean, what's arguably the, that's one of the most realistic answers. Yeah, I mean, that's, I'm being 100 percent honest with you. Like, what have wars been fought over throughout like all of human time? Resources. They got a resource. They're acting up. Okay, acting so we should just invade every, anywhere that has oil, so the United I mean, States has sure, control of all oil reserves on the planet. I'm, I'm okay. okay with that's that. that your actual position. I mean, it's a position I would probably be in favor of, yeah. But like, as far as what you're saying, what? even if that wasn't, even if that wasn't my position, if we go and look and see, it, like, okay, let me give you an example. Who's stronger, like, militarily? Are we memeing? Iraq under Saddam Hussein. No, we're not memeing. I know. This should, I would so be like, you, you say, unironically I, support I know, I know invading these, every I know country of the oil. I know that these are high level concepts, and it's hard for you to follow, and someone double downs on them, Scott. So anyway, you're double listen, downing back, on the retarded back, memeing. Back, back, well, let Gibbs, let Gibbs uh, yeah, respond. Back back to what what I was, Gibbs. Yeah. I right, so as for like the other thing, I would say who was stronger, Saddam Hussein's military or say what replaced them, which is like the combination of the Saudi militias and not Saudi militias, the Iranian militias and ISIS, right? Uh, well, neither. So ISIS took out a large portion of Syria, made Syria weaker, who's another adversarial power. Iraq ceased to be a threat as like to us. I mean, ISIS wasn't a real threat. They're not going to come take us over, right? So like I would even say as the superpower, having these groups all fight each other and having power vacuums would even be beneficial like a long scale. Like, I know that sounds terrible and that's bad, but that's been a ta proxy wars have been a tactic for by superpowers and major powers for as long as countries have existed. And I would it say sounds that, bad like, because you, it is. Well, you know, also I also disagree with this dumbass. We're all like, hey, countries are evil terrorist organizations because they have leadership. But like, we don't have to go into that specific lens. I'll give you a lens, though. I would say the country has a moral imperative to do what's best for their citizen, and having adversarial powers weakened or eliminated, and having to power mac you in regions like this is a moral imperative of the country to do that because they have to do what's best. Why? For Hold on, but but how, how? Because it feels like what you're proposing would lead to more danger for American citizens. No. And more potential for terrorist attacks, more potential for yeah, war that could get Americans killed. Level. That's on a micro level. What's more dangerous, Iran with a nuke, or Iran like sponsoring like oh like like the like some dis disgruntled Iranian dude from? Or or what if you just had Iran with like Iran and the United States with stable good relations? 
So they, they yeah, weren't I mean, adversaries well, I, and they weren't attacking that, each other and going, I, I going through like rock wars. That's, that's not happening. So I mean, well, but happening? it's not happening currently, but it, we could get there, right? I mean, we, we've not, stabilized not, not, relations not, not, with, it, with hostile power, powers before. I don't see that ever happening. I don't ever see that happening. They're ever? Like, no, definitely not unless we get Why? Them out, over. Didn't you, because didn't you just mention Potter? Because they're literally forming Potter? an alliance. Like, they're, li they're literally forming an alliance with other countries against us. Their interests are aligned to take us out. Like, that's what their interests are. So, like, unless we go in there and do something drastic, then no, that's not going to change to, hey, we're going to be nicer to you. Like, that's just that's just not realistic. What do you think nicer to them means, right? Like, um Consider, because well, oh, actually, let me start with this. Do you think that Iran, are, are, are the leadership, are rational actors? Dude, dude said he rational wants to invade actors? literally every country with oil, which is like fifty percent of the I, planet. Why are we treating him like sure. he's a serious person? At this I point? mean, why do we treat you like a serious person when you sit here and have to look through everything that's a single worldview lens and then say stupid shit like, "Well, every country's government is a terrorist organization"? Because I, this one person who read, read Ayn Rand one time back in college, thinks that anybody that's not a that's part of a country is an evilly moralist thing. Like, la -di -a -di -a. listen, I, I sit here and listen to your bullshit for panels and panels. You literally talk for an hour and a half about like the subjectivity of art and rant. no one gives a shit about that let's talk about some real issues and you're sitting here going oh well he's not a serious actor how about you take drink a warm glass and shut the fuck up that would do us all a favor like i'd be like jesus christ he's acting like aphrodite's coming down from the heavens has only blessed him with the wisdom and the lord of the spirit coming down it's the most ridiculous shit i've ever heard like and then he's gonna sit here and say oh Gibbs is not a serious person because he wants to empire build with a miracle <laughs> oh, 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 i'm god i'm so smart god jesus christ oh Oh, no, okay, you can't hold on. So, so Gibbs, I, I understand. I understand the sentiment, Gibbs. But what you yeah. did say was fucking ridiculous, right? It'd be ridiculous for the United true. States I mean, to, to invade like half the I'm planet, on. right? I'm for for oil. I mean, you're, you're you have. I get that you have content brain right now, and you're just saying stupid. I mean, it's shit not content get, like, brain. These are all refined. factual statements. I mean, it's all factual statements. I'm glad that you think it's content, and you can't recognize mm -hmm. that these are real assessments and real internal and external critiques of your terrible ass viewpoint. And your points, but you know, we're moving on, Papa. Aphrodite didn't come down and just bless you. That's true. Uh, that's, that's, right. that's the bottom yeah, line. I, I, you know, fair enough. Uh, yes. And I only um, read Ayn Rand once in college. I get it. Like, it's it's a string of stupid insults to cover for the fact that I mean, it's that all factual. You're insults. not. They're all factual. It's, they're all factual it's, points. I, mean, you I, literally, are you I understand telling me literally that your every connection panel, to reality you is see, tenuous and, at best. No, I, no, hold on. No, no. You're sitting here. You're literally trying to tell me that every single fucking panel we come on, we don't have to do this and cap bullshit where we push everything through this fucking tiny ass like lens that 0.007% of my nut hairs population has. <laughs> like that's what you're sitting here doing. Every single panel you sit here and you do this bullshit and then you have the audacity, but like much less the gall to sit here and go, oh, give this a serious Oh, these things are just memes. No, Papa, these are actual critiques of your fucking viewpoint. You literally lose every panel. Every panel mm -hmm. you want to sit here and push everything through this. Get it off your chest. End. I mean, oh, yeah. I'm telling you the facts. Like, let, you're let, let, well. let get it off your chest. Yes, I understand. Facts. I, I am getting it off so my again, chest. So again, so again, mm -hmm. you know, your so again, your diatribe, so your your content brain diatribe aside. My content brain. Diatribe, um, yeah. okay. Why are we pretending what like else is you're thinking. a serious person? When you uh, say that you want to invade half of the world, I mean, it, it's literally, it, it is literally as bad as serious as it's your fucking. It's retarded. Yeah, I think he's just being like, exaggerative. We're kind of. I mean, yeah, at I mean, like, point. like that's you're literally over here, like, like that's we're like literally. You say like, oh, well, that's okay. The most ridiculous shit I've ever heard. So, I, uh, like, I'm, democracy I'm, at its best. Okay, one second, one second, one second, one second, one second, one second. You got any fucking arguments? We say, oh no, no 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 we're not gonna we, we don't we're not gonna make this whole panel about this we're not gonna diverge okay all right um we <laughs> yeah, are uh, look uh we got I agree a, I will let all of the insults of stand because we they're so fucking a, retarded a, a tiny amount of business coming in uh and from YouTube Mr um or Mrs I don't know they inflatable file um uh says uh, uh would Scott really prefer uh Hitler to uh Khrushchev um, so that was the question. Uh, if you could answer that quickly and then we can move on from this, please. Would I prefer Hitler to Khrushchev? Um, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't prefer either. Right. I did an internal critique. So, I mean, if I was forced to choose gun to my head between like, which one would, 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 would work knowing their past. I mean, I guess Khrushchev, right? Like, but that's not, that doesn't actually address the claim. Which is that? Is it easier for countries to um, come from, you know, to survive fascism versus surviving communism? And 
The answer is always fascism. And the reason is, is they have the basically the same economic model, but fascism doesn't preach dysgenic family things. And that's the real key difference here is that leftism is anti-family. It spreads people, uh, it breaks families apart and it doesn't maintain a semblance of the concept of private property. Whereas fascism pretends private property exists and doesn't support dysgenic things in the family structure. And so it's easier to heal from fascism and the evils of fascism than communism. I understood. Thank you so much. And Corey will be happy. It only took me four minutes to address that one. Um, I pee, here we go. This is dramatic um, improvement. I can graph it. Put it on the calendar, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I want to pull back for, from that, but like, okay, so Admiral Gibbs, you were, uh, oh, and Corey, I haven't forgotten, you, you did have your hand up. Um, Admiral Gibbs, you were talking about like a, necessary, a need to invade uh, these countries, um, and I think Deeply was trying to engage with you there as well. Um, like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I, I did ask you a question. Do you think uh, the Iran, the leadership, is um, uh, irrational actors? Um, I mean, I think by some metrics, most metrics, they would be rational actors. Like I don't, I, I don't want to be one of these people saying define rational, but like, I do. I consider them rational. I personally, to my, by, through my lens that I'm putting it through, uh, maybe not, right? But like, do I think that they have like rationality that they're following as like in like a like. I don't know. Birds. You think view? they can? Yeah. If you put if you put incentives and disincentives in front of them, yeah, they I can absolutely. Respond to... I think they are. They are. Okay. Uh, I mean, and that's kind of why a private issue. Okay. With, with how the diplomacy's been handled currently, right? Like we keep uh, incentivizing them to do things, and then it incentivizes this bad behavior, right? But As you, but to like we've been giving them too much carrot. It's time for the stick. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so you're more for gunship diplomacy. I'm saying that, and and I think Tubi was uh, going this direction, but he can correct me. Um. Is that like if we approached Iran, right? And this would take decades because we got to build trust and we don't have that at, at, at all at this point, right? But if we approached Iran and we're like, okay, uh, you need this and that, right? Um, and uh, these resources, we're going to give you these resources and we're going to give you these privileges, right? And in return, hey, uh, you do this for us. That like, uh, uh, with a, we can build a mutual beneficial relationship in which we are exchanging resources and privileges or access and whatever that might be, right? Um, uh, to the goal of normalizing relationships. You're saying because before you said that was impossible. I you can't see in the future how we could ever normalize relationships with Iran. Um, but I I don't understand why that can't be the case. If sure. we you know if give Israel's them still on the board, if Israel's still on the board, this was tried to be able to be normalization. I, I, yeah, outside might, of that, that outside might be of that, I agree. Right <laughs> outside of that, I don't agree with your with your notion. But if Israel's still on the board, it doesn't matter we, how we much relation. Take, we should take uh, our Israel. alliance with Israel off the board. It's not. It's yeah. not just. It's not just yeah. Israel. It's yeah. also Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I would say there's like once again. Sure, I hear, I hear, I hear. But like, so again, I'm not saying this would happen over. Or, I'm not okay. One, I'm not saying that it would happen overnight, and I'm not saying that we would ever be like friends. Normalization doesn't necessarily mean friends, a friendship, right? That we let, become yeah. allies, but just that, like, we like, normalize. To push back on that. Because the, to Lactoid's point, the Sunni Shia thing is probably a lot easier to resolve than the Zionist Muslim thing. No, no, no. It's, it's well, real quick. It's not a religion thing. It, it has to do with the power wow. balance in that area, right? So the, the biggest example I can think of is, is right now in Yemen. Um, one of Biden's first acts was was to delist the Houthis as, as a terrorist organization, and he also uh, relieved sanctions on their oil sales, uh, and obviously it didn't fucking work because Iran is not only an enemy to Israel, but they're also an enemy to Saudi Arabia through their funding of the Houthis and uh, rebel groups and pro-Shia rebel groups in Yemen, right? And they're going to continue to do that because they want to expand their power projection at the expense of Saudi Arabia. I... It's it's unfortunate, but when we have when we're like pushing for an ally, an ally kind of arrangement with Saudi Arabia and Israel, I mean, making friends with Iran is going to be fucking like really difficult. I, I just don't see how it happens. Yeah, that, that, that's what I was saying. Is if it, remove Israel from the board, right? It's probably easier to normalize relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia with America if think, Israel isn't also part of the equation. I don't even. So I want. I, I, I want. I'm going to easier, let, but I don't know if Gibbs, possible. I'm like, yeah. I'll, I'll like take Gibbs easier. Respond. Um, but thank you, Tight Boy, uh, two five three, um, <laughs> for the two dollar uh, super chat. I didn't say anything, but uh, it was your first super chat. No, I think he said enough. Channel. Yeah, I think it's. <laughs> 
<laughs> Consider supporting the channel with super chats like our. Oh, I think that's. Chat. I think that's uh, Dre the Dre Clouds. Um, he's got in the waiting room. I think he's he's been asking to come in. He's really upset at uh, Gibbs. Oh, well. oh uh, uh, this guy is a saboteur and is being a fascist. I guess he's talking. Um, I, uh, sorry, this is a, a closed panel. Um, I, I do thank you for that. Um, but if you want to address him afterwards, uh, you can. I can, I can let you in afterwards. But like right now, it's a, a closed panel. But like stick around. Um, we can uh, let you in and have a discussion. Oh, and they, I think they just also sent me another $2. Uh, let me end the discussion with another two dollars. Again, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a closed uh, discussion, but we can have you in um, as soon as we're done, and we'll be. If done. you give Prime a hundred dollars, he'll let you have a one-on-one -on -one with Gibbs. <laughs> I'll, yeah, we, I think we'll all accept that. Real quick, yes. Real quick, yes. This is but, yeah. this is kind of you one of wait, my like forty-five minutes. This is this is one of my you know points of contention about just covering recent geopolitical things and debates that and especially when it comes to conflicts where no media source is ever to really be trusted i'm i'm wondering if anybody else is because i'm getting a bunch of people telling me that like the irgc building in the consulate um is is not the same building that they're next to each other and that there are photos of the actual the iranian consulate building not an embassy because th that's a higher tier but that they actually bombed the building next to it and that they didn't bomb like a diplomatic building at all, just the building next to a diplomatic building that happened to contain Iranian generals in a country, Syria, which has never unrescinded their declaration of war against Israel. So Syria is still at war with Israel, and Iran is obviously been funding proxy wars against Israel nonstop since '48. Uh, well, maybe not since 48, but yeah, I, right. So I actually do wonder if, again, you know, I view this differently as an anarchist, but I'm just curious if any of you are getting the same information. I haven't heard that. I've only heard that it was a diplomatic comp. I've heard that again and again, but that doesn't mean it's not wrong. Um, I can imagine that I mean, I'd be misinterpreted within the news. Um, it doesn't actually yeah, change yeah, it for me curious. either, though. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, like Iran I, I mean, still just, has to like retaliate. Yeah, I'm just trying to, to give the, pan the panel what's going yeah. on, right? I'm because I mean, like, um, we're all and, wait, so what's the for Iran what's the question? Respond. I think I think I missed a question in there somewhere. I was just trying to. I was saying, is is anybody else getting this? Because I'm I'm seeing claims. A bunch of people are like mad at me. They're like, "Hey, dude, you know, it's the IRGC building. It's not actually a consulate. Um, so they're not actually bombing like a diplomatic place that has should have some like immunity. So that changes whether or not you know from like a NATO." You know, articles, a convention, war, et cetera, et cetera, whether or not Iran is actually justified in the retaliation. Because if they're Hold on, bombing, but if there's, even if it was if I, an embassy, if, if there's generals in there, like, doesn't it become a military target? Yeah, that happens. No, I don't think I don't think that's true. Really? So I can just store my military assets in an embassy and you can't touch it because it's an embassy. <laughs> yes. Well, my, my, my understanding no is that, um, that embassies are, are meant to be you're not supposed to attack embassies, even if there are military, like generals in them. Right. No yeah, it a, it becomes a I think that's different area. from having mil military assets, like in in terms of like an arsenal. Like if it has an arsenal, that that might change it. But I don't know. I, I have no I mean, idea. especially given that like, these two these two nations aren't like formally at war, are they? No, are Syria they at war right now? and and Israel are formally at war, right? So bombing anything yeah. in Syria is still just. I mean, it's justified again. You know, but yeah. I mean, if there's a diplomatic compound, then it's. It's Iran's if it's a territory, diplomatic, then. right? If it's diplomatic yeah. compound, then it's Iran's like has some level of presumed protection. But if it's the yeah. but if it's the Iranian Revolutionary Guards building, and it's just military targets from a country that is funding terrorism throughout the region and is funding the Houthis as they're currently bombing Israeli ships in the Red Sea right now, right? Like, and is like Hezbollah is sending missiles funded by Iran. Over their border right yeah, now, yeah, but it doesn't make kind of changes of the, the situation at that point. I mean, like, I, I mean, does I it really? I, I mean, because I'm like I'm throwing that out there, yeah, I hear you. I, no, I hear you. I hear you. I think it changes thought. like the viewpoint of like, well, like, what did Israel actually do? Right? Did they bomb a military target or did they bomb a diplomatic target? So fair well, enough, right? But in the but end, they did right, either or, the right? Difference. Yeah, there was, there was military assets. It, it reminds me of like a John Wick kind of scenario. Like, you can't touch me here. 
I'm in, I'm in the building. I'm safe. It seems like a ridiculous way. To I mean, if that's everybody's yeah. opinion, that's fine. If, if it doesn't yeah. matter to anybody, whether yeah. or not it was a, a, a diplomatic building or a military target, then I mean, yeah. fuck it. But to a lot Let's of people, I presume to... it would. Yeah, my, my uh, understanding yeah. is that it, it was should it's do the within the research in the embassy. That's a good idea. It's with it. My understanding is that it's, it's a building within the diplomatic con- compound, like I think right yes. next to the actual embassy. Right next right? to, yeah, right next to the yeah. answer to your previous right. question, the answer to your previous question, right? Like, none of that really matters. Like, so, like, y'all are saying, we're talking about, hey, like, y'all don't think that the, y'all are arguing that there's possibly this diplomatic solution being friendly with Iran, right? I'm saying that every time we've tried to build a bridge with Iran, uh, they have turned around and taken that as an opportunity to enrich themselves at our expense or do things and work closer with their allies to like work adversarial to our interests, right? And like, like, uh, like, for example, yeah, like whenever we uh, they did the nuke deal with uh, under Obama, right? They did the nuke deal under Obama. Whose money and, like, was that that they got? Uh, listen, I, don't, I don't give a shit about that. And the point and that they got I their own money back, well, didn't they? Yeah, it was Either their way, money. they shouldn't have got. They shouldn't have got any of the money back. Fuck them. Like first of all, so well, okay, but well, that's not. That's from not. Us? How did they take Doobie, from I, us? I, I, Doobie, I can give you an example, right? When Biden uh, alleviated the economic sanctions pro- prohibiting them from trading oil with China, they took that money and immediately funded uh, Hezbollah oh, in, in Lebanon, right? So that's an example of, them, of us giving them like a little bit of room. Them taking that money they were making from oil sales and using it to fund terrorism against Israel. That's, that's I mean, a not only that, claim, they also though. have used it to fund their, fund their like nuke plants, all sorts of stuff. Anyway, the point is that they, every time they've done it, whether you want to say it's directly, you say they got their money back, every time they've had a chance where we worked with them, they've taken a conscious and deliberate and open and that's the big one, open step to like make moves that are adversarial towards us, right? And that's not even factoring in that we have friendships with Saudi Arabia, we have friendships with Israel, that we're friends with Turkey. Like these are all groups that they, they don't like, right? So like we're sitting here going, oh, okay, we're working with these people, but hey, these people are going to sit here and work adversarial to us, but we can somehow just ignore all that and we can be buddy-buddy friends. That's not realistic. And they're, and they're showing us that's not realistic because anytime we've done that, they actively take a stance against us. Like – I don't so I don't see how you well, can even argue that. I don't I don't understand I, so I do understand that like Prime guys maybe maybe oversold the position. Right? But I don't think I don't think it needs to be a dichotomy between buddy buddy friends with Iran and like should we continue to support and defend Israel with military and potentially get involved in a conflict against Iran? Or should we get the fuck out and listen to what they're saying when Iran says, America, you do not need to be involved in this. Like they put out a statement saying, America, you, you don't have to be a part of this. You can avoid this war completely. Right. So I, cool. I, I, I don't think that those two are here. Like, uh, that's, uh, yeah, cool. I'm glad that you're, you, they put out a statement. Guess what? We're here. They know we're here. Like, what's the like reality? <laughs> Tough titties. Is like, we should send a diplomatic Biden, Biden so, should get up. Yeah. So, we should send a diplomatic I mean, cable of that written. It's just tough titties. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. So the, rationale, the rationale, <laughs> the rationale here is that there is a, there is a, there's a nation state that presents some level of threat towards the American citizenry and the American public. Right. And that is Iran. The problem I have with this is that this doesn't just apply to Iran, right? This applies to China, obviously. Um, this applies to North Korea, though, to a much less degree in terms of threat, though it does in terms of precious metal market, because there are precious metals in North Korea that are utilized in Taiwanese and um, Chinese factories. And that's mostly how the regime is prepped up and stays afloat, because we buy electronics that require precious metals, and they really only come from a couple of places, you know, Colorado being one of them places in Africa, a few places in South America and North Korea, right? Um, there are a lot of nation states, you know, Russia, for example, obvious is an obvious threat to us, a threat to the global world order. So how do we make this decision about whom we should full scale invade and whom we shouldn't? And, and so like, obviously the rationale can't just be, these are bad guys that fund terrorism, right? Because if that was the only criteria, we would have to invade like most of the world other than like Europe, a few South American countries and like a few African countries. Your chance of winning and, and the fact that other countries you just listed have nuclear weapons. Yeah. I mean, right, I really it's tough to Pakistan's, them. Let's them out. Like, Pakistan's our right. ally and a threat. They have nukes. Lactor, can you explain what the issue with them is, what the issue is with uh, Iran funding Hezbollah? Like from from an American okay. perspective, 
Okay. Well, so the, the two things that I, the two breaks that I know that Biden gave when he was elected to Iran, which was delisting the Houthis, which I think backfired because the Houthis are essentially an arm of Iran that then went on to proceed, you know, to attack U.S. shipping or uh, international shipping and other civilian targets. Um, and the other one is... Uh, okay, funding... but that's, I think, I think framing it that way is... Uh, well, but that's what happened, right? Disingenuous. I, I disagree that it's disingenuous. We saw that happen after the act, like the, the the bone was given. We also saw when the sanctions. No, hold on. We saw that happen after. Hold on. We saw that happen after the Israel's uh, campaign in Gaza, right? In response well, to this, it's not like they just did it for for no reason. Well, no, I understand, right? But if the Houthis had not been delisted as a terror organization, and arguably perhaps they were targeted uh, and, and removed from power through a Saudi uh, through Saudi support. Maybe that wouldn't like maybe they wouldn't have been in the position to attack international shipping had Israel oh, on, the attack they, on Israel occurred on October. Were they hold on? Were they trying to like impose a blockade to stop uh, uh, to try to, to try to like? Just no, no. I'm saying if the Houthis were not in power, like if the Houthis didn't have control of the strait there, they wouldn't have been able to, to impose a. But but right, I, my issue with this is you're speaking happened. as if what they did what they did is like terrorism. I, I don't. I wouldn't consider that to be terrorism. They were trying to impose a blockade. Uh, to 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 support Hamas or support to support Gaza, right? To to keep uh, they were funding or civilian, weapons or whatever. Okay, but hold on, they're they're opposing a blockade. Hold on, they, they they hold on. They made they were opposing a blockade. They made it very clear. Hey, don't go through this pass. This water is off limits. We're imposing a blockade on this water. Yeah, you don't. Right? Get so to, yeah, like, they're gonna yeah, they're gonna you, attack you, any. You don't get to announce. You like you look. You don't get to announce a blockade over like a a, a whole a vital shipping lane. Well, I mean, okay, nations okay. do this all the time. Okay, hold on, yeah. hold on. You, you can, in terms of like enforcement, but I guess I mean, like how the Six Day War started again. Like what the fuck? Yeah, like we, we we have to like really analyze here. Like Closing yeah, down so canals. Is, we can't have we, we, kind of a big deal. I don't know. We can't have like a, a a military arm of the Iranian government shut down vital shipping lanes to Europe. This is just like a non-starter in all geopolitics. It can't happen, right? And this would not have happened. If the Houthis were not in power to enforce a blockade against the Strait, and are, I mean, this is much more, I guess, um, theoretical, but the Houthis received funding from Iran, obviously, as well as Hezbollah and Hamas, and a lot of this funding comes from uh, inflows of money to Iran, partially from their oil sales that were, that were allowed following the lax, uh, the laxening, the, the, re the relaxing of it's the not... sanctions that happened, so they can sell oil to China. Now, why like is funding you could also say this wouldn't have happened if if uh, these other nations weren't providing financial and military support to Israel during during what they can what I think uh, the Houthis consider to be a genocide, right? So so from their perspective, right, uh, they all they're trying to do is stop this uh, this Jewish supremacist ethno state from from killing people, killing Arabs, right? Sure. So. I, I, be, but, but, when, but when you present, but when you present them, okay. But when you present them, you you speak about them as if they're just like terrorists or something, and they're doing it for no reason, or they're like they're oh, jihadists oh, who just oh, want to kill. Oh, well, what, what, what I'm saying is, oh, what I'm saying is, they're like to let a kind of finish point. Yeah, what I'm trying to say is, uh, and this is what Gibbs is trying to get at, right? Gibbs has, has very much like a Western centric point of view, and the idea of we're we're in the world and West is best, and there is a sort of um, we have to recognize uh, poles like po power polarity that exists in the world, and, and recognize that. Where, where U.S. influence is, generally things get better in metrics that we care about. Uh, this is true when it comes to Israel, arguably. This is true when it comes to many places around the world. And so what he's looking for is, OK, we want to give a, if you're we're talking about giving a bone to Iran, we have to first agree that this is arguably for the best interest of America. And then the argument is, here's why it actually hasn't worked out for America when we have the Houthis closing off the straits and when we have funding for Hezbollah and Hamas, which are were involved in the October 7th attack on Israel, right? So from a Western perspective, this did not work out, right? How, like giving bones to Iran doesn't work out. Now you can say, well, fuck the Western perspective. Like Iran's justified in what they do. I, this is going to be an entirely well, like, hold on, like would you Would you apply this point. to the same kind of like, um, the same kind of uh, breakdown to the U.S. in support of Israel? Because I mean, we could we could look at many reasons our support, our continued support of Israel, has been a negative for us, right? Not just in the region, but across the world. So, would you say that maybe the U.S. should stop supporting Israel, stop sending them billions of dollars every year? I think that it's a more complicated analysis about whether or not our alliance with Israel is beneficial to us, as opposed to giving Iran a bone. As long as we have the alliance with Israel, I don't think that giving Iran a bone is going to be particularly helpful. Um, but I guess if we're like starting from scratch, like what is the benefit of having 
an ally like Israel. I, I mean, this is this we're going to get into like some really like base level uh, uh, like philosophy here of like uh, the way Israel conducts government, uh, the rights they provide to women and LGBTQ people and uh, their their perspective on free market capitalism and, and how they interact with the world in a way that the surrounding countries just simply don't interact with the world and why supporting uh, beacons like that can be beneficial uh, in the long run when even though it might draw some ire from some of the more authoritarian countries that we deal with. Um, let's, I don't think, oh, go ahead. I, just quickly, um, uh, because another super chat came in, um, uh, from Infallible File, I think I, before I said Inflatable File, did I say that? Yeah, you I did, it's the Inflatable File. I said Inflatable, I do apologize, it's Infallible. Okay, I'm so, so sorry. Uh, but, five dollar uh super chat we need uh to face reality uh iranian military opposes israel and saudi arabia if you're hoping we give peace a chance be ready to be disappointed sadly thank you uh for that super chat uh and the kindness of supporting this community consider subbing the channel getting bits getting subs um so i can keep doing all this if you like this stuff then support me um in doing this oh oh someone did actually uh, uh thank you for um oh, oh, god damn it <laughs> of course, all right. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Mock Gaming Bot, for gifting a sub. Thank you, Atmo Gibbs, for gifting a sub two hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> gifted, gifted subs should only count at the end of the show, anyways. I, I, yeah. I'll, I'll give you leeway, leeway on gifted subs. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, GB, uh, finish your point, and then I do want to get to Corey. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think it makes any sense to hold Israel up as some kind of beacon within the region or or to say that because um, I think that implies that if we had a similar relationship with any other of these nations, right, that we couldn't get to, a, to get them to a similar place, right? Um, maybe not culturally. Is there any other liberal democracy cultures in the region? Is there any other liberal democracy uh, hold on. in the region? Well, th well, this is, hold on, but I think this is what I was going to get Around to, Israel? right? Because I think our, our relationship yeah, with Israel from, from for, for decades now hasn't been hostile. It's been very supportive. We've been funding them, giving them ton tons of influence within the United States through our politicians. Um, so I don't I don't think we have a relationship or, or you can compare our relationship with Israel to our relationship with any of these other Arab countries. And I don't think it makes sense to say that if we had a similar relationship with any of these countries, decades down the line, they wouldn't be in a similar place. They wouldn't be much more Westernized, much more Americanized, much more liberal, much more capitalistic. I think they could absolutely get to that's that. Always, that. That's always the... This is the problem can, with can you, playing this could game. Could you hold on with your criticism? Yeah, because right. Corey's been waiting for quite a long time. Yeah, but don't worry, we'll get back to you, Corey. Oh, well, this is... Uh, I don't want to derail it, but I just want to... So, unlike some people here, I actually do take you seriously, Gibbs. Uh, and, and, like, I am concerned with some of your uh, claims that you made. So I'm, I'm just trying to tease out, like, essentially how, uh, how war hawkish you are. Where, uh, <laughs> if... Very, very like, okay, so uh, yeah, so uh, out of my uh, let's say own interest for myself and my fellow uh, friend Lactoid, let's say uh, the U.S. starts running out of fresh water, uh, which might be on track to do that, uh, and Canada has a large supply of uh, fresh it's water. Tough duties <laughs> for Canada. Looks like okay, <laughs> okay, and uh, just to maybe further <laughs> clarify, uh, do you think you might have you might have uh, answered this before, but I just don't remember, so I apologize. Do you think uh, the the United States should have withdrew from Afghanistan or should have stayed there and do more? Mm. Uh, well, that's that's a real good question. Uh, with the Afghanistan one, I could I could see both arguments, right? Um, on on that side, I, I I think the way it was done was done poorly. If but I could see the argument that if we'd stayed and maybe you know got a few different like regime like I don't know administrations in there, because what was the first one? Kazi, and then the second guy. You know, I, I can see the argument, maybe you eventually get some who does the job well, and the country takes off, right? Um, I think that some of the citizens there would say they were benefiting quite a bit from, you know, being under, like, the puppet regime. Like, I would say women were getting to go to school. There was a lot of, like, more, like, freedoms. I think some people definitely benefited. Um, however, that being said, it seems pretty clear to me the way they uh, fucking laid down like a whore on nickel night after we pulled out, uh, that they uh, fucking are just, just they just, uh, they're just done. They just didn't want this. So uh, I, I, I guess that was the right decision to pull out. Like, if they're just willing to just give up that easily. A great then, saying. <laughs> like, I disagree like, strongly. But I, I'm going to use that. 
they, uh, they yeah, they, they're just gonna lay down, just like and give up. Then, uh, then I guess they didn't really want it. I guess the right decision to pull out. I mean, I, so. I think F Q F Q, don't shake your head at him, right? I think he's your like the uh, dark country version of you, right? Because you like you, you have like he's no, 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 so I'm saying that, that like. I'll, I'll tell you what it means. I'll say he's that the, like, he's the have, alter FQ. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he has a, a you have a, a, like a beautiful way of like uh, spinning metaphors, right? To get your point across, to paint a picture. Our friend Gibbs does the same. Uh, just from a little. <laughs> you're, you're both <laughs> artists, oh, just yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh both yeah, artists. And for Gibbs... Your analogies are about a <laughs> prostitute that you're pulling out of. Okay. <laughs> Listen, I'm just saying. <laughs> if the Jew fits, you know what I'm saying. Like, I'm if, just, uh, or the, the penis. Fits. But like, but anyway, hopefully but like... it's not a shoe. Let's pray. <laughs> oh God. God, dear oh, God. God. <laughs> yeah, just to further. So like, like if, so if it was up to you, Gibbs, like if you were in charge, okay, like you would have made the decision to like not like obviously we're like doing hindsight is twenty twenty, but like you know. You I would mean, have probably made the decision to like stay there, like we got, like we yeah. Did. I think we. I don't think we ever invested enough in Afghanistan, in my opinion. I think if we had oh, okay. more resources oh, in God. that, we would have had a that is trillion wasn't enough. <laughs> McCain said a hundred years. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, that's a real thing. Like, I think if you're really talking about like nation building, then like, uh, I think one of our biggest problems is sometimes we get out too quick, right? Or we don't like exert our influence in different ways. I think that if you're serious about like you know, making a people very similar to yours, you almost have to look like uh, examples in history where they were successful. Like, I mean, look at like the Roman Empire, right? They were very successful because they stayed there. They built like, like they, they did fall though at some point. But eventually, sure. But like part of what, but even they after, stayed you know, there, the Roman Empire stayed there. They, they, what do you okay. Mean? So you, but hold on, I'm going to explain. So like they built things to last and they built things to, so their culture would extend you, extend, continue, right? I think that's the proper way if you really go nation build, right? Like, or except in their case, they were just empire building. But say like, you know, like, look at Char Charlemagne. Why do they call him like the Holy Roman Empire? Because he's trying to reunite the Roman Empire. He's trying like, he has this ideal. They hold like things from that culture. It's very like uniform, like kind of across Europe where like you see this heavy Roman Empire influence, right? And now they have this like almost homogeneous kind of like you know style of living right so same thing with afghanistan we're only there what 20 years i mean that's a drop only in the 20 years <laughs> well, that's only a drop in one the fifth of a, a century well there's an argument there um there's before I, I and before i explain it um just want to say quickly um thank you sean for uh super chatting five dollars uh canadian fun bucks um, and putting the the smiley face emoticon, I appreciate you uh, for that. Thanks so much. Um, again, it's just for the channel, guys. Uh, but um, I guess the issue, and we're moving we're, we're moving away from like the heart of the matter. So I, I do want to work our way back. But um, I've heard the argument that Gibbs is trying to make, um, and it's simply that if you're going to actually nation build, right, like that, that takes a culture shift. Uh, we managed to do that in Japan. Right, we managed to like shift the culture um, in some startling ways there, um, but for like Afghanistan, it would simply take longer. It would like take generations, and so yeah. if you were serious, Japan about wasn't doing a fucking this, but... inbred group of people with a barbaric religion. Like uh, Japan of it was, was a different to... place. Y'all thought I had the hottest. Japan thing. was indeed a different. Well, wait, they they country. did have a barbaric religion, and the United States was far more. Yeah, we cut them off the really... fucking knees from their religion. They well, were cool with it. Right, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, the the biggest, not God. God. The the biggest, the biggest mistake said, "I'm not I, I, God." Well, exactly right. The biggest mistake that we made in Afghanistan, from my armchair uh, was internet barbaric, panel opinion, is going to be the same mistake that we made with Iraq, which is that we we kind of we gave them democracy too early, right? Um, we moved in and we we broke down what was left and left a power vacuum and stuck around, but kind of right, like one foot in the water kind of situation. Um, Afghanistan should have been ruled directly by a, like a U.S. general, right? A U.S. military this administration like, for for, the, like, for five thing. years. Well, no, you implement so, the economic policy of Afghanistan just like we did in Japan. We like we implemented the educational policy in Afghanistan just like we did in Japan. We changed Japan's language in certain ways following um, the capitulation, right? We we controlled the educational system of Japan and we outlawed them teaching certain things to their kids and we changed their kanji to to be uh, kind of how we wanted it to suit U.S. interests. That contributed to Japan being now in our sphere. Uh, we probably should have done the same thing when it came to Afghanistan. This is, the, the, the problem is, is that, you know, there are there are a billion different, there there's an infinitesimal amount of variables when you're dealing with culture, society, government. Every human being is, is a complicated factor that's difficult to study 
because from a scientific perspective, it's not science that we're dealing with. We're not in the realm of science when we're saying what ought we do and, and how ought we exert power in these places. Instead, what we're doing is we're looking at patterns and hoping that those patterns repeat themselves in wildly dissimilar situations. And what we're betting on it is we're betting the American tax dollars and the American lives that we lose and those and the money and lives that are lost in the places that we invade or that we engage in regime change wars in. And it's, I don't know, it all just kind of sounds so naive and silly to be like, oh, we're going to go in this country and we're going to have a plan. And it's like, and we're going to, we're going to support a regime, you know, of, 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 you know, moderate rebels. And this moderate rebel group is going to come in and, you know, overtake this area. And then we're going to send in the green berets to train this moderate rebel group. And it'll turn out great. It's just like, it's a story we've been told a whole bunch of times with a fuck ton of failures and a few presumed successes. And we use those presumed successes to be like, well, here's what worked here uh, as this means of like how we're going to like successfully do this. Meanwhile, fucking groceries are like insanely expensive. Like the middle class is being wilted away. Like our economy is facing all of these issues. Like infrastructure is crumbling. Like you have 7.2 million immigrants in one presidency coming across the Southern border that are all getting fucking welfare. And in New York, they're getting houses. And it's like, we have all these fucking problems. And like, we're going to like, like pontificate about how we might engage in regime change wars in fucking Iran. Like it's it's wild to even First have all, that war conversation. Is good True, war is good for the Thank economy. You, Scott. War is good for the economy. No, well, please shut absolutely. up. Absolutely, no, it absolutely is. We literally one of our biggest exports is the military industrial complex. I don't know. You can say it's not good for the economy. Like that's unequivocally like literally part of the reason. We yeah, what we need now is more war spending. Is yeah, war that's too. that's what we need. I mean, I absolutely think yeah. we can ramp up the factories. I mean, it's clear by the amount of artillery shells that are being used by uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine that we we don't we don't have enough artillery shell capabilities. American, that's millions of jobs right there. Boom, jobs, thousands. American, right there, like, American. Um, American weapons manufacturers Williams and jobs. rich people that are able to understand that are, that are that have the right friends and invest in the right places make money. But when we well, look good, at the current maybe, situation, like, we know that you should when invest we look in at, stocks. Then, when, like, when I don't we, know, it's so complicated. When we look, when we look at even our current situation in the current wars that are already happening right now, what we are seeing is. Wheat. We're seeing we're seeing food prices now. Some of that is COVID. Some of that is fiat currency. Some of that is the fucking is that Ukraine isn't able to produce grain. And some of that is fucking Dutch farmers getting fucked with like nitrogen regulations by the EU. There are a lot of things that make the grain and farming things go up. Part of that's war. So so what happens when what happens when we invest in a massive war with Israel? Oh, I don't know. Um, where are chip foundries for literally all of our electronics? They're in three fucking places in the world. They're in Taiwan, they're in Israel, and they're in Germany. And Germany doesn't have a lot of fucking foundries. Okay, so if Israel gets involved in a massive war, and we're bogged down in a massive fucking war in the Middle East, and China decides, I don't know, Xi Jinping decides, you know what? I was supposed to have been elected out of office already anyways, like two years ago. Uh, you know what? Now seems like a good time to take on Taiwan because the American military is busy fighting a giant war in Iran. Well, guess what? There are no chip foundries for literally every electronic device in the entire fucking world, except for a tiny, tiny percentage that go through Germany. Like, there are so many problems that can occur from war. And this con th well, this idea I mean, that like, war is just right automatically beneficial right is fucking stupid. Hold on. You, you literally just made my argument for me right there. You said Taiwan and uh, Israel, both two major chip producers. Guess what? That means we're pretty inherently tied to go in there and take these people out before they come to a threat to those countries, right? So in, in Taiwan's case, it's going to be a little harder to go in there and take out China. However, Iran looks like you're our bitch on the block. I'm just saying, we can go in there. We can take them out tomorrow. Guess whose uh, uh, little chip factories are secured? Israel, so you're just giving me one more reason why we should go in there and have regime change in Iran. Like, I, you literally just like made my point for me. I, I don't want to spend all day fathoming on, how retarded this is on the on, on this part. Um, I mean, I so, I'm sure you have thoughts, right? Very big thoughts. Something he's team tough said something about something. Too, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> so, there were a couple of other moments when Shakespeare came up in my head, but not, not at the moment. This one. <laughs> Although, Frank, I, yeah, Frank. I mean, my thoughts were really more about. Um, uh, uh, 
if if you go back, so like Gibbs was talking about all these like historical players like in the past, and and the problem is if you want to go back and you look. Like the the areas that we're talking about that are fundamentally culturally different are the same places where ancient Rome had problems with Afghanistan. Uh, Alexander the Great had problems with Afghanistan. The great uh, Russian Empire had problems with Afghanistan. Like when you get to a culture that's sufficiently um, like distinct and culturally uh, um, uh, unlike the, the the power that's trying to colonize it, uh, that success rate like fundamentally shifts. And I think that that's what we're not looking at here is that there's a reason why like militarily um, uh, things that worked in Europe and even that worked in East Asia didn't work during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Um, because uh, not it, it's not just the culture, it's also the climate. There's a lot of other differences as well. But uh, I think what we're finding is that um, what we have found for a long time now is that there are limits uh, to empire and um, you can't, you have to pick and choose. You can't just uh, take on the whole world because um, that's not going to end well in the long term. It's not sustainable. Thank you. Um, uh, so does anyone uh, else want to, we have a limited amount of time left. So I want to, I want to ask you real quick, Prime, do you, um, if you could remove the regime in Iran and replace it with like a more U.S. friendly regime with minimal casualties, like mm -hmm. pretty minimal. Right. Would, mm -hmm. And and it was sort of it was pretty, pretty good shot. Like there was a window of opportunity in which like we could do it. Uh, would you be in favor of doing it? Um, only if the resulting government would be a marked improvement for the people. Um, if not, like which I'm it probably would be. Not necessarily. Not it would need to have I, the support of the people. I think that's that's the more critical differentiation. Yeah. Right? I mean, because if it doesn't have the support of the people, then it's going to wind up like the Shah. Yeah. Actually, that's a very good point. I didn't think of it in that way, but that, that's a very good way of conceptualizing that. So, um, uh, right. According to this one uh, website that I just found, like uh, 80% uh, roughly of the people there would prefer a different kind of government, right? But they can't because it's a totalitarian yeah. kind of system. And, the, right? and every it, time they protest, they get crushed. And every time they protest, they get crushed, right? But let's say there's a massive protest, right? The, the, the reigning government does something. And then, like, there's an opportunity for the U.S. to, like, do some targeted strikes and basically arm the people there. And then there's going to be, like, a pretty significant regime change. Would you be in favor of doing that? I'd be in favor if the change would be better. If it's going to be worse, then no. I, like, better the devil they know than the devil they don't. Um, but uh, uh, it's... Like, I... yeah, you'd really have to like be clear about what they mean when they say a different type of government, because it, it could yeah. be that they want more an even more religiously more. OK, but in what way, yeah. though? Because it could be that they want an even more religiously like uh, extreme government. Right. They're, they're, there's not enough Sharia for them. <laughs> right. So, like, I, I think you need to be like very clear about like what you mean by a different uh, style of government or a different um, or changes. And, and then and then like Prime said, uh, or I'm sorry, Ico said. I think that it, in, in imposing um, some America-friendly dude uh, when the population has a long history of being fed either propaganda or true stories, good reasons to hate America, it's probably going to lead to a sizable portion of the population rising up and lead to some kind of civil war or some kind of like fucking ISIS situation, right? So, so most of radicalizing the, a lot of people. Most of the people in Iran that would like to uh, remove the Islamic Republic they, according to this survey, let's just take it as true, prefer a presidential republic, and then there's another section that prefers like a parliamentary republic. Let's say that like those two factions were like teaming up to like come up with some kind of compromise, some kind of democratic presidential kind of parliamentary system to remove the theocracy from power, uh, the mullahs. Okay. Um, yeah. Seems, seems like a pretty good thing, I would say. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, so in that case, uh, I, I'm not like, um, um, diametrically opposed to regime change, right? Like, um, and regime change can come in all kinds of uh, forms. It can be like organic, meaning purely from the people, but like oftentimes that's not the case. There's other other actors involved in the, in a global like a globally connected world um, that are influencing them, right? Like some majorly major influences. Sometimes it's just minor influences. Um, so I, I'm not necessarily. Um, like if the U.S. were to help along something that 
um like tip this the the balance on something like that like yeah i'd be i'd be fine with it especially if uh what happens next has the support of people reflects the will of the people um and results in a greater happiness of the people then i can't i can't argue against that but of course the the trouble is like iran like has a, a technocracy up the top uh, on top and uh like there's layers and layers of people who um are all sort of jockeying against each other for power right up at the top but there's precious few to no moderates in that group of people so even though there is a lot of like energy among the people like for uh more liberalized government uh you're the, among the people who are like entrenched in power on all sides, and I'm talking about the Council of Experts uh, as be, being the group of people who like decide who the next Ayatollah is going to be. The guy who's in there is ancient, so that that, that power is going to be exercised soon. Um, the makeup of the Council of Experts at the time at which that happens is going to be our next like critical opportunity to make to see if somebody comes in there. And every analyst I've read. Uh, seems to have uh, take very little uh, uh, stock in that. They they really feel as if um, the the odds of that next leader, like there's a sliver of of a window opening there. But if it's not the right person that gets picked, it's another generation before we have another opportunity. And but that's not that's not like a popular uprising revolution. That's just like if almost it would almost be have the effect of a coup if you could get somebody like new in there people thought Rouhani was going to be that guy uh but um we're you know i i, I don't have great hopes for it though because we i think actively just, well, those well, people you're talking have been about, torn out of power well you we actively undermine the moderates there right the moderates pushed the Iran nuclear deal um they said this is what we got a normal uh, like this is the start of us normalizing relations uh, with the west um, uh, and the uh, Ayatollah was like, "Don't trust the United States. The United States uh, will absolutely betray you." Um, but we, they they got through, and then we betrayed them. Like in years, in record time, we did exactly that. Um, and, and so, yeah, we don't have very many options there. Um, but I think, uh, and I think, Elector, do you agree with me that if we put, uh, you know? incentives and disincentives um, in front of them uh, that we could uh, shape that relationship for the better over the long term, very long term, um, that that is something we can move towards if we had the will to do that. And we don't have the political will to do that. But if we did. I'm, I'm super skeptical uh, just because, again, you know, you have to just look at countries acting within their, their geopolitical interests. And when you have mm -hmm. uh, Saudi Arabia there, there's a geopolitical nemesis uh, in border countries, right, to Iran, when we have support for Israel, which is just not going to go away. Um, it, it, it seems to me that when we give Iran rope, they just use it to further their own goals, because of course they do. Um, and and then, but it's not even talking about like the funding of weapons to Russia. So um, I, I'm just skeptical that uh, that give like, what kind of rope are you thinking? Like, what, what kind of goodwill are you thinking about showing Iran? Internal critique again, right? Stepping out of my anarchist lens because I think you're all fucking crazy for wanting to put any goddamn money into these wars. I think it's all stupid. But setting aside what should obvious should be obvious that maybe we should fix our own fucking country because we have enough problems right now instead of worrying about this. The other thing that I think you, we need to recognize is that Iran is not Iran is not just a country with with that like funds terrorism. Right. Iran is the only fucking predominant Shia country. Right. There, there is the, the well, 12 or Shiism, but like regardless, like they represent the interests of minority groups throughout the entire Arab world from a religious perspective. OK. And so the the concept that we're going to get like a like, yeah, sure, it would be a great victory to have a more Western friendly Iran. But like you're trying to undo things that are not just about politics. They're not just about what, what, what resources they have, but also recognize that like the legitimacy of the state of Iran is based upon how they protect Shia Muslims throughout the world. And by protect, they mean kill fucking Sunnis and kill the Americans and kill the Jews, especially the fucking Jews that are the big problem, right? In from their perspective. And so like, this is why this attack had to occur because 
they could not they cannot sustain their government after Israel bombs a building and kills some of their generals. They have to respond. And then when they respond, they respond with something that they know is probably not going to be that effective. And then they're like, America, you don't have to get involved. And they even said, like, we're done. We consider the matter closed, right? So this is this is them trying to save face with their own people. And so like the trying to meddle with regime change and the idea that you might not just get a worse devil when you're dealing with someone where the entire country is is a dominant of a specific religious type that is already connected with terrorism throughout the world and their popularity yes there are peace peaceful iranians yes there are liberal iranians that want that but there's also a ton of fucking iranians in their population that demand that the state of iran use their power, their influence, their money, their proxies to continuously weaken Israel, weaken the U.S., weaken Sunni Muslims. And, like, you're just as likely, no matter what you do in that region, to have a dismal failure that gets replaced with something worse. It's what happened when we did Iraq, right? We have something worse. Saddam Hussein was terrible. I get that. But you know what? The region's a lot worse off without Saddam Hussein in it. Because, because we gave it to, to Iran. Fucking power imbalance. Right. He used to, he used to be able to fucking there used to be a, a, a buffer zone with with Iraq well, there that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, this I was again the, the ham fisted attempt at democracy secular, first, yeah. right? right? We're just gonna put, is, a, put a democracy in right away. We shouldn't have done that. No, like, Iraq should have, it, I, Iraq I, I should have been under U.S. military administration. I don't think it is worse. I think it's working as intended. Like uh, like y'all sitting here going, oh, it's worse. All right, what's really worse? Is ISIS worse than like Saddam Hussein's Iraq? Like by like military power? No. Like you're sitting here like Syria is way worse off, and Syria used wait, to be a semi wait, legitimate what? threat. Okay, so like all right, just compare militarily, right? Iraq had like the fourth largest army when they. Had like Kuwait in 1991, right? And then they were somewhat weaker. I think they're like eighth or twelfth or something. Whenever we invaded them, uh, you know, with Bush uh, Jr., right? So we're going in there under W, and we take them out, right? So now, who's stronger militarily? ISIS, who's like a hodgepodge of a lot of unorganized groups that are basically got under one umbrella, or uh, Saddam Hussein's. Or that's, that's a ridiculous or, way to think oh, about oh, that. Oh, it's not a ridiculous way to think about it because then I turn right Obviously, around. Obviously, I mean, hold on. Did did, did fucking Iraq set off a refugee crisis that sent millions of Arabs? into in, in north think, africans into into europe that, that europe is okay no hold on it's not just for them for us too right no, like, I mean, like with a wave of terrorism that is still happening today by the yeah, way right. I, I feel I like mean, the swedens who have like no-go muslim zones yeah, in their towns yeah, yeah I, hold on, let me just finish this argument all right so like what is, i get your argument that terror is a bad right i get terror so syria not just terrorism bad Hold on, Syria is also an ad adversarial power. Syria is low longer a serious entity on, on like any political stage. Does anybody take President Assad and Damascus like serious anymore if they made a threat tomorrow? No one. Yes. No one. Yes. Well, no, good gives. I, I hate. I, I'm with you sometimes, but this is something that like you're wrong this on is, because it's just a because 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 Iraq Iraq has shifted into being a junior partner of Iran. Okay, because, I agree with because, that. Because because of the removal, and, like in terms of long term geopolitical interests. It was a complete blunder, right? Now Iraq, Iraq is under the wing of Iran, and Syria is now uh, a, basically a client state of Russia, right? Which now has new hardware and air bases in Syria yeah. because of its destabilization of Syria that happened because of ISIS, because of the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. It was a horrible, well, I mean, I awful. But don't worry, but don't worry yeah. Lactoid. All we have to do is funnel fucking weapons through Turkey, and we don't really care where those weapons end up. And then Al Nusra will be able to take care of Syria one day. Don't you worry, Al Nusra is going to do something. Didn't you see that cushy little interview he did on NPR? Isn't regime yeah, change war so fucking effective? Just that's fucking why I'm fix saying a U That's why I'm fix saying America. it should be a U.S. It should be a U.S. Oh, military please. administration. Okay, that's that's no. The, it should be. A, give it should be. A, we don't give a fuck about these well, people that. administration, so that we that can would fucking. Be the way to Fix our it. southern border. Well, fix our fucking country. Back. And then we never give it back. That's what we should. Well, do. hold on a minute. Let's not go there. I'm saying that, like we, yeah, I we, 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 agree, Scott, we, like, we, we, we take, we, so, like, for example, with Iraq and with Afghanistan and with every country in which it was, which we did this was, was actually successful. Which is that it should be the U.S. military. If, if we're going to expend the effort to actually go into a country, you don't just give it back right away, right? You got to hold it and fundamentally change the systems in place so that you don't have uh, that country fall into another country's. Uh, power polarity immediately when you leave it was a complete blunder bush fucked up absolutely fucked up iraq it was one of the worst things that america did in terms of the middle east and the, uh it america didn't have to be done that a way successful operation that hasn't bit us in the ass in the middle east with the exception of operation provide comfort ever 
Nothing we've done in the Middle East has fucking, in the long term, benefited American interests, with the exception of maintaining the petrodollar, which, by the way, is just a ticking fucking time bomb on our own currency inflation rate, if it ever fucking comes back to us. We've just fucking, we've just survived limping along as we've wasted trillions of trillions of dollars that we could have used or just simply kept in the United States and been a fucking paragon of technological capacity and trade, but instead we have just been in a quagmire of bullshit since Eisenhower in the Middle East, and we're still talking about what we ought do with other Arab nations? Like, what the fuck? This is so crazy that you that you guys lived through 9-11 and you, haven't, you can't see how fucked this entire region is and how we just keep throwing money down a bottomless pit? Like, what the fuck? Stop. Just stop. Like, you don't have to keep doing the drugs. Eventually, you have to quit your fucking addiction and focus on America. This is so dumb that we're even fucking rationally considering wasting trillions more on more fucking wars that don't help. Okay, well, then... Well, then, do you agree? Hmm, Maybe you you simply don't. Um, I I don't know. It's not clear to me how isolationist you are, uh, but maybe you're maximalist on this position. But, like, if uh, that while we shouldn't be doing review uh, uh, regime changes, right? That that war is probably not the answer here. Okay, um, but would you say like you cut off all diplomatic relationships, or would you try to um, work on those uh, diplomatic relationships, increase our um, our ability to work with these individuals, um, but not be pouring a ton of money in there one way or the other? First. First, I, if, with, given the absolute authority to make any decisions, I would abolish the fucking nation state. Really Setting that aside, that. yeah, sure, I would maintain fucking diplomatic relations because it's stupid not to talk to people in these regards. What I would also do is I would empower American mercenary companies to be able to go and fight wars completely unregulated from us in any capacity whatsoever to the highest bidder, so long as we determine in our current legal system as so far as it stands that they they are working as a hired agent to defend a nation against an aggressor. So for example, if fucking, if Ukraine, I would, I wouldn't send a dollar to Ukraine, but if Halliburton wants to go fight for Ukraine against Russia, I would say be our fucking guest, like fucking like, like, like be our guest. What if they want to fight for Russia? PMCs. Well, they're the, they're the obvious aggressor in the situation. Uh, I can argue with with you on this. I don't know if they're the obvious aggressor. There's arguments on both sides. Look, there, there, there are gray Um, sides in many places. Right, I, I and like, you can I say like that you can you can you can make the you can make the con- you can make the yeah. argument yeah. that Russia was provoked, but you cannot make the fucking argument that Russia wasn't an aggressor when they were in 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 several situations. I think you can make the I think you can make the argument that Russia uh, was justified in its intervention because of what was happening in the Donbass since 2014. You can make that argument. I'm not necessarily saying I agree if with they, it, if, but, if but it is, but it is kind of interesting how we and stabilize the region. Sure. That's not what they fucking did. No, well, no, they but they did the exact same thing we did when it came to like our war w- w- regarding Kosovo, right? Our strategy was like, you target the infrastructure, you target the capital to knock them out of the war. And then like you maintain the integrity of the Donbass, right? That was the strategy. Obviously that's not where we're at now, but arguably I'm not saying I necessarily agree with it, but they have an argument there, right? The only time that we really started caring about the, the piles of dead bodies in Ukraine that's been going on since 2014 when you had the Ukrainian military shelling civilians in Donetsk and Luhansk, right? But piles and piles of innocent people getting blown up by the Ukrainian military. We don't give a fuck. And then in 2022, Russia invades, and now we care. Now we care about the, the videos and the pictures of the civilians, right? I don't know. It's kind of a I tough argument. I think, I, think, I think a nuclear power invading another country that like we built up an entire defensive alliance against is probably more newsworthy and more <laughs> caring-worthy, if you will, by, by us in the West than than Ukraine bombing its own people. Like that's obviously like, like that. There's like obviously like, two different things as far as geopolitics are concerned. Like, like to what I'd love silly. to have a conversation. Uh, I don't think you're being silly. I like to, I like to have a conversation with you. I'm going to talk exactly about that. That's not, I actually, I, so no, I know, I know a lot about this and I, I've been I, meaning to have a conversation on it for a while. I would actually like to be educated on this. So, he studied um, up and then fucking Israel, yeah, Israel yeah. Palestine happened. And now he can't yeah. talk about his favorite. Now I can't even research. talk about this. Fuck, right? Like, <laughs> Nobody cares. So I, I'm, I'm so let's, uh, let's uh, wrap this up because we've already uh, gone past our, uh, our time here. And you guys can, you know, 
put in all your final words in your uh, outro statements here. But uh, yeah, to the audience, I hope you enjoyed this so far. Miss Millie, thank you for get, using your Prime Gaming uh, sub. Shout out to Miss Millie. Uh, good friend to our friend um, FQ. Um, really kind individual. Um, so thank you for the three months of that. And because and anyone else, sub to the channel. If you got an Amazon Prime, it's Prime Gaming. Consider helping us out. You know, we gave you a whole bunch of entertainment here. Um, uh, you laughed, you cried, you got mostly frustrated with us. That's fine. Um, but if you find yourself coming back here on a regular basis, consider helping us out. Subs to channel, get bits, give subs. Super chats uh, have been great on YouTube. Let's continue uh, that. You, you um, laughed, you cried, you can kiss five bucks goodbye. You can kiss five bucks Honestly, goodbye. That's Shakespeare. Uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so, yeah, all right, but yeah, consider uh, helping us out. All right, so I'm going to have an outro to all these uh, fine individuals, starting with my friend, uh, Lactoy. Lactoy, please. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I appreciate all of you. Love the discussion. You can find me at Lactoy TV on Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube. Thanks. Thank you. All right, um, our friend uh, Scott, as always, a lightning rod, but like, and, and again, I want to say this. I want to say this. I've said this before, right? If you don't like Scott, if you don't like him, like, quote unquote, taking over the conversation, it's simply a matter of like not responding to Scott, right? The, the reason he takes over the conversation is because he says something interesting and everyone wants to say, fuck you, right? Um, so just putting that out there. Uh, but thank you, Scott. I, I, I appreciate you. Yeah, no, I appreciate you. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, I do love this this panel. I like this panel because you're one of the few people in, in the political space that today I'm, 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 I'm be real with you today. Not so much. Right. But like, usually you have really good topics that aren't the thing everybody's talking about. Um, you do a lot of research of that and, um, and I appreciate your moderating style for the most part. Um, you know, I, I do, I, you know, I think it's a good place and I, I think it's important that we have important conversations as opposed to, you know, I just don't understand the political space when everyone is talking about the same fucking thing, how people are even entertained by that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like people that watch this, this channel that says the same thing over and over again. It's like, so I appreciate this place. So check out prime guys, you know, um, definitely check them out. And, uh, I'm Fabian Liberty. You can find me everywhere. I kind of just came back and I'm doing a bunch of stuff. So, and, uh, if you want to learn about anarcho-capitalism and libertarianism and philosophy, Political philosophy, I got you. Uh, thank you for the very kind words, friend. Uh, let's go to our other friend, Corey. Um, thanks uh, for stopping by as well. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, always um, grateful, and I echo pretty much um, all the same sentiments uh, that Scott just uh, went through. Uh, and uh, to that point, okay, pretty much uh, I think it's almost uh, exactly two years to the day uh, that I started coming on these panels is pretty much... I think it was pretty much early April uh, when I got my first invitation to a Prime panel. Um, and it's been an absolute joy ever since, obviously. And that's why I, I'm so grateful and always love coming here. Uh, yeah, this is actually, I do actually look forward to being here every Monday uh, with these great group, group of people. Uh, and also just to wrap up, uh, to bolster your point, uh, <laughs> the point that Fairy Queen and Gibbs, pretty much are two sides of the same coin. Uh, you know, Fairy Queen's got away with words of, like, poetry. Uh, so does Gibbs, but a different type of poetry. Uh, and, like, Gibbs, you know, is clearly petting his cat with the panel, and you're doing the same thing uh, right now. So, you know, you're just mirroring Gibbs uh, over and over. Uh, but, yeah, this is all great. Um, you can find me on Twitch, twitch.tv, CoreyCamp84, uh, and on Twitter, X, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, it's Corey Campbell and Gibbs, iCow, Dewey, Fairy Queen, Sociologic, Scott, and Lactoid. Always a pleasure, and love you, Prime. Love you too, friend. Um, but we had a long uh, outro because I was nice, and his Canadian ass had to out nice me. Like he could not, he could not let <laughs> me be nice. I'll, I'll, I'll fix Hold it. On, I'll fix it. Wait, I'll let fix me it. Be I'll, bol I'll, bolst I'll bolster your point. Uh, where Scott is right about performative contradictions. Uh, right. Where ever so and about values. If Scott ever right. says that he values brevity and conciseness, that's the performative <laughs> contradiction. <laughs> 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 okay. I um, value it just I, in others. My narcissism won't allow me to value it in myself. <laughs> that's really good. Um, so, uh, friend, uh, it's really nice. A uh, two-year anniversary. That's like it makes me happy that you've been here for uh, so long. However, while I accept that it's been a joy, I don't accept that it's been an absolute joy. 
um you have like you've been here consistently almost as much as Latra. I think Latra uh, in the last years has been the most consistent. Um, and uh, but so that means you sat through a lot of bullshit. Uh, so I kind of refuse. Like it's an, an absolute joy. Eh, eh. I'm gonna uh, get don't, don't invalidate back. my experience, Brian. Okay, all right, <laughs> no problem. Thank you, friend, and I hope we uh, get to spend many more uh, times together. Uh, let's go to our friend Ali, one of our newer friends. Uh, thank you for stopping by here as well, friend. Yeah, I, um, I, I'll, I'll be devastated the days that uh, I don't get the text to come on the panel. I, I, I'm learning to be addicted to the panels. It seems like it's this is a great time. I love arguing with you guys. I, I didn't have much today on the Iran thing, but you know, normally. But no, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. And you had thoughts on the art thing, um, so we really appreciate that. Uh, like. Those open, uh, those like uh, open ended, like free discussions, you know, um, like I said, like you kind of, it's like a hive mind here kind of converging on something that you all like really want to talk about. And I love when you guys do that. And what, you, what comes out is always super interesting, right? Like I, I'm learning stuff from you all. So thank you. Um, next, FQ, another new friend. Um, thank, uh, like you were fantastic. Uh, and everyone, hey, do you all agree? I'm going to ask everyone this, all right? You all agree that F that F FQ is one of uh our our best uh guests that we've ever had here. Especially to the no. to the to no. the veterans. No 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 let's do this. Let's, let's, not, let's not do this. Let's not do this. Let's move on. Bad. Listen, thank the, the, no, 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 no. Listen, stop, stop, stop. Yeah. Okay. Listen, yeah. first, first I'll, of all, I'll, I'll thank you, that, thank yeah. you. Fuck you, Scott. Okay, don't be an you don't, don't be an asshole as we're about to leave the panel. Jesus Christ. Um, thank you all. I'm not being okay. an asshole. I'm I, saying yes, I would agree that you're one of the better one of the better panelists. I had to think well, through it. You a hole, Scott. Well, Take it back well, right now. Well, well, now you're being you. the asshole, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. Anyway, thank you all. It's it's always a huge pleasure. It's I, just as as Corey has said, as Ali has said, as everybody like I think we all share the same sentiment, which is that I also feel really really grateful, Prime. Whenever you send me an invite, I'm always excited to come on. You do do an enormous amount of research, and one of the best parts about what you do for these panels that I've always loved is that you find an article, you come up with like an original idea to talk about, but it's not even just that, it's the questions that you ask within the prompt. You write very detailed and specific prompts that I think do a really good job of bringing out some of these deeper and more interesting pathways of conversation. And I don't think our conversation would be possible were you not here to act as our as our as the interlocutor to at least my you know circuitous like way of like thinking of like expressing things. So thank you very much for your graciousness. Thank you for inviting us on. Um, thank you all, of course, for tolerating me to this evening. Um, and you can find me at Fairy Queen's Cottage. Um, it's right here um, on YouTube. And you can find me at Fairy Triple Underscore Queen on Twitter. Thank you all so much. And I mean thank that. You. Thank you very much. Hey, yeah. Um, we can see the uh, the blush in your very pale skin. Um, but uh, we appreciate <laughs> we appreciate you, friend. You're, you're fantastic. Um, all right. Um, next, uh, Doobie. Um, been here for the longest um i uh, do thank you for coming through this was uh great i want to hear i want to hear more of your thoughts uh on the israel iran um uh because i know you have really um uh, uh detailed um musings on these uh, things so thank you so much for sharing yeah thank you for having me that's all you'll damn okay all right um uh Heiko, thank you for uh stopping by not enough shakespeare today but you know looks like that Hey, I give you Alexander the Great. What do you want? No, no, no. Like, Can't have a Yeah, I, I just wanted to add one thing, too, like on your moderation style. Uh, whenever you sense a lull, you will uh, ask uh, another question, like to keep things going. And the questions that you ask in those moments are the best part of your moderation style for me. I always enjoy them because it, you always think of a way to just, like move the debate uh, in a direction that like gets people to think more. I like that. Oh, thank you. That's really, really kind. Oh, man, a lot of kind words from everyone today. That's really, that's really nice. Fuck, dude, I won't be nice. Sorry. No, no. I <laughs> Every time I'd be like, be like, this asshole can't be the only one that's nice tonight. I gotta be. Uh, <laughs> really... Okay, let's praise Fairy Queen some more. Let's see. Um, I yeah. think so. No, that no, might no, be the no, best. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, I I, uh, I try my best there. Um, and but like that only happens like uh, it's good questions only work if I have good participants. Um, I've I've had not great participants seriously in the past. Um, and it doesn't matter what you say, the conversation won't move. It won't like bite or anything. Um, so it's all because I have like really fantastic people who continuously share their time with us every week. Um, so shout out to uh, my veterans and to the new individuals uh, who've been spending time with us. Thanks so much. Um, Admiral Gibbs, Admiral Gibbs, um, thank you like uh, for never backing down, uh, <laughs> for enlightening us with your views. Uh, and they are always something special. Uh, <laughs> uh, and something I, I think uh, fun to examine. So thanks, man. Yeah, I enjoy I enjoy doing these a lot. They're real fun. I know that people here on Twitch will like me and be like, "Gibbs is just crazy." But uh, I feel like last week we had an example on a different panel where I was the lighter version of some of my views, and I'm like, "See, I've been telling y'all, people believe what I've been saying, and nobody believed me." And so it's it's very satisfying to come be the um, I don't know, I guess harbinger of doom that there are people that think like me out here, and uh, it's you know spread spread the love. And yeah, these panels are always real fun. Uh, thanks for having me. I am a little sad about one thing that happened tonight, and that was the uh, we didn't get to explore something brought up right at the end, and that was the um, the more the idea that we should be sitting in private militaries places and letting them just go fight wars for us. I big fan of that idea. I hope we come back to that in the future. Uh, uh you guys want to talk about PMCs? Like, uh, they shooting? Oh, I, I, we can I, make that a topic, I, right? Like, I think I think Scott and Gibbs are both going to love them for very different reasons. Yeah, big fan, <laughs> big fan of okay. that. Idea. All right, no, uh, let's let's lock it in, right? I'm, I'm writing it down now. Every topic, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, should we um uh, empower uh PMCs? I guess I don't know, something like that. Uh, oh PMCs. yes. All right, yeah. Let's do yeah, that next week. Be a good one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Collaborative. Love to see it. All right. Um, thanks all uh for this. Um, I will. I'll send you guys. Uh, oh, th oh, god damn it. Majin BMAC, uh, thank you for gifting five subs. I missed that. I hope you're still around. I literally, <laughs> I miss. Uh, and, and if you're not, then I'll, I'll just like send you a message. Um, but Majin BMAC, thank you for gifting five subs to the community, supporting the channel. Uh, that's the kind of support that we do need to continue around to uh, uh, provide you this content. We've been doing it almost for four years. We're very close to our anniversary. Um, but, uh, oh, you are going around. Great. Um, yeah, we're, we've been doing this for almost four years and we can't do it for another more year without, um, uh, all the kind people and support. So thanks so much. Okay. Um, I'm going to, uh, send you guys off. Who's streaming? Who's streaming? Who wants it? Who wants it? Black toys. I don't want to. I'm streaming, but I think Gibbs is the only one that actually like stays for I think considerable period of time yeah. online afterwards. Gibbs in the middle of a thousand hour marathon stream. Yeah, actually. Not, yeah, not like yeah. Gibbs, how do you survive that shit? Like that's like I see you and I genuinely like start to get worried. Like so, like uh, seventy two hours? Are you kidding me? I, I mean, we made it like sixty. Honestly, that, I, that did make one mistake. I should have delayed it like two or three days because I like just got over a sinus thing and that cost me my voice there at the end. But I like slept the whole shitload. And uh, beforehand, good stream. I, it was good. It was really good. I I gotta say, I, I was very. That uh, That's wild. I got. I mean, so it like I, I gotta say, it was way more productive and way more successful than I thought it'd be. Everybody was very supportive, big fans. I, I don't even know that I even gamed at all. Like people were just jumping in and talking. Like literally, ninety five percent of the entire entire stream. Also, thank you for the raid. It was pretty. It was very good. It was fun. Did you hit your sub goal? The hundred subs? Uh no, the sub goal was fifty. I got to like. Oh, uh, I got, I, like I said, I made like 62 hours. Then I was like, well, I don't have a voice. My mic's not even picking it up anymore. So we're going to call mm -hmm. it. But uh, I got I got to like 40 of the 50. So I was pretty happy. I mean, I just kind of threw a random number out there. And like I said, I work from home. So I was able to just like work while I was doing it. It's mainly emails. Now. Take care of yourself, dude. That's That always scares me when I see that. It was good. I enjoyed it. Like I said, it was good. Planned out. Was organized. Like uh, no no health. I think it's doable if you sleep on stream. Get a little four yeah, hour nap. That was fun. That was my plan was like when I got like real late after like two days, I was like, all right, I'm going to like sleep. And then my voice just was like not cooperating. So I was like, ah, fuck it. We're just going to call it now. I mean, it's not going to be a good show. Do it Jerry like, Lewis marathon style. Like have guests come in and like, you know, really. Yeah, that's basically, in a while. that's basically what I did. Like when I need to go take a shower, I'd have like two or three people I trust come in and just like chat it up about whatever. It was pretty fun. Um, that's horrible. That's a terrible idea. I'm out. I would never. 
<laughs> he's keeping up with the young and I was like, fuck that. Take care. Yeah, no. Well, he's, he's keeping up with the no, young and I, I can't do that shit. The sleep streams, I don't understand. Dude, just, just that, like, see cute shit in the internet. Right. People fuck love, love watching two things on the internet is watching you eat and watching you sleep. Two, like you, you, you want to just bo go crazy? I was, uh, I did uh, TikTok for a while, TikTok lives and stuff. If you, if you sleep on stream, you're like guaranteeing like 900 viewers. Well, you know what's crazy is this is what I think I've discovered from. It's so creepy. The mm -hmm. marathon thing, right? Is that people want to like? I think there's a demographic that wants to be creepy, unfortunately. Yep. <laughs> it's I, stream I, viewers. I mean, sure, but I think there's a big group of people that like like to feel like they're a part of something, and they can like yeah. take like like pride, and they're like, "Oh, I'm going to be part of this thing that this guy's doing," and they, like yeah. interact, and they seem to, and people seem to really enjoy like that aspect of the so, streaming. So back during that whole like copyright debate, <clears throat> when like you know wa watching other people's content and all that shit, I thought XQC made like a fucking great point in saying that the transformative aspect of watching other people's content, like was the stream and the interaction of the people in the stream because otherwise you wouldn't have that and that is what people are there for is like the conversation about the video that's being played and so it's like yeah people do feel like they're like when you're watching a sleep stream it almost feels like potentially right like like you're part of the slumber party the chat is like the members of the party and then one of the you know the host just fell asleep and now you're just discussing that i think there's something and now hassan just it. does those loops where it looks like he's on camera but really mm -hmm. he went to the bathroom yeah but i think yeah. I, I don't I, to, to the point yeah it is it is a little creepy but i do think people are just bored at home uh they're you know they're they, they prefer parasocial relationships they're antisocial in person and so yeah they're gonna watch you eat they're gonna watch you stream i mean people are watching us have like random ass deba debates and discussions right Right, but, and I and I get, I get the eating, but like again the sleeping, yeah. I, I I get eating to some extent. Yeah, the sleeping to me, I, you. that's just like I, I just I've been bored. Every once in a while, I've never been that bored. Have, Every like, once in a while, Prime will uh, will have a ninth guest on, and so he'll turn his camera off, and it'll just be invisible Prime, like behind the 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 nine panelists. I always thought that was kind of cool because like this his disembodied voice would step in and <laughs> at at moments, and you would just you don't even know if he's at his desk. Like for all we know, like. <laughs> Went to sleep. I don't know until so I he think, uh, until he says something. I'm professional. I think, I think so. there is a, yeah. a a generational difference in terms of the value of attention. Right? We have we have this concept within. There's this concept that every generation since the internet has come out in American culture and society has this idea of like, oh, you guys don't have attention span anymore, etc. And what it really is, is that the market has provided so many things for people's attention that there's a an, an expectation that you grab my attention, right? You know, when, when you when you grow up in a world with like three television shows, um, you know, I'm willing to invest 20 minutes or a couple of episodes to determine whether or not I like your show. But if you have a billion different things you can watch online, well, then all of a sudden you have the invention of TikTok, right? Where I can pop, 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 pop. Oh, yo, yeah, I like this. This is funny, right? Because there's so much attention to do it. And so what I would say, the other thing that occurs with this is that there is a, a split attention that is created in the same way that uh, there is a desire for increased uh, uh, ability to get my attention quicker. And so... You know, 10 years ago, if you had a dual monitor, the reason you had a dual monitor was your gaming and then you might look up something from your game. And that very quickly turned from, well, I'm gaming, but I'm also watching anime on the other screen. And so I think the concept of like, who would watch this is really discounting the concept of multitasking and split attention that is so much more common in Gen Z and in younger millennials that, yeah, I have a sleep stream where, like, I'm kind of fucking around and goofing around, but, like, I'm also playing Elden Ring right now. Like, I'm not really paying attention. And then every now and then I see something funny and I go and I engage in it, yeah. right? So I think, I think there's a misunderstanding of, like, how people are consuming the media because there's like this weird thing where people consider the media as a value, as a sole focus of attention, as opposed to the value of podcasts, certain things that are like designed to be done while you're doing other things, while I'm cleaning the house, while I'm playing a game, while I'm doing other and shit. That's it's designed like not to have all your attention. Yeah. Yeah. It's designed not um, to capture attention. 
there's there's a a, a YouTube video you should take a look because someone actually talks exactly about what you're what you're referring to. Um, but uh, Fairy Queen and uh, uh, I mean, it's just me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bounce, guys. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah. Hey, Lex, before you leave. Before you leave, um, what when do you think will be a good time to talk about the Ukraine thing? Because I actually really want to be informed on this. Um, I, I mean, yeah, if you, so, I mean, we can set up a time. I, I don't know off the top of my head when would work best for me. Uh, if you have like a Ukraine Russia discussion that you wanted to do, um, I I would be willing to come on and and speak for the basically advocate for the Russian side because although I think that there is some like philosophical things that lead me to probably be in favor of Ukraine right now. Um, Russia has a much more valid argument than I think people give them credit for, and especially here in the West. And uh, we just completely ignored it. And a lot of Americans don't even know what's been happening there since 2014, I think, which I, I kind of is the reason why they just don't think Russia has a good argument, but they do. OK, thanks so much, Ben. Um, yeah, he's, not, he's not wrong. Black toy the tanky. Uh, 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 yeah, the tankies are Communism the only United. Ones that are to, to <laughs> oh but, my God. Uh, FK, you want to say them? Uh, yes, each according to his ability. Um, anyway, uh, anyway, uh, I was just gonna like hop in on like the sleep stream stuff. Uh, I, I think like, like Corey like joked about this and Lactoid joked about this like a second ago. Like we have to admit, like yeah, it is true. It is true that people aren't consuming this content and like the like I don't think that people like most people are sitting down, you know, eyeing the person for like seven hours straight as they're like passed out asleep on the couch with their Twitch stream rolling, right? That's not the way people are actually engaging with the media. I don't like think. However, it's also true that like that the internet and many of these apps and like these websites that we use enable a lot of really weird fetish content. And I think that like the sleep yeah. stuff and the eating stuff and a lot, there's another thing that people that this is a weird thing that you can find on TikTok where you can find some people, people who will dress up and they look like cartoon characters or anime characters but they'll act like npcs from yep. the game inside yeah. of the game and they'll yeah. repeatedly like act like an npc and they will do th and they'll say these really annoying things over and over and over they're and getting over paid again. they're getting paid for specific uh phrases <clears throat> yeah so the npc very, thing, yeah yeah it's yeah, very it's weird a, it's an npc king the the biggest thing the biggest thing on tiktok which is why I stopped streaming specifically on there um because it wasn't fun it was the battles are the like primary thing on there so it's like two people or four people get together and like they collab on like a live stream and they're battling so they have like their live viewers sending them uh stickers and tokens which you know translate to money and you you know whoever gets the most money wins I literally it got to the point where the, the tiktokers are like saying hey like you guys are broke we're losing to these teams we should be it's literally just like but i think the so like it may be the fetish the fetish or whatever but i i honestly don't think so i think that so unless you are a chatter or you've been a chatter being a chatter is all like it, it, it's being a viewer in in like these live streams and tiktoks it is you hanging out with that person like yeah. for me, it's, it's literally a facetime so like, cause it, it's literally just you on camera. You can't pull up anything. You can't pull up a video. You can't pull up links. You can't do anything. You're just on a FaceTime with someone. And it really is. I think it's just like, you know, signaling to how lonely people are. Cause people like, you know, yeah. Scott, to your point, they aren't sitting, they aren't sitting and just watching the screen. They're having it on the side and they're doing their work. They're watching TV. And then like, they'll hear some bullshit and then they'll come in, they'll join the chat. It's like, it's literally just like, Hey, you have a friend right there. You're hanging out with a person right there. I mean, I catch myself sometimes. That's why I like, you know, I'll throw on like a stream and I'm not even paying attention to the stream. I'm just sitting there chilling on my phone. The stream's going on in the background. And it's just like, yeah, yeah it's just kind of white noise. Yeah. yeah. So to I, that, I, I wanna, uh, uh, if I, sorry, if I, I'll try to be quick. Um, but uh, to that point, just to bolster it, uh, because, you know, uh, there was a time where, where I used to stream my workouts uh, and like totally there, there's a demographic of people uh, that like, yeah, as to Scott's point, there's some amount that just they want to have it on as a background. But there are totally people that like are engaged, like even if you go into a, like a sleep stream, there's people in chat like engaging with each other. And there's totally a demographic, demographic that you uh, pointed out, Ali, that like there is a loneliness aspect to it, too. But I, I you know, I. Uh, None of my streams have been like super popular, never been like triple digit viewership, but you know, 
Uh, but let's just say that my I've got the taste. Of, like even just like my small like workout streams. Like there 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 are so I I have some messages that I get that uh, not so. Well, uh, obviously, that's that's obviously like I've had uh, like on TikTok it's really easy. So this is this isn't like a flex or anything. I've had thousand like three thousand viewer streams. Like it it'll be me like when I've been in an argument with someone. Um. And obviously you get a percentage of like guys or girls that are just going to DM you that are just, oh, you're so hot, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, that's going to be a percentage with anything. You're kind of, you're streaming to the internet. You're getting thousands of viewers, uh, hundreds of viewers. I've it's, never, I've, I've never got the, that was types of DMs when, you know, from, uh, uh, from my, 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 my research streams or anything like that, or my science streams, never got that. Ever. Oh, I've, I, I don't know. I've done like study streams where I don't even say a word. I'm just playing like nice music and like looking up my own shit. I've, and then I've, I've, had, just I've had weirdos come in. I've I've had I've had like ones where I'm talking like politics and then like someone will come in and, and like be like oh, oh you know I saw the Shire and like just be like oh I am I am I am uncomfortable right now. <laughs> well, that's not yeah. even that bad. Like, oh, you're I've being had, weird. Uh, like just in like oh, random, yeah. I've had them come in on all kinds of weird shit. I mean that just happens. It's just a numbers so, game. Like this you bump into enough I people. See your Hobbit feet. No, before Ooh. I even did any like the uh, the marathon stuff, like this is like when I mainly have done like the, either slosh casting podcast or like gaming. You know? Like I have gotten people that have come in and be like, "I will pay you to see your dick right now." Like you're like, "Give me, mm -hmm. I'll give you five hundred bucks, fifty bucks, like yeah. all sorts of shit." Weirdos on like, the internet, man. And I'm just like weirdos on the internet. But like, I think you're also forgetting there's another type of sleeping, right? That and this is really comes back to the community thing. Is I, I this used to be more of a meta a few years ago, but like there's still some streamers that do this. Whereas people will like go to sleep and then they'll like set their stream up where people will donate 200 bits and like a noise will go off or yep. like 500 bits and like they'll have like like something fall on them or something. The disruption and, like, stream. Yeah, yeah, disruption stream. And there's like a lot of people that enjoy that, but really it comes back to the community aspect. Like right, like I, I've noticed you know just with like just Twitch roll right, I seem to be like the latest person up right. So a lot of people eventually no matter what they kind of like start straggling in come like two o'clock in the morning and just start hanging out because people want to hang out with their friends right like mm -hmm. I, I was whatever yeah they were like i was talking in so-and-so's chat well now they're over here so like you're gonna go where like your people are and i think yep. that's part of the reason like with even the sleep streams or the marathon mm -hmm. is people are like oh i can go in there and i hang out with my buddies like kind of like yep. you were saying but like even to a more extent kind of thing but mm -hmm. maybe less on the like I don't know. I haven't dealt with too, too many of the creepy people, but I've dealt with enough, but I think they've just come. I don't think they come because of the sleep. They come just, they're going to show up. I don't, like, right, I don't you get know? a lot of creeps. I get a lot of, I get a lot of people that vehemently hate me. Like, and like there are, yeah. stuff. that's mostly like what, what I get. Yeah. You, you, get uh, you kind of all the time. Yeah, vehemently you, what? You, you said, but he and then you blanked out. We didn't hear you. Oh, I, I was saying like I don't really get as many creepers as much as I get like death threats and stuff. Like I get a ton of those. <laughs> I get those okay. all the time. I am. Well, I mean, you know, it's fucking. Yeah. Sorry, wouldn't it, dude, it's it's fine. I scream about like the evils of communism on some panel or something, and then someone, you know, is, you know. What poor lactoid? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I True. I don't know what you guys are doing. I don't get these. Like, I, I don't know. People don't. I don't give me that level of attention. No, not death threats. No, I mean like the other stuff you guys. That's because you're on about. Twitch and YouTube. It's different when you're on um, TikTok because the live function on TikTok, you can scroll through it like reels. Okay. And so like you can just keep scrolling till you find something that you like. And then the, you, you kind of give everything like one or two seconds. Okay, so and so like, honestly, if you started, to if do. you took this and you started streaming it on TikTok, you'd probably get a that's higher needed. viewership that you could translate onto Twitch. But then you can't I'd say like a third of the shit that you say on here. I'm gonna get out of here. But I'm I'm gonna get out of here. But but all of you need to just go on YouTube, all right, at some point, and just search for study music or sleeping things mm -hmm. and just read the comments because you guys need some positivity in your life. You want to see some positive communities? Just go to a sleep study and they're like, I don't know what stress you have going on in your life right now, buddy, mm -hmm. but you got this. You get some sleep. You need your eight hours. And it's just like thousands and thousands. And it'll be hilarious because the title will be like a day in the life of Helen Keller. And it'll just be like black with no noise so you could go to, to make your screen black. Yep. And like I saw one and it was like a day in the life of... um. Oh God! What's the blind piano? Uh, oh my God! Why can I? I was literally singing a song. Ray Charles, right? It was like it's like a day in the life of Ray Charles, and it was a black screen with jazz music, piano yeah, music playing, yeah. and it'll just be like it'll be like ten thousand positive comments. Like you need to go read this shit. It'll it'll make your day uh, better and go to bed.
Scott, before you uh, run, um, I wanted to What's say this up? before when Doobie was here with you, because I, I think all three of us express a similar sentiment. Uh, we're talking about uh, how um, we think that uh, Hollywood and video game companies should be exploring other cultures for like stories, right? Rather than like, you know, putting like a black character in something that's nominally European or whatever, right? Um, that we should, uh, that they should do that. Um, you remember, you've said that previously, right? Yeah, yeah, I hate tokenism. I think it's, I think it's, yeah. I think it's the worst. I think it pisses off everybody and and doesn't give anything positive to anyone. Then, uh, then I wanted you, and I, I'll put this in the group DM for everyone else as well, right? Uh, check out this uh, video game, which I think releases like today or tomorrow. Um, um, and it's like twenty bucks. Um, but it's like a, a platformer. Um, or like a, I think it's supposed to be like a Metroidvania type thing. My, that's my understanding. Uh, but it's uh, apparently based on the, the Bantu cultures. I'm not even sure which ones those are, but it's an African thing. Um, and I've never seen like this level. There's, a lot of, of, there's uh, a lot of there's a lot of Bantu in South Africa. They got pushed back by the Zulu. But yeah. South Africa. Okay. Well, then I'll, I'll take that then. Thank you. Um, well, no, no. But there, anyway. there, there's 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 a diaspora. Never mind. No, don't worry. No, I, okay. Fair I, I I don't know. But uh, any points, like I. Uh, uh, check this out. I've already bought this, right? Because I want to support like exactly this. You know, like, we're talking about different stories. Um, and yeah, give it a try. There's a trailer if uh, I, you want to check it out. And it's only twenty bucks. Yeah, I'm probably not gonna buy a platformer game, but I do. But I might. I don't know. I'll look at it. But yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, but regardless, uh, I had my kids this weekend, and uh, I'm fucking tired. I'm out. Deuces. Right. Take care, Scott. Be well. Good night, man. Bye. So that. Oh, isn't that so beautiful? Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah, I did have my kids this weekend. I'm so tired. Actually, I, to be fair, I've had more energy since I started going to the gym. Um, like going to the gym seriously as opposed to just like going. But um, but yeah, I'm still exhausted. I'm exhausted and sore. It was a long weekend. I went to my mom's uh, Sunday and she was like, needed me to rebuild her fence, right? Uh, well, not rebuild her fence. Like she doesn't have the money. Lumber prices are crazy and she doesn't have the money right now to like repair her and like completely redo her fence. And like her yard is like, her ground is really soft. Like, like digging down deep. It was like, there's like feet of just like wet clay in her backyard. I mean, I have sent, I, but I was like, oh, okay, well, I, you know, how, how much do you want me to do to fix this gate? And so she was like, I just need you to bar it, right? And I was like, all right, all right, I'll bar it. So, you know, I dug down, just put some two by fours in it and like, you know, some wood screws on either end. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll do that just to get like, you know, just to get you through the next season so your gate doesn't get destroyed. So you can just open and close the gate. And I put some wood on it and put some, you know, some added some wood to this dilapidated shit and then put like a new, you know, latching mechanism on it or whatever. But I didn't, like, get a post digger and, like, cement it and, like, put in a new post. Anything crazy like that. You know, just enough to, like, get by for, for one more year. So that she, you know, until, like, later when she can fix it. You know, pay somebody to fix it. And then after that, like, she just kept, get, like, she doesn't, she's, she, she divorced my stepdad with good reason. You know, he's, he's a narcissist, a genuine narcissist, a narcissistic abuser. Um, malignant narcissist, actually. But we're setting that aside. So, like, she just gave me this, like, honey-do list of shit where she's like, hey, can you, like, hop on the ladder? And, and like, it's cool because she's, like, kind of watching my kids. But, like, I was sore from the gym. And, like, before I knew it, I was just, like, I was doing, I just got, got roped into all this shit. And I was just, by the time I finally got back last night, I was, I was just, I was done. <laughs> I'm so tired from this weekend. So, I'm, I'm going to, the, the sleep that's going to come in just a little while after I take my contacts out and, like, eat like two sausage kielbasa like sausage things i have left over and like watch one episode of an anime and then lay down i'm gonna be fucking out lumber prices sounds like a euphemism yeah i could see that like a like a drug dealer euphemism or something as opposed to sexual innuendo i could totally see that but i love you guys appreciate you being here i'm tired i lost my voice 
And I'm also going to, like, wake up Mark and shit if I keep yelling. It was all right. It was good. It was fun. Had some crazy moments. I'm based, as always, obviously. I'll be back Wednesday. I'm going to be talking to Honey Badger Radio and then doing another panel on whether or not Nazism was socialist. Then Saturday, I probably have a crucible debate on libertarianism. I don't know yet. It's not like fully confirmed. I was invited. Someone wanted to do one. We're probably going to do it, but I don't know exactly that it's going to be Saturday night. Usually they're at 9 p.m. when Andrew does those. So yeah, should be fun. Join the Discord. Consider becoming a member. Um, tentative. Tentative. Um, consider becoming a member. It's only three ninety nine. dollars um, I need a couple more so I can add some more emojis because we only have like uh, we only have these four because this is the, the the cap that they'll let me have get a cool little badge um, and you know you know consider joining the discord if you just want to come and talk and hang out there's a ton of people in there I don't know that it's super active but there's like 600 people there almost um, so it should be fun hello oh, goodbye Rudy I'm, I'm hopping out of here but I appreciate you so join the discord um you know, yeah, my DMs are open pretty much everywhere. Um, my DMs aren't open on Discord if you're not in my server. But, like, if you're in the server, my DMs are open. Um, my Twitter DMs are open. At least for now. Which is probably why I get so many death threats, to be honest. I was saying earlier I get, like, death threats or whatever. Um, oh, what? Mentis Wave dropped a... Yeah, sorry, I have I have fuck um, censored for my chatbot, but, you know, I'm just doing that because I don't have a ton of moderators right now. Because um, I just came back to streaming. Um, Mentis Wave dropped a video while you were on a panel. Go, gotta go see that. Hell yeah, brother. Go check out Mentis Wave. I like Mentis Wave. He's cool people. Um, and then at some point, I've got to watch that, uh, that Liquid Zulu two and a half hour fucking AI video. Uh, an AI art video. Like, that's insane. I'm super excited. Um, I feel like we're probably going to agree on most of it. Like we disagree on borders and some certain things, but more often than not, I'm just in exact agreement with Liquid Zulu. Um, so yeah, I'm going to get out of here, guys. Love you. See you.